Good morning and welcome to the public hearing for EPA's proposed greenhouse gas standards and guidelines for fossil fuel fired power plants. Uh, we're agreed. We are pleased to have Tomas Carbonell, Office of Air and Radiation uh, De Deputy Assistant Administrator for Stationary Sources, join us this morning. Tomas, thank you for being here, and we welcome you to offer a few remarks before we begin today's public hearing. Uh, th thanks, Nick, and good morning, everyone. Um, as Nick mentioned, I'm Tomas Carbonell, uh, Deputy Assistant Administrator for Stationary Sources in the Office of Air and Radiation here at EPA. Uh, and I just wanted to take a moment to welcome you all to this public hearing. Uh, we're really looking forward to listening to your comments on uh, the proposed carbon pollution standards and emission guidelines uh, for fossil fuel fired power plants. And I wanted to say just a few words about that uh, proposal before, before we turn to your presentations. Um, our fundamental responsibility at EPA is to protect people's health and to safeguard the environment. And a key part of that role is ensuring that everyone in this country has clean air to breathe. We feel an urgency to act on climate change at EPA, and that includes fulfilling our responsibility to address carbon pollution from the power sector. In 2021, the power sector was the largest stationary producer of greenhouse gases, uh, contributing 25% of overall domestic emissions. Uh, if it's finalized in its uh, current form, this proposal is expected to avoid more than 600 million metric tons of carbon dioxide pollution through 2042, which is equivalent to cutting roughly half of US car emissions for a year. EPA also expects these proposed standards to reduce tens of thousands of tons of other health harming pollution that are co emitted with carbon dioxide, uh, including pollutants such as particulate matter, sulfur dioxide, and nitrogen oxide. Not only will that improve air quality nationwide, um, but it will bring substantial health benefits to communities, especially communities that have unjustly borne the burden of pollution over the years. Through 2042, uh, we project net health benefits from this proposal of up to $85 billion. And in 2030 alone, the rule would avoid 1,300 premature deaths more than 800 emergency room visits, uh, 300,000 cases of asthma, and tens of thousands of school absences and lost work days. Consistent with EPA's uh, traditional approach to establishing pollution standards under the Clean Air Act, uh, the proposed carbon pollution standards and guidelines require ambitious reductions in pollution that are also based on proven and cost-effective control technologies that can be applied directly to power plants. These proposed standards build on decades of technology advancements and momentum from recent changes in the power sector driven by the Inflation Reduction Act and the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law. These laws make historic investments and incentives that enable the power sector to accelerate the deployment of clean, affordable energy and to take advantage of ready-to-go advanced pollution reduction technologies. The rules we're talking about today, if they're finalized, will further accelerate that progress by holding companies accountable to ensure they cut carbon pollution from their fossil fuel-fired power plants. The technology-based standards that EPA is proposing include strengthening uh, the current new source performance standards for newly built fossil fuel fired stationary combustion turbines. Uh, they include establishing emission guidelines for states to follow and limiting carbon pollution from existing fossil fuel fired steam generating units. And they include uh, proposed emission guidelines for large frequently used uh, existing fossil fuel fired stationary combustion turbines. As required uh, by section 111 of the Clean Air Act, these proposed standards and emission guidelines reflect the best system of emission reduction that has been demonstrated to improve the emissions performance of these sources, taking into account costs and energy requirements and other factors. In developing these proposed standards, EPA considered a range of technologies, including carbon capture and storage, utilizing low greenhouse gas hydrogen, and adopting highly efficient generating technologies. The proposed standards recognize that the installation of controls, such as CCS, for coal and gas plants, and low greenhouse gas uh, hydrogen co-firing for gas plants are more cost-effective for power plants that operate at greater capacity and more frequently or over longer time periods. And the agency has taken that into account by proposing to establish standards for different subcategories of power, power plants according to unit characteristics such as their capacity, uh, how long they intend to operate, and how frequently they operate. Uh, the proposal provides the owners and operators of power plants with ample lead time and substantial compliance flexibilities, allowing power companies and grid operators to make sound long-term planning and investment decisions, and supporting the ability of the power sector to continue delivering reliable and affordable electricity. It also requires that states, in developing plans to cut pollution from existing sources, 
undertake meaningful engagement with affected stakeholders, including communities disproportionately burdened by pollution and climate change impacts, as well as energy communities and workers who have powered our nation for generations. I want to emphasize that these proposed carbon pollution standards are just one part of a larger suite of actions that EPA is taking to fully address the climate, health, and environmental burdens from power plants, from reducing smog forming pollution across the country, to proposing to strengthen mercury and other hazardous air pollutant standards, to proposing stronger limitations on wastewater discharges from power plants. We're taking comments on a range of issues in uh, the proposed carbon pollution standards, including the stringency and timing of the standards, the kinds of control technologies we should be considering, and the types of units that we're covering. Your feedback is really important in helping us to develop an effective and workable final rule. So we're really grateful to you all for taking time to provide comments today uh, and during the comment period, and we look forward to hearing from you uh, in just a moment. With that, I'll turn it over to the chair of this morning's hearing panel, uh, Nick Hudson, who's our group leader for the Energy Strategies Group in the Office of Air Quality Planning and Standards. Thanks again. Thank you, Tomas, for your time this morning and for the insight that you provided on this um, these proposed uh, rules. Um, as Tomas said, my name is Nick Hudson. I'm the group leader for the Energy Strategies Group in the Office of Air Quality Planning and Standards in the um, EPA's Office of Air and Radiation, and I will be chairing uh, the session of this virtual pu public hearing. During today's hearing, we'll take comment on EPA's proposed greenhouse gas standards and guidelines for fossil fuel-fired power plants. Uh, EPA is proposing Clean Air Act emission limits and guidelines for carbon dioxide from fossil fuel-fired power plants based on cost-effective and available control technologies. Uh, the proposals would establish limits for new gas-fired combustion turbines, existing coal, oil, and gas-fired steam generating units, and certain existing gas-fired combustion turbines. Uh, I now would like to invite our other two panelists to introduce themselves, uh, starting with uh, Stephanie. Good morning, everyone. I'm Stephanie Gourmet, also in the Office of Air Quality Planning and Standards. I was part of the rule writing team and a team that constructed the technical support document for hydrogen. Don? Uh, hello, my name is John Ashley. I um, also work in the Office of Air Quality Planning and Standards uh, with Nick and the Energy Strategies Group and I'm one of the rule writers on this project. Thank you. We're also joined today by a court reporter who will produce a written transcript of today's hearing. Uh, we will add the transcript to the public docket for this proposed rulemaking and we're, we'll carefully consider your comments as we develop the final rule. Um, I'm gonna read now some of the ground rules uh, that we've established for these public hearings. Uh, before we begin uh, hearing from you, we have a few ground rules and housekeeping items to review to help make today's hearing run smoothly. Uh, first, EPA is committed to an environment of mutual respect and safety. We want to hear your views on the proposed rule today. However, the agency will not tolerate harassment, discrimination, intimidation, uh, inappropriate language and images, uh, or sustained disruption of the public hearing. EPA expects everyone participating in this hearing, including registered speakers, attendees, and those of us on this panel to conduct themselves in a respectful and civil manner. We will monitor and moderate this virtual event to ensure that common standards of decency are upheld. Please note by registering for this event, you are agreeing to abide by the ground rules of the virtual hearing. Please remain muted with your camera off until it is your turn to speak. We ask that everyone's displayed Zoom name include their first and last names. This will help our logistics team quickly identify when registered speakers have arrived so that uh, we can quickly add them to the lineup of speakers. Okay, so let's move on to how today's hearing will work. If you have joined us through Zoom, please keep your chat box open. It is at the bottom of your screen. We will share the names of the next two speakers in the chat box. We also may use the chat to communicate directly with you during the hearing. I will call on each speaker when it is their turn. Let me apologize in, it, in advance for any mispronunciation, uh, name, name mis, mispronunciations. Uh, when I call on you to speak, please unmute your line. 
If you're joining us via Zoom, use uh, the button at the lower left uh, of your screen to unmute yourself. If you're joining us by phone, you can mute and unmute yourself by pressing star six. When it's your turn to, to speak, please state your name, your first and last name, and spell it for the record. Please speak slowly so that our court reporter can capture your entire testimony. When you are when you are providing testimony, you are welcome to activate your video camera by clicking on the start video icon at the bottom left of your screen. If you're not testifying, please keep your camera off. Each speaker will have four minutes to give comments. A four minute timer will be displayed on the screen to help you keep track of your time. The timer will start when you state your name. When your four minutes are up, it's time to stop. If you are testifying by phone, by phone, the timekeeper will alert you when you have one minute remaining. To be fair to everyone, we are going to strictly enforce the four minute limit. If you have additional items that you would like to share, such as a slide presentation or videos, you may submit them to the docket for this proposal through August the 8th. Um, and I would note to everyone that the agency uh, yesterday extended the public comment period um, to August the 8th. We extended the comment period by, by 15 days. Um, we encourage you to also submit a written copy of the testimony you provide today. We will post information on how to submit written comments in the chat box throughout the meeting. We are here to listen to you today. However, panel members may ask questions to clarify your comments. When you are finished speaking, please remain on the line until I can confirm that there are no further clarifying questions from our panel. Once we are done, please remute your line and turn off your camera. I will then call the next speaker and so on. Finally, today's hearings consist of three sessions, morning, afternoon, and evening. If there are no additional speakers, we may close the session 15 minutes after the last registered speaker has testified. We may also take short breaks as needed. Thank you again for taking the time today to share your comments on EPA's proposal. So let's get started. Um, our first two speakers. Um, the first two speakers will be Paul, uh, will be Paul Billings and Laura Bender. Mr. Billings. Good morning, and thank you for holding this hearing. I am Paul Billings, P-A-U-L-B-I-L-L-I-N-G-S. I'm the National Senior Vice President of Public Policy for the American Lung Association. The American Lung Association supports the greenhouse gas standards and guidelines for fossil fuel fired power plants and urges EPA to finalize the most protective rule possible in the early spring of 2024. Climate change is a health emergency from extreme weather to vector-borne disease. Human-caused climate change impacts health. The health impacts of climate change are not remote. They are personal. Along with millions of people, I experienced the dangerous impacts of climate change this past week. Wildfire smoke blanketed the Mid-Atlantic and the Northeast. In my Silver Spring, Maryland neighborhood, a sensor recorded an AQI of 306, code maroon hazardous air quality. The health warning is, health warning of emergency conditions, everyone is more likely to be affected. But I didn't need to consult air now to know the air pollution was at dangerous levels. The sky turned a pinkish gray. When I stepped onto my porch briefly, my eyes began to water. The air stank, not a campfire smoke, but a pungent smoke. I could actually taste the air, unpleasant, acrid, metallic. Hot, dry conditions created by climate change are driving wildfires. Smoke from these threatens our health. EPA must take steps to curb climate change and address the carbon pollution that is driving it. EPA proposed rule to address carbon pollution for electricity generation is a key part of the agency's strategy to address climate change. EPA's analysis of some of the benefits of the proposed rule include by the year 2030, the, new, the standard for new gas and existing coal would avoid up to 1,300 premature deaths and 300,000 cases of asthma symptoms. EPA projects these proposals will cut 617 million metric tons of carbon pollution through 2042 from existing coal and new natural 
gas fleets, as well as an, up to an additional 407 million metric tons from the existing gas fleets. These are important reductions, but more is needed. EPA must increase the number of gas plants covered by the final rule. The American Lung Association supports EPA lowering the unit size and capacity factor thresholds to include more gas plants. EPA's proposal includes flexibility for coal plants based on how long they will continue to operate. Critical to this approach is the enforcement of the subcategories. States must develop federally enforceable plans with enforceable milestones to ensure that individual, that individual plants won't attempt to game the system and avoid installation and operation of the best system of emission reduction. Finally, EPA and other federal agencies must finalize the suite of rules to safeguard overburdened communities. EPA's regulatory impact analysis shows that while under the scenarios analyzed, millions of people will experience air quality improvements or no change to air quality, depending on the year and the scenario modeled. Up to 170 million people could experience worsening PM2.5 concentrations, and as many as 196 million people could experience worsening ozone concentrations. Increased exposure to PM or ozone is very troubling. EPA's analysis shows that existing disparities of exposure to PM and ozone for people of color will continue. We urge EPA to strengthen the final rule and finalize other rules to address power plant pollution and the PM and ozone air quality standards to protect the health of everyone, but most importantly, those that continue to bear the greatest burden of air pollution. Thank you very much for this opportunity to testify. Thank you very much. Um, any questions from the panelists? Okay. Thank you very much. The next speaker is uh, Laura Bender. Good morning. My name is morning. Laura Kate Bender, L-A-U-R-A-K-A-T-E-B-E-N-D-E-R, -E -E and I'm the National Assistant Vice President for Healthy Air at the American Lung Association. We appreciate you holding this hearing and adding an additional day of testimony. Uh, we also appreciated the ease of sign up for this hearing and the fact that EPA was able to send out the link and lineup in advance last week. My Lung Association colleagues, colleagues and I are each here today highlighting different aspects of our comments on the rule with our time. So I'd like to focus mine on the health considerations around carbon capture and sequestration. First and foremost, we thank EPA for your work on this rule. As you heard from my colleague, Paul, the Lung Association strongly supports reducing carbon pollution from power plants. The impacts of climate change make this an urgent health imperative. And this proposal is a critical piece of the agency's work to reduce greenhouse gases from their many sources. Because of our lung health focus, the Lung Association has long called for any measures that reduce carbon from power plants to maximize the reductions in other pollutants at the same time. These benefits are critical for improving public health and advancing environmental justice. We understand that EPA is writing this proposal as it does all its proposals within the confines of the options available to the agency to reduce emissions under the law. That said, the Lung Association has health-related concerns with the use of carbon capture and sequestration, and we urge EPA to take all possible steps to mitigate them. In our board-approved public policy positions, the Lung Association does not support the construction of new advanced coal-based generating facilities or infrastructure, including CCS plants, as well as integrated gasification combined cycle plants. More broadly, we support the phase-out of all combustion for electricity as the nation transitions to a clean energy future. And we say that pollution control strategies to mitigate climate change must directly reduce local adverse air quality impacts that immediately harm health. The use of CCS at a fossil fuel-fired power plant, particularly a coal plant, will result in some other emissions reductions. For example, sulfur dioxide must be removed before carbon can be captured, so we would expect to see a reduction in SO2 emissions from these plants. But the same is not true of all pollutants. We'd expect to see continued emissions of oxides of nitrogen, which can cause lung damage on their own and can react in the atmosphere to form ground-level ozone and particulate matter. Ozone and PM are widespread air pollutants that cause a range of adverse health effects, including asthma attacks and even premature death. Further, the Lung Association signed on to comments last year led by our partners at Physicians for Social Responsibility on EPA's draft white paper on available and emerging technologies for reducing greenhouse gas emissions from combustion turbine electric generating units. These comments highlighted potential harm of the pipelines that will be required to carry captured CO2, including the possibility that they could rupture and release dangerous concentrations of CO2 into the surrounding air that could put people nearby at risk of asphyxiation. EPA said that the proposal under discussion today is part of a suite of proposals designed to reduce emissions from the power sector. These proposals collectively must reduce pollution, improve public health, and advance environmental justice. With that in mind, we want to highlight that in addition to a strong final rule to limit carbon from power plants, EPA must also ensure that additional protections are strong and finalized on time. 
That list includes particulate matter standards of no higher than eight micrograms per cubic meter for the annual standard and 25 micrograms per cubic meter for the 24 hour standard, ozone standards of 55 to 60 parts per billion, and strong final mercury and toxic standards, including with a filterable PM limit of no higher than 0 0.006 pounds per million British thermal units of heat. Additionally, as EPA works to finalize this power plant carbon rule by spring 2024, we also call on the agency to use all possible avenues to mitigate any health harms caused by the use of CCS, both in construction and use of pipelines, and in ensuring that no polluting power plant is allowed to continue endangering nearby communities by not reducing its emissions. EPA must collaborate with other agencies, prioritize continued meaningful engagement with affected communities, continue to invest in air quality monitoring in communities near plants, and as I've mentioned, ensure all other clean air regulations are as strong as possible and finalized on time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any any questions from the panelists? Okay, thank you very much for your testimony. Um, the next two speakers will be Liz Scott and Elizabeth Brandt. Hi there. Ready. Thanks so much. My name is Liz Scott, L-I-Z-S-C-O-T-T. And I'm the National Director of Advocacy for Healthy Air at the American Lung Association. Thank you for the opportunity to provide comment today. I'd first like to say that the American Lung Association welcomes efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions as they are driving climate change. Just last week, I and millions of other Americans in the eastern U.S. got a taste, at times literally, of what viscerally polluted air is like, something the western states know all too well. Climate change is leading to more frequent and intense wildfires that caused the smoke we experienced last week, as well as other risks like flooding, extreme heat, and a worsening of air pollution. These impacts threaten health, including lung health. The proposal provides flexibility for operators to choose which pathway of best system of emissions reduction is most viable. One of the pathways offered for gas plants, both new and existing, is for the plant to co-fire its gas with hydrogen. The American Lung Association remains concerned about the health and climate impacts of combustion-based electricity generation. As we have commented before in other EPA rulemakings, natural gas, or more accurately, methane gas, is accelerating climate change at levels worse than carbon. It is imperative that reducing the amount of methane emitted into the air be a solution in protecting health from the dangers of climate change. Co-firing methane gas with hydrogen could be an effective tool in mitigating carbon emissions, but only if truly zero emission hydrogen is used, often referred to as green hydrogen. Green hydrogen is made using 100% renewable electricity. Using other forms of hydrogen would actually be counterproductive as those types, referred to as blue, gray, or even sometimes clean hydrogen, actually rely on methane gas to form. This perpetuates the reliance on methane, therefore undermining the goals of this proposal. I urge EPA to prioritize the use of truly zero emission hydrogen to maximize the health and climate benefits that are intended by the proposal. Even with the strict use of co-firing with green hydrogen or capturing 90% of carbon with carbon capture and sequestration, running coal and gas power plants negatively impacts communities living in close proximity. Air pollutants like nitrogen oxides and particulate matter are emitted during combustion and can degrade local air quality. Communities living near power plants especially deserve EPA's commitment to use every tool available to protect their health from air pollution. I am eager to see EPA hold states accountable for conducting meaningful engagement with community members and stakeholders as outlined in the proposal. I also note that this proposal is but one of a suite of actions that are being taken by EPA to reduce air pollution and mitigate climate change, like reducing air toxics and mercury from power plants and hopefully strengthening standards for particulate matter and ozone. I urge EPA to place the protection of health at the center of the conversation and ensure that after the full suite of clean air protections are taken into account, environmental justice communities are in a better position with improved air quality. Lastly, I urge EPA to finalize this rule no later than early spring 2024. We understand that the highly technical nature of this rule will garner a substantial number of equally technical comments, but there is no time for a delay. Climate change is threatening the health of everyone right now, and will continue to get worse without action. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. Are there any questions from the panelists? Okay, thank you for your testimony. Uh, the next speaker is Elizabeth Brandt. Whenever you're ready. 
Hi, my name is Elizabeth Brandt. That's E L I Z A D E T H Brandt, B R A N D T. I'm mom to Natalia and Valencia. I'm a national field manager with Moms Clean Air Force, an organization of 1.5 million parents and caregivers across America who are taking action against air pollution and climate change. Fossil fuel power plants are responsible for almost one quarter of the climate pollution generated by the US. I support the carbon rule and I'm calling on the EPA to finalize the strongest possible climate pollution standards to hold power plants accountable for the impact their pollution has on our climate. Reducing climate warming pollution from the smokestacks of power plants will also provide families with cleaner air and a more stable climate. EPA must strengthen community input and safeguards in the final version of this rule. My family name, Brandt, refers to people who live on land that has burned. Fire is part of the cycle of life and regeneration, but only when nature is in balance. The UN IPCC has said greenhouse gas emissions have led to an increased frequency and or intensity of some weather and climate extremes, such as wildfires. Many studies demonstrate that wildfires are more severe and frequent because of human-caused climate change. According to Dr. Stephen Pine, an environmental historian, we are creating the fire equivalent of an ice age. We have a moral responsibility to reduce carbon emissions now, to protect our children from extreme weather, sea level rise, worsened air quality, and all of the impacts of climate change. Seattle, my soggy hometown, was still enduring drought and wildfire smoke when I visited in late September last year. By mid-October, there had still hardly been any rain since June. This is a far cry from growing up in the Northwest. Fall sports were all about skidding across sodden soccer fields and rowing in liquid sunshine with soaking wet socks. Climate change isn't just bringing wildfire smoke and all of its horrible health impacts to the West though. This week, my family experienced a reality we were unprepared for, intense wildfire smoke in Maryland. After seeing air quality indexes around 300 for particulate matter in the DC area this week, I can say with certainty, climate fueled fires are now a threat to air quality and health everywhere. Mom's Clean Air Force supports the EPA's carbon rule because we know that cutting climate pollution and other forms of air pollution will have profound benefits for the health of our children and everyone in our communities. At the same time, we stand in solidarity with community members that have concerns about carbon capture and storage and support the protections they want for their communities. We have serious concerns about massive deployment of unproven, untested, unregulated, and potentially dangerous industrial scale technologies that may even make climate pollution worse and may harm the communities in which these technologies are cited. Many of these communities have already borne the brunt of industrial scale pollution and fossil fuel industry. Personally, I believe that we are at a point where each of us can make a tremendous difference in the future of America and humanity. I can't wait to see all the good things that will come from slashing power plant, power plant pollution and accelerating our switch to wind and solar. Please lean into this exciting opportunity um, to collaborate with environmental justice communities in shaping the clean energy future that benefits these communities the most. Again, I'm calling on EPA to finalize the strongest possible climate pollution standards with increased input from affected families. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions from the panelists? Okay. Thank you for your testimony. The next two speakers will be Elizabeth uh, Beckard and Jessica Hamilton whenever you're ready. Thank you. My name is Elizabeth Bechard, and that's spelled B-E-C-H-A-R-D. And I'm a senior policy analyst for Moms Clean Air Force. I live in Essex, Vermont with my partner and seven-year-old twins. I support EPA's proposal to limit, to limit carbon emissions from fossil fuel power plants and ask that EPA finalize these standards as quickly as possible. And I echo the concerns of community members who worry about how carbon capture and storage will affect their lives and their families. Along with much of the rest of the East Coast this last week, my family stayed indoors for several days as smoky air from Canadian wildfires blanketed our community. My seven-year-old son has both ADHD and sensory processing disorder. When he cannot play outside, this child literally climbs the walls. Last summer, when we lived in North Carolina, there were multiple stretches of extreme heat that made it unsafe for him to play outside because a medication he was taking made his little body more sensitive to the high temperatures. 
Having to keep any energetic child indoors is both stressful and heartbreaking for parents, especially when we know that it didn't have to be this way. We know that human-caused climate change is making both wildfires and episodes of extreme heat more frequent and intense. One of my close friends texted me last week on a day when the smoke was especially bad and asked, is this what the rest of our kids' childhood is going to be like? How do you answer a question like that? I'm already dreading the day when my children themselves ask, is this what the rest of our childhood is going to be like? Our children, future generations, and all other vulnerable communities who have contributed the least to the problem of climate change, and yet they are the ones who will bear the heaviest burdens as impacts like wildfires and extreme heat continue to worsen. This is profoundly unjust, and we have a moral responsibility to act now by reducing carbon pollution as quickly as possible. We also have a moral responsibility to ensure that the ways we address climate change don't add more to the unconscionable weight that environmental justice communities and younger generations are already carrying. While I don't live in a community that is immediately facing the concerns of carbon capture and storage, I cannot imagine the burden for families of worrying both about climate impacts and the potential dangers of technology that isn't adequately regulated and hasn't been tested at scale. I wish I could tell my children that the wildfire smoke and extreme heat won't come again, but I know that they will. Yet it is not too late for us to act on climate, and we are at a critical moment of choice. Although fossil fuel power plants have contributed a quarter of the carbon pollution in the U.S. causing climate change, it doesn't have to be this way moving forward. We have abundant sources of clean, renewable, and sustainable energy like wind and solar. We can and must make choices that protect both communities and future generations. I applaud EPA for taking action to reduce climate pollution from power plants because the consequences of our failure to act become clearer every day. And EPA must strengthen community input and safeguards in the final version of this rule. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you very much. Any, any questions from the panelists? Okay, thank you very much. The next speaker is Jessica Hamilton. Whenever you're ready. Hello. Thanks. I'm Jessica Hamilton, J E S S I C A H A M I L T O N. Thank you for the opportunity to testify and for proposing these rules to protect our communities from the dangerous climate pollution emitted by power plants. I live in Colorado with my family in a community that lives constantly under the threat of wildfire, smoke, extreme drought, flooding, and heat waves. Science tells us that parts of my state may run completely out of water before my daughter is my age. The climate crisis is an urgent threat to my community and to the health and welfare of all Americans. That's why I'm so grateful to see these crucial limits for power plants proposed by the EPA. These standards are a good starting point, but there are several important areas where the rules must be strengthened to fully protect our health and welfare as EPA is required to do under law. First, EPA must expand the scope of the rule for existing gas plants. As proposed, less than 10% of existing gas plants would be required to limit their emissions. That is unacceptable and a dereliction of EPA's duty under the Clean Air Act to protect Americans from deadly climate pollution. EPA should expand the rule to cover as many gas plants as possible, down to at least 100 megawatts. Second, EPA must accelerate all compliance timelines from 2035 to at least 2030 so that power plants begin to reduce their emissions this decade. Technologies to reduce climate pollution are available now, and climate science demands that we half U.S. carbon pollution by 2030. Waiting until 2035 for requirements to begin would violate the calls of climate science and violate EPA's mandate under the law. The ability for some coal plants to stay online until 2039, largely without reducing their emissions, is also unacceptable. This retirement loophole should be eliminated. Finally, we've waited for far too long for polluting power plants to clean up their act. EPA should act with urgency to finalize a rule before March 2024. Our families and our future cannot wait. I'd like to thank EPA for your work tackling deadly pollution from power plants. These rules would create real, tangible, and massive benefits for climate and public health. I'm calling on the agency to match the urgency of the climate threat and finalize the strongest possible version of these rules. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Are there any questions for the speaker from the panelists? Okay, thank you again. The next two speakers will be Patrice uh, 
Tomchek and Liz uh, Hurtado. And I apologize for any mispronunciations here. <laughs> Whenever you're ready. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Patrice Tomchek, P A T R I C E. T-O-M-C-I-K, and I am the National Field Director for Moms Clean Air Force, a community of over 1.5 million moms united to equitably protect our children's health from air pollution and climate change. I live in Gibsonia, Pennsylvania, located within the greater Pittsburgh region with my husband and my two young children. I support the carbon rule because cutting climate pollution and other forms of air pollution will have profound benefits for the health of our children and everyone in our communities. Power plants are responsible for roughly a quarter of the climate pollution in the U.S. In southwestern Pennsylvania, where I live, two coal-fired power plants, the Keystone and Kahnema power generating stations, are still operating and emitting very large amounts of climate warming air pollution. Climate change has contributed to shorter, warmer winters, providing ideal conditions for Lyme disease carrying ticks to thrive and multiply faster, especially in the Northeast. Children aged five through nine have the highest historical rates of Lyme disease of any age group. Pick checks have become a standard routine in our house as I have repeatedly had to remove them from my family and dogs. More than 10 people I know have been treated for Lyme disease in the past five years, including my husband. In addition to their climate benefits, the proposals would also result in cutting other pollution pollutants such as particulate matter, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxide, and that are harmful to health. I have lived my whole life in southwestern Pennsylvania and grew up living two miles downwind from the coal-fired Cheswick power generating station, which shuttered in 2022. As a child, I watched the plume from the stacks of the Cheswick plant float over the river towards the playground where I played. I missed a lot of school due to chronic bronchitis, and now as an adult, I have respiratory problems. My mother has chronic cough and respiratory problems, and my father had COPD and a heart attack requiring quintuple bypass surgery before he passed two years ago. It is well known that the greater Pittsburgh region has some of the worst air pollution in the nation, according to the American Lung Association. I applaud the EPA for offering power plants multiple pathways for cleaning up their carbon pollution in the proposed rule. However, I have serious concerns about using hydrogen and carbon capture and storage technologies to attempt reductions in carbon emissions since the large scale use has not been tested and thus could make climate pollution worse while harming the communities in which these technologies are cited. In southwestern Pennsylvania, both CCS and hydrogen are being considered and I have concerns about these technologies that may result in even greater harm for children like mine that have already borne the brunt of industrial scale pollution from the fossil fuel industry. My home is located downwind from the polluting Shell petrochemical complex, and there are many fracked methane gas wells in my children's school district, the closest one located a half a mile away from their campus. The good news is that there are better alternatives to fossil fuels such as clean, renewable, and sustainable wind and solar energy. And I support the acceleration of these healthy energy sources. Once again, I support the EPA's proposal to limit carbon, em carbon emissions from fossil fuel power plants. However, it is very important that the EPA consider safeguards for communities overburdened by the fossil fuel build out in the final version of this rule. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Are there any questions from the panelists for the speaker? Okay, thank you very much. The, the next speaker is uh, Liz Hurtado, whenever you're ready. My name is Liz Hurtado, L-I-Z-H-U-R-T-A-D-O, and I'm a National Field Manager for Moms Clean Air Force and as Latino Engagement Program Eco Madres. I live in Virginia Beach, Virginia with my husband and four children. As much of the East Coast and Midwest were enveloped with wildfire smoke last week, Millions faced a stark reminder that climate change isn't some faraway abstract concept. Climate change is here now, and this has been the reality for countless people around the country and around the world. We can't further delay action to address the root cause of the problem. We must act today. We're already seeing an increase in temperatures, extreme weather events, drought, flooding, and sea level rise in areas across the United States. And these impacts are expected to get worse as carbon pollution in our atmosphere increases. 
That's why I'm here today to call on the EPA to finalize the strongest possible carbon rule standards for the health and safety of our communities. Historical racism in the re residential housing market known as redlining has had an enduring influence on where power plants are located today, causing communities of color and low income communities to be more likely to bear the negative health impacts of power plant emissions. Disproportionate exposure to air pollution in these communities is linked to premature death, childhood asthma attacks, and a host of other chronic and debilitating health conditions. These are communities who are already uh, overburdened with cumulative impacts from other sources of industrial pollution. We must address the root cause of this human caused climate pollution and hold power plants accountable. We must center the voices, experiences and expertise of those most impacted and move towards a just and equitable clean energy future. Renewable and sustainable sources of energy like wind and solar must be accelerated. The massive deployment of unproven, untested, unregulated and potentially dangerous industrial scale technologies may harm the very communities we are trying to protect. Black, brown, indigenous, and low-income communities who have historically faced a disproportionate burden of environmental injustices and adverse health outcomes could be further impacted. So I am calling on EPA to strengthen community input and safeguards in the final version of this rule and to finalize these standards as quickly as possible to reduce the greenhouse gas pollution and costly climate change in order to protect the health of our communities. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you very much. Um, are there questions from our panelists? Thank you for your testimony this morning. Okay. So the next two speakers, I'm waiting. For the next two speakers will be Samantha uh, Schmitz and Dominique. I'm not saying a last name. Hi, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Samantha Schmitz, and I'm the DC Events Coordinator for Moms Clean Air Force, currently living in Washington, DC. I support the carbon rule overall, but I urge the EPA to finalize the strongest possible standards while also increasing mechanisms for community engagement. We know that power plants are responsible for roughly a quarter of current climate warming pollution, with over 60% of that coming from burning fossil fuels. And we're seeing the impacts of the climate crisis all around us already. The wildfire smoke that covered the East Coast in a blanket of haze last week was just one reminder. But notably, it also exacerbated another dire issue caused by the climate crisis, worsened asthma. In fact, the climate crisis can effectively worsen asthma in many ways, including intensified wildfires like we saw last week, increased pollen, more frequent heat waves, and worsened smog. I've struggled with severe asthma throughout my entire life and know that I'm not alone, as 25 million other Americans have asthma as well. I've had asthma attacks that have ended in hospitalizations that have greatly affected not just me, but my entire family. I still remember how upset my parents were when I was, went to the emergency room when I was younger, and even just at regular doctor's visits as a child when they watched me gasp for air and struggle to breathe on an ongoing basis. And unfortunately, I fear that my asthma will get worse if we don't combat the climate crisis and cut our emissions now. Unfortunately, climate change is also an issue of generational injustice. Today's children will live through at least three times as many climate disasters as their grandparents. And as a young person, I'm already feeling these generational impacts and the mental health implications that dirty air and climate change cause, but I can only imagine what my kids and future generations might experience. With fossil fuel power plants being responsible for such a large share of our climate warming pollution, it is essential that we take action to curb their emissions so we can avoid the most dire climate consequences. However, we must also be acutely aware of the environmental injustices of the past and make an active choice not to repeat them. With that in mind, many already overburdened communities have serious concerns about the massive deployment of industrial scale technologies whose safety and efficacy have yet to be proven. 
Rather than endanger the same communities with more risks and potential hazards, we must instead utilize the abundant renewable energy options that we already have and have already proven themselves. I'm calling on the EPA to live out its commitment to environmental justice and substantially strengthen me mechanisms for community engagement and safeguards in the final version of this rule. Please finalize the strongest possible carbon rule standards to help protect our communities from the harms of climate warming power plants. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Are there any questions for the speaker from our panelists this morning? Thank you. The, the next speaker is uh, Dominique Browning. Hi, my name is Dominique Browning, B-R-O-W-N-I-N-G. I'm here representing more than a million members of Mom's Clean Air Force, people who love their children, and one seven-year-old grandson too young to join us, but he is able to speak for himself. At age seven, he understands that we are harming our planet, that we have polluted the seas and hurt sea creatures, which fascinate him to the point that he has stopped eating animals. When he grows up, he says he wants to protect ocean creatures. He loves them. So he explained to me, why would I eat something I want to protect? We have come to a time in our human history where even a child has glimmers of our contributions to epic global scale catastrophe. A child, <clears throat> millions of children now understand that our planet is in danger. It is too hot to go outside to play for weeks at a stretch. The air is dangerous to breathe day after day. Out of control wildfires, raging floods, devastating droughts around the world are supercharged by a changing climate. We must get climate emissions under control. We have thrown so much carbon dioxide into the atmosphere that we have literally changed the chemistry of the oceans, home to those beloved sea creatures, something once unimaginable. The power sector contributes more than a quarter of the carbon dioxide emissions that turbocharge climate change and make life increasingly dangerous. We cannot do nothing. We have no choice but to act. It is a moral imperative. For that reason, we commend the agency's determination to tackle the climate crisis, to say nothing of the health crises caused by air pollution. We commend EPA for tackling pollution from new and existing coal and gas fired plants. We cannot, we must not do nothing. Another moral imperative, do no further harm. We must not inflict even greater suffering on communities that have already borne the brunt of our industrial scale fossil fuel pollution. Because why would we harm people we want to protect? Members of Mom's Clean Air Force have concerns about rules that result in the massive deployment of unproven at scale, untested, unregulated, economically unfeasible, and potentially dangerous technologies that could make climate pollution worse and could harm the communities in which these technologies are cited. Community concerns must be heard. Those concerns must be acknowledged and addressed. The good news, we have at hand the tools to reduce emissions. It is the job of moms to demand greater deployment with far more agents urgency and focus of clean, renewable, abundant, and sustainable sources of energy to get us on a safer path. We have options for creating energy that do not emit carbon dioxide and methane into the atmosphere in the first place. We will be faced with increasingly difficult choices in the years of turmoil ahead of us. We have a moral obligation to protect all we love, people, creatures, lands, oceans. We must do everything we can to slow and stop climate emissions without sacrificing communities in the effort. So thank you to the Environmental Protection Agency for tackling this terrible and urgent challenge. Thank you very much for your testimony. Are there any questions from our panelists? I, think I, I enjoyed your your um, your story about your grandson. Thank you. Um, the next two speakers uh, will be uh, Solara Hughes and Sarah Bucic. 
And again, I apologize for any mispronunciations. Whenever you're ready. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to give testimony today. My name is Solera Hughes, C-E-L-E-R-A-H-H-E-W-E-S. And I live in Albuquerque, New Mexico with my family. I'm a national field manager for Moms Clean Air Force, an organization with over one and a half million parents, caregivers, and family members working to protect our children's health from the impacts of climate change and air pollution. Fossil fuel power plants are responsible for almost one quarter of the climate pollution generated by the United States. And I'm here today because I strongly support EPA's proposal to limit carbon emissions from fossil fuel power plants to help protect our families from the harmful pollution that contributes to climate change and impacts health. EPA must strengthen community input and safeguards before swiftly approving a final version of this rule. I was born in New Mexico. When I decided to have a family, this is where I wanted to raise children. Living near the mountains and our expansive blue skies were something I wanted my child to experience. But I'm already seeing that the place that we call home will not be the same for my child given the impacts of climate change. Extreme heat, drought, and wildfires are some of the most concerning impacts that we are seeing in the Southwest. This June, we've seen the horrific impact of climate change and air pollution on the East Coast as smoke from Canadian wildfires has blanketed numerous states and major cities. In April of 2022, New Mexico had 20 wildfires burning in 16 counties across the state. Half of the state was on fire. Even for those not living in evacuation areas, smoke from the fire impacted our air quality, and there were days where we could not see the Sandia Mountains that take up our eastern views, and we were advised not to go outside. Last summer, extreme heat also called my caused my child to have heat stroke on numerous days, and her summer camp had to move activities inside due to high temperatures. This problem is only going to get worse if we do not act now. The proposed standards to limit greenhouse gas emissions and other forms of air pollution from new and existing coal and gas fired power plants are important because they will hold power plants accountable for their pollution. The proposed rules will also protect public health by cutting harmful air pollutants that are known to endanger people's health, especially in communities that for too long have disproportionately shouldered the burden of high pollution and environmental injustice. It is estimated that my child will live through at least three times as many climate disasters as my parents did. In addition, studies have shown that the impacts of climate change will also impact her ability to learn as well as her mental health. We must do something now to protect the generations to come. And that is why I support EPA's proposal to limit carbon emissions from fossil fuel power plants and ask that you finalize these standards as quickly as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions from the panelists from the speaker? Okay, thank you. The next uh, speaker will be uh, Sarah Bucic. Thanks so much. Thanks for the opportunity to provide comments. My name is Sarah Bucic, S-A-R-A-H, last name B-U-C-I-C. I'm from Wilmington, Delaware, and I've been a registered nurse for over 20 years, and I'm here today with the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments. We're the only national nursing organization focused solely on the intersection of health and the environment. And as nurses, we're led by our professional obligations, which make addressing health, environment, and safety a professional focus of ours. Annie thanks EPA for proposing standards to limit the carbon pollution from power plants, and we urge EPA to strengthen the rule further to ensure adequate enforcement and engagement with communities. As we know, in 2021, the power sector was the largest stationary source of greenhouse gases in the U.S., emitting 25% of domestic emissions. EPA's proposal would cut carbon pollution by 617 million metric tons, but it would also cut other dangerous air pollutants released by power plants, such as particulate matter, sulfur dioxide, and nitrogen oxides, all of these which we know are dangerous to public health. As a resident of Delaware for over four decades, uh, I know it's the lowest lying state and our sea level is rising. When I lived in Delaware City, which is right near the Delaware City refinery, it's a large petrochemical plant refining sour crude oil and utilizing natural gas for many of its operations. There were numerous weather events there that washed out the main roads in and out of our town. Nearby to the Delaware City refinery is the Reedy Point Bridge, where sea level has been measured for decades. The sea level only rose by about four inches since 1956. However, the speed of sea level rise is accelerating, and over the last 10 years, it's now rising by about an inch every decade. 
So reducing these carbon emissions will help slow the process of sea level rise and save the 9,500 properties and the families that live in those properties that are at risk due to the sea level rising. EPA's proposals will make a huge difference for the communities that live near the water, which we know are many times the same communities where, nearby where fossil fuel power sources are located. The communities that surround power plants are often environmental justice communities, and these same communities will have to endure increased flooding of these areas. We know these areas are often co-located where there's brownfields, Superfund sites, legacy pollution, and groundwater contamination. So when flooding occurs, it brings with it toxic chemicals. As someone who has lived near a power plant, I urge EPA to expand the number of plants that are covered under this proposal to achieve further reductions in pollution. Community protections and input are needed, along with rigorous monitoring, verification, and enforcement. States should require meaningful engagement with pro proactive outreach to communities that could be affected by power plant operations, as communities that live near power plants are exposed to disproportionate levels of pollution, which exacerbates their health harms. Thanks for the opportunity to provide comments today. I urge EPA to move swiftly to finalize the strongest possible climate pollution standards for power plants by early 2024. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Are there any questions for the speaker? Okay, thank you very much. The next two speakers will be Patrick Drupp and Brian Burton. Hey, thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is Patrick Drupp, P-A-T-R-I-C-K-D-R-U-P-P. -P -P, and I live in Washington, D.C., where I'm the Director of Climate Policy at the Sierra Club. Uh, I want to thank you all for the opportunity to speak today at this hearing, and thanks especially to the EPA team and the administration for their continued efforts on this important carbon pollution standards proposal. Um, on behalf of the Sierra Club's millions of members and supporters, I'm here today to voice our support for the administration's proposal and to urge you to further strengthen this rule's scope and stringency and ensure a final rule is issued no later than spring of 2024. Time is running out and there can be no more delays. Though I'm here on behalf of the Sierra Club, before I began working there, I was an oceanographer researching the effects of climate change and increased carbon pollution on coral reefs. And it was heartbreaking to watch these reefs literally die and begin to dissolve and waste away from ocean acidification and ocean warming uh, in just a matter of years. Carbon pollution threatens those ecosystems and all of the people who depend on them. But the threat doesn't just stop there. Biodiversity and ecosystems everywhere are being destroyed in real time. Communities are faced with rising seas threatening their homes, dangerous and more severe storms, droughts, floods, wildfires like those here in DC have seen recently, um, and at times that were previously unheard of. And as always, uh, the communities that contribute the least to this crisis are bearing the disproportionate amount of the burden. Um, climate change is making extreme weather events far more severe and more frequent, and this is our reality. The, the crisis is here, it's not a far off vague threat um, and it's impacting millions of people and harming communities every single day in every single state. Um, the Clean Air Act is clear though, and EPA has the authority to act. And in fact, they are obligated to act to protect public health and the environment from carbon pollution. And that authority was further bolstered last year under the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, this proposal is a very good start and sends an important signal that the power sector must start to decarbonize. For too long, uh, power plants have been able to dump carbon pollution into the air with impunity and to have any chance of meaningfully tackling the carbon, the climate crisis, that must end. EPA should work to further strengthen the rule in a number of ways, expanding the scope and stringency of plants that are uh, uh, under the rule and the standards that they are based on. And additionally, EPA should expand the scope of plants covered in the existing gas standard uh, to, to go further than, than what was proposed, which would currently cover less than 10% of the existing gas plants and only 30% of the fleet's emissions. Finally, EPA must ensure that there is robust community transparency and stakeholder engagement in all state implementation plans. We were encouraged to see this need acknowledged in the preamble of the rule, and we urge you to ensure that state plans take this into account, including rigorous monitoring and enforcement requirements, regardless of the method of compliance. These standards will avoid and reduce nearly 1 billion metric tons, million, I'm sorry, 1 billion metric tons or more if further strengthened of carbon pollution with climate and public health net benefits of 85 billion or more. The cost of climate in inaction is enormous and this plan will ultimately save consumers money, avoid thousands of premature deaths, hospitalizations, lost work days, and will begin tackling the climate crisis by meaningfully reducing carbon emissions from the power sector. 
Thank you all for the work on this. Again, the climate crisis is here. There is no time for further delay, and we urge you to finalize the strongest possible standard in the time required. Thank you. Thank you this, for your testimony this morning. Uh, are there any questions from our panelists? Okay, thank you very much. The next speaker is Brian Burton. Whenever you're ready. Hello, my name is Brian Burton, B-R-Y-A-N-B-U-R-T-O-N. I'm the advocacy manager for Healthy Air for the American Lung Association. ALA supports the greenhouse gas standards and guidelines for fossil fuel fired power plants and urges EPA to finalize the most protective rule possible in the early spring 2024. EPA's stated goal is to provide an environment where all people enjoy the same degree of protection from environmental and health hazards and equal access to the decision-making process to maintain a healthy environment in which to live, learn, and work. This cannot be possible so long as protective steps are not taken to ensure all communities and groups collectively experience the benefits of new regulations. EPA projects these pro proposals will cut 617 million metric tons of carbon pollution through 2042 from existing coal and new natural gas fleets, as well as an additional up to 407 million metric tons from the existing gas fleet. These reductions will have a significant positive effect in arresting the advance of global climate change. At the same time, it is important to consider that while some power plants are reducing their carbon outputs, air pollutants like nitrogen oxides and particulate matter are still being emitted during combustion and can degrade local air quality. In the last week, the northeastern United States was severely affected by wildfire smoke moving downwind from Atlantic Canada. Climate change makes wildfires more prevalent and severe. Its effects also bring the threats of smoke to areas that have been more traditionally resistant to burning. Because air pollution does not respect any national, provincial, or state borders, heavily populated northern cities once thought immune from the dangers of wildfire must now account for their serious health risks. It is well known through research that environmental justice communities and sensitive groups too often experience the worst effects of air pollution and climate change emergencies like these. Low socioeconomic status consistently increased the risk of premature death from fine particle pollution among over 13 million Medicare recipients studied in the largest examination of particle pollution related mortality nationwide. EPA's own 2021 study found racial ethnic disparities for nearly all major emissions categories. White people are exposed to lower than average concentrations from emission source types, causing 60% lower overall exposure. Whereas people of color experience greater than average exposures from source types causing 75% of overall exposure. Harvard's research last year concurred that Blacks, Asians, Hispanics, Latinos, and low-income populations are being exposed to higher levels of dangerous fine particle pollution. Environmental justice communities are even more likely to work outside or environments in environments lacking air conditioning or air filtration. The final outcome of these regulations will have a significant impact on the future breathing of our most vulnerable populations. For this reason, pollution control strategies to mitigate climate change should also directly reduce local adverse air quality impacts that immediately harm health. The Lung Association applauds that in year 2030 alone, the health benefits of the proposals on new gas and existing coal include approximately 1,300 avoided premature deaths, more than 800 avoided hospital and emergency room visits, approximately 2,000 avoided cases of asthma, more than 300,000 avoided cases of asthma symptoms, 38,000 avoided school absence days, and 66,000 lost work days. However, depending on the scenario modeled, up to 170 million people could experience worsening particulate matter PM2.5 concentrations and as many as 196 million people could experience worsening ozone concentrations under the proposed rules. Fine soot and continued emissions of oxides of nitrogen can cause lung damage on their own and can react in the atmosphere to form ground level ozone. These widespread air pollutants can cause a range of adverse health effects, including asthma attacks and even premature death. We as need such, to please wrap up. I urge EPA to weigh the impact on fence line communities 
when finalizing the strongest version of this rule and doing so no later than early spring 2024. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so um, you, you mentioned several studies, uh, I think from Harvard and, and EPA, and um, if you are submitting um, comments to the docket, uh, written comments, we would urge you to include those, uh, those studies as well. It's always very helpful. Yes, I will absolutely do so. Are there any questions from the other panelists? Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, the next two speakers will be uh, David Shadburn and Jonathan uh, Levinshus. Thank you for the time to speak with you all today about the importance of strong carbon pollution standards from power plants. My name is David Shadburn, D-A-V-I-D-S-H-A-D-B-U-R-N, and I'm a senior government affairs advocate focused on climate change and clean energy at the League of Conservation Voters. On behalf of LCV, our 33 state affiliates, and members across the country, I commend EPA for proposing much needed limits on climate pollution from power plants and encourage you to finalize limits that cut pollution faster and at a greater number of new and existing plants. We believe the rule needs to be strengthened in the following ways. First, EPA must speed up the compliance timelines in order to ensure frontline communities get relief from decades of pollution and the U.S. meets its climate commitments. Any new gas plants proposed should have to comply immediately upon operation, not be able to wait until 2035. Existing gas plants should have to reduce emissions more quickly by 2030 instead of 2035. And existing coal plants should not be allowed to continue uncontrolled operation just because they pledged to close in over a decade and a half. They should have to close by 2028 or reduce their emissions. Second, EPA must expand the scope of power plants that are covered by these rules. The proposed rule for existing gas plants only covers the largest baseload units over 300 megawatts that run greater than a 50% capacity factor. As proposed, the majority of climate pollution from existing gas plants would continue unabated. We encourage you to reduce the unit size to 100 megawatts and the capacity factor to 40% in order to keep moderately large polluters from getting away without emissions limits. Third, we urge EPA to achieve greater emissions reductions in some of the proposed categories, including those for new so-called peaker plants and intermediate plants. Fourth, EPA must ensure that impacted communities have meaningful input on these rules, future compliance plans, and more. EPA's proposed requirements for continuous emissions monitoring must be finalized in the rule and enforced, and EPA and DOT must take subsequent actions to protect against CO2 pipeline and storage pollution in communities. Finally, EPA must finalize these rules as soon as possible to ensure that the U.S. remains on track to meet its climate goals. We urge you to publish final rules no later than the first months of next year. EPA has obligations and authorities under the Clean Air Act as reaffirmed by West Virginia v. EPA and clarified in the Inflation Reduction Act to regulate CO2 from power plants. This proposal is a good step. EPA must swiftly finalize the strongest possible rules with faster timelines, more power plants covered, and strong community safeguards in place. Thank you again for your time. Thank you. Are there any questions from the Speaker, Stephanie. Thank you. I, I would ask um, you, you were specific about um, some ways it could be strengthened and also mentioned the peakers and intermediate standards. If you wanted to give us information about how those standards could be strengthened, you could do so now if you have that or in written comments. Thank you. Yeah, happy to follow up with that in the written comments that we'll submit. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, the next speaker is Jonathan uh, Levinshus. I apologize if that's not spelled uh, pronounced correctly. Hi there. Um, my name is, good afternoon. My name is Jonathan Levinshus, J O N A T H A N, last name Levinshus, L E V E N S H U S. I'm the director of federal energy campaigns at the Sierra Club, the nation's largest grassroots environmental organization. I'm joining today to offer my support for the EPA's proposal to set urgently needed limits on carbon emissions from coal and gas power plants. One of the most important steps we can take to confront the climate crisis is cutting, at long last, power plant carbon pollution. 
The unchecked carbon pollution from these power plants is an affront to public health and completely incompatible with every climate ambition our country has. This proposal targets the source of about a third of U.S. carbon pollution or a quarter of the nation's climate heating greenhouse gas emissions. It complements the clean energy incentives and the Inflation Reduction Act at, that make it cheaper and easier to clean up the power sector. It's grounded in longstanding authority under the Clean Air Act, affirmed and reaffirmed affirmed by the courts to regulate carbon pollution from carbon from power plants. It delivers reductions in other power plant pollution like soot and sulfur dioxide that harm public health, especially in low income communities and people of color. Importantly, it gives power companies the flexibility to choose any compliance strategy that achieves EPA's climate pollution standards, including retiring plants early or accepting enforceable limits on how often those units run. Grid operators, balancing authorities, and regulatory bodies have already been planning for increasingly rapid shifts away from fossil fuel generation. The EPA's rule is fully consistent with those efforts meaning the electric grid should not should have no difficulty accommodating any generation changes that result from this rule. Grid reliability will not be jeopardized. What will jeopardize grid reliability, however, is taking insufficient action to mitigate climate change. If we fail to reduce carbon pollution from every sector, including electricity generation, extreme temperature spikes will get worse, we'll see more flooding and intense storms, and our resources will be constrained. Finally, the EPA's rule will help pave the way for cleaner, cheaper energy. The EPA's modeling of this rule bears this out, showing little to no impact on consumers' electricity bills while providing billions of dollars in climate and public health benefits. Furthermore, it's now more cost-effective to install and operate new wind and solar facilities than it is to simply maintain existing coal plants. Clean energy is cheaper than 90% of proposed gas plants. That means the best way to reduce deadly air and climate pollution, lower energy costs, and address long-standing burdens on fence line and frontline communities is the development of clean energy. As the EPA works to finalize this st these standards, it will be important to move forward without delay. I urge you to make sure the final approach is informed by insights of communities and states that are leading on climate change and by stakeholders that are prepared to help implement the standards effectively and equitably. Please act decisively to finalize robust and durable standards by early spring 2024. Completing this rule will ensure the Biden administration confronts the rising costs and mounting dangers of the widening climate crisis and delivers meaningful public health protections to us all. Thank you for considering my comments today. Thank you very much. Are there any questions from the panelists? Thank you for your testimony. Okay. Waiting now for the next uh, speakers. Um, the next two speakers are Kimberly uh, Gila and Chelsea Lyons. Hi, good morning. EPA, thank you for allowing me to testify today. I'm Kimberly Gaylor, K-I-M-B-E-R-L-Y-G-I-L-A. I live in San Francisco, California, so I'm well aware and sympathize with what's going on in the East Coast with the wildfires, but California has been devastated by wildfires. I am also a member of Elders Climate Action, and they have chapters in different states for people become members. I'm 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 a member also of the Northern California Elders Climate Action Chapter and the and on um, and fossil fuels fuels are destroying the planet, putting too much emissions in the air. And that's what's making all this weather chaotic. And putting fossil plants most, you know, um is sad when it's placed in poor neighborhoods such as the black people and the indigenous peoples where they have breeding problems. And all races need to be breed, um, you know, uh, clean air. And climate change is real. Look what's going on all over the world, wrecking habit, habit, all these wildfires, breeding bad smoke, air, and and um, 
in San Francisco a while back, Pacific Gas and Electric had a power plant in the poor black neighborhood, but that's since been removed. removed. So that's a big victory. And, and, and over there in Richmond, California, there's power plants in poor black neighborhoods. And um, I'm fighting the elder climate action of fighting for the future generations. And uh, as well, I'm a new grandmother. My grandson is one year old. He's too young to speak, but I'm speaking for him. I already, he, already he has allergies and he gets colds a lot. So that's a bit concerning. And um, it's gonna take a village to fight this uh, climate action going on all over the world. And, and uh, uh, um, you know, it, the, the, the time for now is to, is to, is to change to renewable energy resources. So in your new proposals, change to renewable energy resources and fossil fuels to destroy the planet. And um, there's a lot to say, but, but thank you for your time. I, and thank you for allowing me to testify in this very important matter. Thank you very much for taking the time to testify. You're uh, welcome. Thank I you. really appreciate it. Congratulations on becoming a grandmother. And um, any um, any questions or comments from this panel? Okay, thank you very much. The next speaker is Chelsea Lyons. Whenever you're ready. Hi, hello, and thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Chelsea Lyons, C-H-E-L-S-E-A-L-Y-O-N-S. -E and I live in Trinity, North Carolina with my husband, one-year-old son and two dogs. I serve as the North Carolina State Coordinator for Moms Clean Air Force. On behalf of our 75,000 members in North Carolina, we strongly before support EPA's proposal, excuse me, to limit carbon emissions from fossil fuel power plants as an asset EPA finalize these standards as soon as possible. In North Carolina, 51% of the state's electricity in 2021 was generated by fossil fuels. At this moment, North Carolina has eight active coal fire and 19 natural gas power plants. My family and I live less than 50 miles from the Bellows Creek Station, a coal fire power plant that has been active since 1974, which is pictured behind me. The Bellaloose Creek Station has been known as a big polluter in North Carolina. While Duke Energy has announced it will transition the plant from coal fire to natural gas by 2035, they have no plans to retire the plant or transition to clean energy. This means my family will continue to live in the shadow of fossil fuel production, as well as many other families who live closer to the plant and are subjected to harm harmful pollution every day. As you may be aware, the health issues that stem from long-term pollution exposure from power plants include increased respiratory illness, cardiovascular diseases, adverse birth outcomes, mental health impacts, and more. In the past few years since moving into this community, I have experienced symptoms of severe allergies, difficulty breathing, and coughing. This year, my son has shown symptoms of severe allergies as well, making me nervous for his lung development. As a mom, it is my duty to stand up for the children and the rights that he has for my child, excuse me, and the right that he has to a healthy life. And I want the power plants in our community to be held to stricter standards for the safety of our kids for my kid. Due to climate change, we have seen an increase in extreme weather events, but just this past Tuesday, as everybody else has explained, I received an air quality alert on my phone saying to limit times outdoors due to high particle pollution exposure from the wildfires happening in Canada. These wildfires are just an example of a natural disaster ca causing poor living conditions for millions of people. What does that mean for my son and the other children who are exposed to pollution air like this? Children's developing lungs are especially vulnerable to air pollution. About 80% of the air sacs within a child's lungs are developed throughout their childhood. We need to make immediate changes that will positively impact our efforts towards tackling climate change. I believe we can make a difference if we are to act now. 
We have the ability to change standards that force major polluters to abide by strong guidelines that will help in the efforts to protect our planet. The children in North Carolina and other states deserve better than to be exposed to polluted air caused by these power plants. I want to thank the EPA and their efforts to continue to provide a healthy environment for all, but to continue that trend, we need to strong we need to create strong standards to limit carbon emissions from fossil fuel power plants. And I ask the EPA finalize these standards as soon as possible. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much for your testimony. Are there any questions for the speaker from our panelists? Okay, thank you very much. Um, our next two speakers are uh, Sheena Oliver and uh, Zachary Barber. And as a reminder in the chat, there are instructions for how uh, you can submit comments in writing uh, to the docket. Ms. Oliver, whenever you're ready. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> Um, have a lot of allergies. Um, so thank you uh, for taking public comments. I'm Shana Oliver, S-H-A-I-N-A, um, and Oliver, O-L-I-V-R, Build Coordinator for Moms Clean Air Force, Equal Madres, Colorado Chapter. We're over 1.5 million moms, dads, and caregivers united in fighting for our children's right to clean air in, in a healthy climate. Um, importantly, I'm an Indigenous people's rights advocate, wife, and mother of four children. Today, I'm speaking in support of the carbon rule and calling on the EPA to finalize the strongest possible standards that help protect our families from harmful air pollution that contributes to climate change and impacts our health. Um, I am a tribal member of the Navajo Nation. I'm from Shiprock, New Mexico, and currently residing in Denver, Denver, Colorado, with my family. My children and I are descendants of the genocide known as the Indian Removal Act known to the Diné as the Long Walk of the Navajo. Colorado is ancestral home of 48 tribes, including my tribe, but I want to acknowledge that I currently res reside on the lands of the Arapaho and che Cheyenne nations. The indigenous people of the Rocky Mountains have seen an increase in poverty and harmful development on our ancestral lands because of unjust laws, policies, rules, and regulations. Where I grew up on the Navajo Reservation, we could see coal-fired power plants from the roads on our way home. I grew up seeing my grandfather, my I grew up seeing my grandmother make breakfast for my grandfather before he headed to the coal power plant to work. Many times he was taken to the ER for his asthma attacks, which were triggered by his job. He was eventually forced to retire due to his frequent asthma attacks. Power, power plant pollution impacts the health of workers and community members. And these impacts are worse in communities like mine, indigenous black and brown communities. He no longer has to suffer from his asthma. As he died five years ago, his cause of death was ruled unknown. He was also one of the Navajo uranium um, miners that were not provided safety equipment during the 1960s. My grandmother first took me to the ER for breathing concerns in Phoenix, Arizona when I was a baby. When I was nine, I was again taken to the ER for breathing concerns here in Denver, Colorado, and I learned I had asthma. I often missed school and had to stay indoors, and my mom missed work. To this day, I, I still struggle to breathe. Poor air quality in Colorado exacerbates these problems. In Denver, we have a gas power plant in the heart of the metro area surrounded by our communities. Colorado has faced terrible air quality due to not only to local toxic pollutants, local car exhaust and wildfire smoke from fires made worse by climate change, but also from power plant pollution in Colorado and neighboring states. As a mother, I worry about my youngest son's asthma and how much school he missed this past year. I worry about his breathing every time he is sick and worry that the air made worse by climate change keeps him indoors. Moms Clean Air Force um, knows fossil fuel powered plants are responsible for almost one quarter of the climate change or climate pollution generated by the US. The EBA must strengthen community input and safeguards in the final version of this rule and ensure community and tribal member inclusion. This rule must address climate climate pollution and ensure we we sustain a livable planet for future generations beyond us. Thank you very much for your testimony this morning. Are there any questions for the speaker from the panelists? Stephanie? 
Um, thank, thank you for your testimony. If you had any specific recommendations on strengthening community inputs and tribal engagement, we would welcome those now or in the docket. Uh, yes, um, I think we have um, partnerships with the National Tribal Air Association and they've um, been working on tribal air programs in tribal communities um, throughout the US and about roughly 153 um, tribal communities are in the works with tribal air programs as well as addressing climate action programs and as well as the institute for tribal um, environmental professionals they also have um, a, a public comment going out for tribal um, knowledge holders um, who will be giving comments as well that is a, another great resource um, with um, Nikki Cooley, who is um, who has been um, a part of that program with the ITEP, um, again, that's Inst Institute for Tribal Environmental Professionals, who are taking um, comments from tribal tribal knowledge holders right now. Um, and Nikki Cooley, um, she is one of the ones that will be receiving um, those comments, um, and will, is a great resource to connect with. That's very helpful. Um, thank, and thank you for your testimony this morning. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Zachary Barber. Great, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak this afternoon. My name is Zachary Barber, that's spelled Z-A-C-H-A-R-Y-B-A-R-B-E-R. I'm a resident here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where I have a front row seat to uh, not only uh, the impacts of climate change, but some of its causes. Like many, last week I was stuck indoors and had to skip uh, my uh, favorite morning run because of air pollution blowing down from Canadian wildfires that are being fueled in part by climate change. And of course, as I've heard other people mention here today, uh, Pennsylvania is particularly Southwest Pennsylvania is a leader in uh, carbon emissions. We have uh, not only a lot of fossil fuel coal power plants, but uh, fossil fuel gas power plants as well. And unfortunately, our leaders at the uh, state and local level have not done enough to rein in carbon emissions from these facilities. So I was uh, greatly pleased to see the EPA move forward with a proposal to tackle these carbon emissions from the power sector. It is really important that the federal government steps up and leads here uh, with a problem as big and as urgent as climate change. We can't afford to wait for our leaders at the state and local level to act. So I urge the EPA to move forward with uh, strong action to rein in uh, emissions from the power sector. Uh, and I hope that the EPA will consider strengthening the proposal to include all fossil fuel power plants, uh, existing and new coal, gas, and other fossil fuel power plants and other carbon emission, uh, carbon emitting power plants. Uh, in 2023, we know that um, any new fossil fuel infrastructure we are building is just locking ourselves in for more climate change down the line. And so I hope that we uh, will ensure that there are uh, no loopholes and that all the facilities are doing their part to help us tackle climate change. And I also will echo the recommendations made by several of the other uh, speakers here over the course of the day to uh, make the timeline a bit more aggressive. What we have seen um, in the scientific front is that climate change uh, is worsening uh, faster than we have predicted it to. We know that there are uh, feedback loops that we do not want to trip. And of course, what we've seen in the implementation realm is when we have set goals for clean technology and clean energy, uh, we have beaten those goals quite frequently. And so I think we need to be as ambitious as possible to reap the maximum benefits, both in terms of helping places like uh, my home state clean up our carbon emissions and to help protect the public from the health impacts of the toxic air pollution that results. But thank you again. I strongly support the EPA's proposal. Hope it will go a step further, but urge you to move forward as, as quickly and strongly as possible. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony this morning. Uh, are there any questions from the other panelists? Okay, thank you very much. 
Uh, the next two speakers are Alexander uh, Rabin and Peter Cocapelli. Thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to comment today. Uh, my name is Alexander Rabin, spelled A-L-E-X-A-N-D-E-R, last name Rabin, R-A-B-I-N. Uh, I'm a pulmonary and critical care physician here at the University of Michigan and the Veterans Affairs Ann Arbor Healthcare System. I have to mention that the views expressed here are my own and do not re uh, necessarily represent those of the Department of Veterans Affairs. As a VA physician specializing in occupational lung disease and military deployment related respiratory disease, I see firsthand the health impacts of air pollution that occur in our veterans, sometimes years or decades after exposure to toxic sources like military burn pits. When it comes to air pollution and the health impacts of climate change in our country, we know that the patients who are most vulnerable to the health impacts of pollution typically have contributed the least to the problem. For that reason, I believe it's critical that we transition away from fossil fuel combustion as quickly as possible to save lives and to prevent the worst impacts of climate change on our children and future generations. Uh, I applaud EPA for proposing these carbon pollution standards for fossil fuel power plants that strengthen the limits on greenhouse gas emissions and will reduce co-pollutants that contribute to respiratory disease in our patients. But I think the rules could go even further. First, I believe that the regulations should expand the number of plants covered by these rules to encompass more gas-fired uh, power plants. Second, the regulations should speed up compliance schedules to ensure a faster phase-out of power plant fossil fuel emissions. And third, the regulations must protect vulnerable communities located closest to the power plants through improved monitoring of local air pollutants and better enforcement. In summary, I support the EPA's plan. Uh, and as a physician specializing in respiratory disease, I believe that if the measures are further strengthened, we will save lives, reduce the burden of lung disease and protect the most vulnerable members of our society. Uh, thank you very much uh, to the panel. Thank you very much for testifying. Are there any questions from our panelists? Thank you very much. The um, our next uh, speaker is uh, Peter Cocapelli. I. Uh, Sorry, it's uh, not letting me start the video. Uh, so I'll just go ahead on uh, audio only. Oh, there we go. Thank you. My name is Peter Cocapelli. I retired from the US EPA in 2014. Today, I represent your average American who can look out their window and see the effects of climate change plainly visible. For the past three years, smoke from wildfires has made my home in Portland, Oregon, the most polluted city in the world for days at a time. As I speak, most of the state of Oregon is already in the first stage of drought. The attribution of these extraordinary events to climate change is not in doubt. Every year since 2014, the climate projections have become more serious and the costs of inaction have risen steadily. I applaud the work the EPA has done on this proposal. I should probably add, I worked on a very early version of this back before I retired. I'm here today to urge my former colleagues to apply the most stringent BSER options in the shortest time possible by the year 2030 or earlier. The year 2030 has taken on a special significance today. Scientists have determined that to keep warming in the range of 1.5 degrees centigrade, we must cut baseline greenhouse gas emissions by 50% by 2030. That's just seven short years from now. Statements from the White House last year referred to the, quote, climate crisis and stated that climate change is a clear and present danger to the United States. This sense of urgency seems to be absent in some aspects of the proposed rule. At this time, there's no time left to err on the side of routine operation or business as usual. We're approaching climate tipping points that in the year I retired back in 2014, we thought would be decades away. Every day brings news of effects that compound or amplify each other. This week, we learned that warming is so rapid in northern latitudes 
that the Arctic Ocean will be nearly ice-free by 2030. Yes, that year again, 2030. All of this is due almost entirely to greenhouse gas emissions from burning fossil fuels. Climate change no longer moves at a global pace. This rule plays an essential role in meeting greenhouse gas emission reduction goals. BSR ER reductions of 90% in the electricity sector must be stringently applied and enforced by 2030 with only de minimis exceptions. Under the proposal, a coal-fired boiler slated for retirement would be able to keep operating with modifications until 2040. This relaxed period of compliance is at odds with any concept of what the White House has called a, quote, clear and present danger. The EPA must shorten the deadline for coal unit retirements. Baseline, uh, uh, base load gas-fired units have until 2035 or even 2038 to reduce emissions in this proposal. The final rule should make 2030 the deadline for meeting the BSCR for both new and existing gas-fired units and apply it to nearly all units, including intermediate load. Flexibility and technology make sense, but with time so short, flexibility and deadlines or stringency will only undermine the goal of making the 50% cut in emissions by 2030. 14 years ago, the EPA issued the greenhouse gas endangerment finding. It has been a long and difficult path to where we are today. Okay, for hanging in there. Thank you for your testimony. And I have been around long enough to remember your contributions from the earlier uh, versions of, of, this, uh, of this proposal. Um, are there any um, questions from the, the other panelists? Um, uh, thank you for the, your testimony. You mentioned a 50% cut by 2030. Could you tell us the baseline here? Uh, <laughs> is this a trick question? <laughs> um, boy, uh, I believe, I thought the baseline was still 2005. Is that what we're still using? Uh, and I, I should have looked that up, but you got me on that. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you. I'd be happy to submit it in, te in written testimony though, if, if you'd like I'll, to clarify that. Yeah, Please good. do, thank, thank you. you. Okay, well done. So our next two speakers are Robert Howarth and Neil Wagoner. Whenever you're ready, Professor. Thank you. My name is Robert Howarth, H-O-W-A-R-T-H. -H. I'm an Earth System Scientist with a PhD from MIT and more than 40 years of post-PhD level experience in research and policy related to human accelerated global change. I've been a tenured faculty member at Cornell since 1985. I've published more than 200 peer-reviewed papers, have been cited in other papers more than 80,000 times. I'm an expert on methane and climate change, as well as on hydrogen. And I currently serve as one of the 22 members of the New York State Climate Action Council, the agency charged by law in New York with developing the implementation plan for our state's progressive climate law. I generally support the draft EPA power plant rules, but I do have several concerns and see several areas that I believe needs some improvement. First, while imposing a deadline for existing coal-fired plants to reduce emissions by 2030 is reasonable, extending this to 2040 for plants that promise to retire by then is not reasonable. The urgency of climate change is simply too great. Note that the latest runs of global climate models indicate that the US and all developed nations must be completely carbon neutral by 2035, completely carbon neutral by 2035, if the world is to meet the COP21 and COP26 climate targets endorsed by President Biden. There's a new paper just out yesterday that, that stresses that. So we need to move faster than we've even been thinking. Second, the same 2030 deadline for existing coal-fired plants should also be applied to both existing and new plants powered by natural gas. Again, it's critical to reduce greenhouse gas emissions as quickly as possible, and there's no reason to delay the deadline for gas-powered plants beyond that required for coal plants. Extending this to 2035 or even to 2038 for plants that are coal-powered with hydrogen is not defensible. I note that while carbon dioxide emissions are less from gas-powered plants than those powered by coal, methane emissions are far greater, and when these methane emissions are included, 
results in total greenhouse gas emissions from gas powered plants that are comparable to or larger than those from coal fired plants. Third, the application of the new rules to only the largest of the natural gas power plants is unwise. Cumulatively, emissions from the greater number of smaller plants is higher than for the largest plants covered by the draft rules. And these smaller, particular peaker plants often operate at lower efficiencies with greater greenhouse gas emissions per unit of electricity produced for both carbon dioxide and even more so for methane. Fourth, it's critical that the power plant rules specify net carbon dioxide capture rates of at least 90% and not simply the gross capture rate takes a substantial amount of energy to power the carbon dioxide capture and the greenhouse gas emissions from this use of energy can be substantial. These additional emissions are often not included in the estimates of overall carbon dioxide capture efficiency as Mark Jacobson and I addressed in a 2021 peer reviewed article that we published. Fifth, the power plant rules should specify that captured carbon dioxide be permanently stored in a financial bond to be required to enforce the permanence of that capture. Finally, I'm highly skeptical that the combustion of hydrogen can contrib contribute to significant greenhouse gas emissions from gas-fired power plants. I note that the EPA documentation providing support of the power plant from the Office of Air and Radiation, dated just a, a week or so ago, in fact provides substantial reasons why this use of hydrogen is problematic. My 2021 paper with Mark Jacobson provides further uh, information on this as well. So I urge the EPA to drop the use of hydrogen as a possible way for the electric sector to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from these power plant rules. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. And I have already submitted an expanded written statement, including references. Thank you. Thank you. And, and thank you for submitting the uh, written comments. And I, I do hope that um, the, the paper that you've referenced with Mark Jacobson is part of those written comments. Yes, that's definitely in there. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions or comments from the um, the panel? Thank you very much for testifying this morning. The next speaker is uh, Neil Wagner. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Neil Wagner. That's N-E-I-L-W-A-G-G-O-N-E-R. I reside in Columbus, Ohio, and I am the Deputy Director for Federal Energy Campaigns for the Sierra Club. I'm pleased to offer my comments today in support of EPA's proposal to regulate carbon emissions from fossil fuel power plants. Over the years, I have testified at many EPA and other administrative hearings, and I always start by talking about my personal history with coal-fired power plants. I grew up with First Energy's Eastlake coal plant in the backdrop of my front yard in primary schools. I went to college in Southeast Ohio with a coal plant in the middle of my campus and major coal plants like the infamous Gavin plant dotted around the surrounding region. Myself and many Ohioans like me understand well the public health impacts of coal plants. Climate impacts, however, historically have been a bit harder for Ohioans like myself to fully engage with. Ohio might be the heart of it all, but we are not a coastal state and we certainly don't have any polar bears wandering around the Cuyahoga or Miami Valleys. But that doesn't mean we're not already dealing with the impacts of climate change. Last summer, tens of thousands of Ohioans in central Ohio, including myself, didn't have power for multiple days in the middle of an extreme heat wave because of grid issues due to downed power lines, a result of a separate extreme weather event. Also last summer, the Power Clean Future Ohio campaign released The Bill is Coming Due, a report that identified 50 unique climate aspects that are climate impacts that Ohio municipalities will have to address across the range of their mandates. A deeper look at just 10 of those impacts estimated that the state of Ohio will need to increase municipal spending between 1.8 billion and 5.9 billion per year by mid-century in order to adapt to the challenges of a worsening climate crisis. And of course, just last week, Ohioans across the state and Americans across the Midwest and East Coast spent days breathing in highly polluted air, the result of wildfires in Quebec and a reminder of what our fellow Americans in the West have been dealing with annually with increasing frequency and impact. We here in Ohio are now very much wrapping our, he our heads, lungs, and wallets around the impacts of climate change. The same is, of course, true for the rest of the country as well. I'm very proud to support EPA's efforts to reduce carbon emissions from power plants, 
The electric sector is the largest stationary source of ga greenhouse gas pollution in the country, and fossil fuel power plants are responsible for one quarter of all U.S. carbon pollution. To confront the climate crisis, we have to go to the source of what's driving it. The Biden administration is listening to the science, trusting experts, and taking necessary action to protect public health and the environment. Now, no rule is a magic bullet, but strong carbon pollution standards for power plants will help deliver meaningful results. These standards, in concert with other critical public health rules EPA is working on and landmark financial investments in clean energy through the Inflation Reduction Act, create a suite of tools to reduce U.S. greenhouse gas emissions, improve public health, and ensure a better future for all Americans. The time for action is now, and through this proposal, as Administrator Regan clearly stated, EPA is delivering on its mission to reduce harmful pollution that threatens people's, uh, people's health and well-being. So thank you for the opportunity to, to speak in support of EPA's action on this matter. And thank you to all the EPA st staff working on this proposal. I yield the remainder of my time. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, do the panelists have any questions for the speaker? No? Okay, thank you very much. Um, we have one more speaker uh, on our list of registered speakers, and that is Soren Simonson. Uh, and I believe we may have some time uh, for the wait list for those of for those uh, people who have signed up on the wait list. Um, so, uh, Soren Simonson, whenever you're ready. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Soren Simonson, S O R E N S I M O N S E N. I'm speaking today on behalf of the Mormon Environmental Stewardship Alliance which is a faith-based community of members of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We work together to improve the health of our environment and of communities and societies through our collective action. Let me share several recent statements by leaders of our faith community. In April 2000, President Russell M. Nelson, current president of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, speaking at a global church conference said, as beneficiaries of the divine creation, what shall we do? We should care for the earth, be wise stewards over it, and preserve it for future generations, and we are to love and care for one another. In 2017, President Dallin H. Oaks, counselor to the president, speaking at a university commencement in Hawaii, said, These are challenging times filled with big worries, wars and rumors of wars, possible epidemics of infectious disease, droughts, floods, and global warming. Seacoast cities are concerned with the rising level of the ocean which will bring ocean tides to their doorsteps or over their thresholds. Global warming is also affecting agriculture and wildlife. In 2018, Elder Stephen E. Snow, a general authority and former church historian, speaking at an environmental symposium at Utah State University said, the earth is vulnerable. <clears throat> Excess consumption sullies God's seas, wanton waste blackens his air. The creation groans under the weight of recklessness and indulgence that neglects both the poor earth and the earth's poor. Climate change is real, and it's our responsibility as stewards to do what we can to limit the damage done to God's creation. In 2018, President Sharon Eubank, leader of the church's women's organization globally and director of Latter-day Saint humanitarian programs, speaking at an environmental forum said, what does being of one heart and one mind have to do with caring for the earth? What is the linkage? Some people will say, isn't there something more important to do? Shouldn't we be caring for the poor versus caring for the earth? And my question is, are they not linked so inextricably that we cannot do one without caring for the other? In October, in October 2020, President Russell M. Ballard, president of the Quorum of Twelve Apostles of the Church, speaking at a global church conference, said, I invite you to pray always. Pray for your family. Pray for the leaders of nations. Pray for the courageous people who are on the front lines in the current battles against social, environmental, political, and biological plagues that impact all people throughout the world, the rich and the poor, the young and the old. Last October, Bishop Gerald Cosse, presiding bishop of church physical facilities and assets globally, speaking at a global church conference, said, the divine gift of the creation does not come without duties and responsibilities. These duties are best described by the concept of stewardship. 
In gospel terms, the word stewardship designates a sacred, spiritual, or temporal responsibility to take care of something that belongs to God, for which we are all accountable. Now, I do not speak for our church or its leaders, but their direction and similar comments made by leaders of Christian, Muslim, Buddhist, Hindu, Jewish, and other faiths, and indigenous communities across the globe, who are all my brothers and sisters, all give clear guidance that all people of this world have a core fundamental responsibility as a human family to care for the earth, to care for our fellow human family, and to care for all living things. Watching the wildfire impacts across Canada and in the Midwest and Eastern states in recent weeks feels very familiar. In the West, we have lived through many summers and uh, of similar conditions. While we have enjoyed a break from the wildfires these past few months, that break from poor air quality has been in the form of extreme precipitation and flooding. And we expect we will be overwhelmed soon by wildfires again this summer and fall. Unfortunately, those who live near power plants never get a break. These are often disadvantaged communities of color and those with historically limited means and political influence. Power plants provide energy services that we consider essential, but their presence and associated pollution are nevertheless devastating to those who live nearby. Mr. Simonson, what, we, need, yes. we need you to wrap up, please. Okay. Yeah. Knowing what we know today and having access to information and resources as global leaders of civil societies, I urge the EPA to, to not make us choose between essential services and living in ways that support our health and well-being and a livable future. We urge you to take action and move forward and expand this EPA rule uh, with the urgency and focus that it deserves. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions for the speaker from our panelists? Okay, thank you very much. So the first speaker from our wait list is Christine Bratton. Is Christine Bratton available? Okay. Okay. Is it working? There you are. I see you and I hear you. Oh, fabulous. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Christine Bratton, C-H-R-I-S-T-I-N-E-B-R-A-T-T-O-N. I'm here to urge the EPA to finalize the strongest carbon standards possible. I am a city slicker who loves the outdoors and is a physical therapist who's lived in New York City for more than 40 years. From 1994 to 2007, I spent my vacation time. Wait, I'm getting a message. Oh, it's okay. Got it. From 1994 to 2007, I spent my vacation time three or four weeks a year providing service and leading service trips in national parks, national forests, wilderness areas, and BLM lands across the West and Southwest. It has been heartbreaking for me to see the environmental changes ripping through areas where I worked. So many wildfires, droughts, and unpredictable drenching rains, all brought about or exacerbated by climate change. These devastating events have only grown more common and more deadly and more unpredictable over the last decade. In 1995, I worked in the Trinity Alps near Redding, California, and admired the heavily snow-covered Mount Shasta on my day hikes. Imagine my horror at the car fire in 2018, which burned over 200,000 acres near Reading. Imagine my further horror in the summer of 2021, when record high temperatures melted all of Mount Shasta's snow and glaciers for the first time on record. In 2000, I worked on trail maintenance in the Siskiyous in Northern California. 20 years later, more huge devastating fires. In 2002, I worked on a different kind of wilderness project. We restored the meanders in a stream in Oregon, a stream whose meanders, whose lost meanders had provided critical habitat for the salmon run. But the stream ran through a golf course and I had to wear a hard hat. This service trip taught me that the wilderness is not a special separate place, but rather a continuum affected by environmental abuses everywhere. Our environment is a beautifully connected web and the costs of climate change are not shared equally. Realizing this, 
started to transform my activism. In addition to direct stewardship of wild areas, I also started to focus on the greater economic and social forces that, present us, that prevent us from addressing climate change head on. I am also with my husband, a longtime bicycle tourist. We loved cycling and camping out West annually from 2000 to 2014. But after having our planning scuttled year after year by wildfires and drought, we decided in 2016 to go lower carbon impact and started to tour the Adirondacks, New England and Nova Scotia on our bikes instead with no airplane travel involved. Riding in these beautiful areas with beautiful clear streams, we felt that we had dodged the climate bullet. Well, there's no dodging and there are no exemptions. As I wrote out this testimony last Thursday, wildfire smoke from Canada was choking New York City, making it the most air polluted city in the world and trapping us all indoors. We cannot escape the changes that fossil fuel burning has wrecked on our environment. No one is immune and the pace of change is clearly accelerating. The timeline is critical and I want you to hear my urgency. I have seen such devastating changes just in my personal experience and just in these past 20 years. We cannot wait another 20 to get it right. The time for dithering is over. Please tighten up limits for CO2 emissions from power plants. One more sentence. I urge this administration to finalize the strongest carbon standards possible by requiring greater reductions from existing gas plants and securing emission reductions from all power plants on a shorter timeline. There really is no time to waste. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for your testimony. Are there, are there other questions or comments from the panelists? Thank you very much for taking the time this morning. Thank um, you so much. Inspiring. So I believe we have time for one more speaker this morning and that uh, from our wait list and that is David Myers. Whenever you're ready. Yes, um, can you hear me? Yes, I see you and I hear you. All right, thank you for the opportunity to comment on the draft power plant emission standards. My name is David Myers, D-A-V-I-D-M-Y-E-R-S. I live in Sedona, Arizona, and I volunteer with Moms Clean Air Force and the Northern Arizona Climate Change Alliance. Thank you for proposing strong standards to mitigate power plant emissions that will assist in combating the more frequent and destructive climate events we are facing. Northern Arizona has had several major fires in the past 15 years. The 2013 Yarnell Hill fire in Prescott, Arizona claimed the lives of 19 firefighters. This spring, wildfires in Quebec and the Canadian Maritimes produced poor air quality and health and safety risks for those areas and for New York and New England, as well as the uh, upper Atlantic coast. Fires in the West have produced smoke and sit in the Western US. During 2021, Northwestern US and Canada experienced record high temperatures in the 120 degree plus range and hundreds of wildfires. The 2020 and 2021 wildfire seasons in California were more brutal than usual. Summer habitats of migratory birds in British Columbia have moved 200 or more miles north of where they used to live, used to be uh, due to rising temperatures. Wildfires burn communities, then leave the areas vulnerable to flooding and erosion. Fire seasons in the West are at least three months longer than they were before 1980. This year, fires occurred in California, New Mexico, and Colorado in the winter and early spring. A recent quote from the Washington Post is that all 10 of the smokiest days since 2006 have occurred since 2020. It actually looks like there's no quote unquote fire season anymore. It's the whole year. These wildfire events are associated with increasing temperatures and drought produced by increasing concentrations of greenhouse gases. Electric generating power plant emissions uh, produce about 25% of US greenhouse gas emissions. These draft EPA standards offer flex flexibility to existing facilities, guiding them away from using coal and converting to methane, and more importantly, to renewable sources. 
based on decades of development of power plant emission reduction technologies. Many electricity generating companies are already using these technologies. Coal as a power plant fuel has declined from 51% share in 2020 to in 2005 to 20% today. And natural gas has increased by 22%. More encouraging is that 22% of electricity generated comes from renewables. These EPA standards will save about $6 billion a year in costs. Although we are making progress toward renewable and less toxic energy production, we are still getting 60% of our energy from fossil fuel burning. How do we get that percentage to zero? The draft standards are important to keep us on the path to renewable energy and away from harmful emissions. Please implement these standards by the spring of 2024 and set timelines to meet the standards by 2030, not 2035. I would like to see more opportunity for community input and inclusion of all power plants in the standards. I have concerns about the harm in allowing carbon capture and storage and hydrogen as alternatives to straight conversion to renewable energy sources. Thank you for your hard work in moving us toward a cleaner, healthier, and safer energy production system. Thank you very much for your testimony this morning. Are there any questions from the speaker, from our panelists? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. So my name is Nick Hudson. I'm the group leader for the Energy Strategies Group in the uh, EPA's Office of Air Quality Planning and Standards. And I have been chairing uh, today's uh, morning session. I wanna thank my fellow panelists and everyone who's offered testimony today and everyone who took time out of their schedules to listen to today's hearing on EPA's proposed greenhouse gas standards and guidelines for fossil fuel fired power plants. As a reminder, you can submit written comments uh, on this proposal through August the 8th, um, and we will now take a recess. The next session will begin at 1.30. Thank you.
Good afternoon, and welcome to the public hearing for EPA's proposed greenhouse gas standards and guidelines for green fossil fuel fired power plants. My name is David Cuzzy. I'm the Deputy Director of the Sector Policies and Programs Division in EPA's Office of Air Quality Planning and Standards in the Office of Air and Radiation. And I will be chairing the session for the virtual public hearing. During today's hearing, we will take comment on EPA's proposed greenhouse gas standards and guidelines for fossil fuel fired power plants. EPA is proposing Clean Air Act emission limits and guidelines for carbon dioxide from fossil fuel fired power plants based on cost effective and available control technologies. The proposals would set limits for new gas fired combustion turbines, existing coal, oil and gas fired steam generating units, and certain existing gas-fired combustion turbines. I'd like to invite our other two panelists, Sarah Benish and Brian Fisher, to introduce themselves. Hello, everyone. My name is Sarah Benish, and I'm a physical scientist with the Office of Air Quality Planning and Standards. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Brian Fisher. I'm an economist in the Office of Atmospheric Protection. We are also joined today by a court reporter who will produce a written transcript of today's hearing. We will add the transcript to the public docket for this proposed rulemaking, and we'll carefully consider your comments as we develop this rule. Before we begin hearing from you, we have a few ground rules and housekeeping items to keep, help to review to help make today's hearing run smoothly. First, EPA is committed to an environment of mutual respect and safety. We want to hear your views on the proposed rule today. However, the agency will not tolerate harassment, discrimination, intimidation, inappropriate language and images, or sustained disruption of the public hearing. EPA expects everyone participating in this hearing, including registered speakers, attendees, and those of us on the panel to conduct themselves in a respectful and civil manner. We will monitor and moderate this virtual event to ensure that common standards of decency are upheld. Please note, by registering for this event, you are agreeing to abide by the ground rules of the virtual hearing. Please remain muted with your camera off until it is your turn to speak. We ask that everyone's displayed Zoom name include their first and last name. This will help our logistics team quickly identify when registered speakers have arrived so that we can quickly add them to the lineup of the speakers. Okay, let's move on to how today's hearing will work. If you have joined us through Zoom, please keep the chat box open. It is at the bottom of your screen. We will share the names of the next two speakers in the chat box. We also may use the chat to communicate directly with you during the hearing. I will call on each speaker when it is their turn. Let me apologize in advance for any mispronunciations. Please make sure that your Zoom screen this name displays your first and last name. This will help our hearing team I quickly identify when registered speakers have arrived so that we quickly add them to the lineup. For assistance, please send a direct chat message to attendee support. When I call on you to speak, please unmute your line. If you are joining us via Zoom, that button is on the lower left of your screen. If you are joining us by phone, you can mute and unmute yourself by pressing star six. Please state your first and last name and spell it for the record. Please speak slowly so that our court reporter can capture your entire testimony. When you are providing testimony, you are welcome to activate your video camera by clicking on the start video icon at the bottom left of your screen. If you are not testifying, please keep your camera off. Each speaker will have four minutes to give comments. A four minute timer will be displayed on the screen to help you keep track of your time. The timer will start when you state your name. When your four minutes are up, it is time to stop. 
If you are testifying by phone, the timekeeper will alert you when you have one minute remaining. To be fair to everyone, and we have a very full agenda today, we are going to strictly enforce the four minute limit. If you have additional items that you would like to share, such as slide presentations or videos, you may submit them to the docket for the proposal through August 8th. We encourage you to also submit a written copy of the testimony you provide today. We will post information on how to submit written comments in the chat box throughout the hearing. We are here to listen to you today. However, panel members may ask questions to clarify your comments. When you are finished speaking, please remain on the line until I can confirm that there are no further clarifying questions from our panel. Once we are done, please remute your line and turn off your camera. I will then call the next speaker and so on. Finally, today's hearing consists of three sessions. We just finished, completed the morning, we had this afternoon and evening. If there are no additional speakers, we may close a session 15 minutes after the last registered speaker has testified. We also may take short breaks as needed. Thank you again for taking the time today to share your comments on EPA's proposal. Let's get started. Our first two speakers are Shanae Clay and Charles Harper. We'll begin with Shanae. Good afternoon. My name is Shanae Clay and it's spelled S-H-A-N-A. I'm sorry, let me start my video. It's spelled S-H-A-N-A-E, last name C-L-A-Y. I'm a small business owner in Indianapolis, Indiana, and I'm here today to urge the EPA to finalize the strongest carbon standards possible by improving on your proposal to require greater reductions from existing gas plants and to secure the emission reductions from all fossil fuel power plants on a faster timeline. Here in Indiana, I'm not often forced to think about carbon emissions or their impact on our climate. I've caught myself thinking that's a coastal problem, that I'm safe here from California's wildfires or hurricanes on the East Coast, but that's not true. The havoc that carbon pollution wrecks on our environment does not respect state borders and its effects can travel far from the original source of its disasters. We've seen this recently with smoke spreading from the wildfires in Canada. These fires are not burning in our country, but people here in the US are affected and have significantly reduced air quality in their neighborhoods and their loved ones' homes. We can expect these disasters caused by extreme weather to only worsen and become more frequent if we fail to address our carbon emissions. Here in the US, the power sector is the second largest source of carbon dioxide pollution, accounting for nearly a third of our nation's total. We need you to set a strong carbon standard to address the dire threat that we face from climate change and to protect the public and the environment. And this is why I'm asking the EPA to finalize the strongest carbon standards possible by improving on the proposal to require greater reductions from existing gas plants and to secure emission reductions from all fossil power plants on a faster timeline. Thank you so much for your time. And thank you for your testimony. Are there any clarifying questions from the panel? Thank you again, Ms. Ms. Clay, for sharing your testimony today. Our next speaker is Charles Harper. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today and for proposing these rules to protect Americans from the harmful effects of climate pollution from power plants. My name is Charles Harper, C-H-A-R-L-E-S-H-A-R-P-E-R. I'm a power systems engineer and climate policy analyst at Evergreen Action, an environmental nonprofit. The climate crisis is an urgent threat to the health and welfare of all Americans. Power plants produce one quarter of all U.S. carbon dioxide pollution. This major source of pollution must be reduced. EPA's proposed standards are a good starting point for addressing climate change, but 
there are several important areas where the rules must be strengthened to fully protect Americans' health and welfare as EPA is required under the law. Three areas require special attention. First, increasing the number of gas plants covered by the rule. Second, moving up compliance timelines so that power plants must reduce their emissions this decade. And third, expediting EPA's process so that a final rule is released by March 2024. First, EPA must expand the scope of the rule for existing gas plants to fully address this major source of pollution. As proposed, less than 10% of existing gas power plants would be required to limit their emissions, or about 23% of gas generation. Um, that is unacceptable and a dereliction of EPA's duty under the Clean Air Act to protect Americans from deadly climate pollution. EPA should expand the rule to cover as many gas plants as possible, down to at least 100 megawatts per unit. Second, EPA must accelerate all compliance timelines from 2035, when that is the case, to at least 2030, so that power plants begin to reduce their emissions this decade. Technologies to reduce climate pollution are available now, and climate science demands that we have U.S. climate pollution by 2030. Waiting until 2035 for any requirements to begin would violate the calls of climate science and violate EPA's mandate under the law to protect Americans' health and welfare. The ability for some coal plants to stay online until 2039, largely without reducing their emissions, is also unacceptable. This retirement loophole should be eliminated or moved up to at least 2030. Finally, we have waited for far too long for polluting power plants to clean up their act. EPA should act with urgency to finalize a rule before March 2024. Climate action cannot wait. I'm calling in today from Washington, D.C., where last week we saw the worst air quality in the world, largely driven by um, extraordinary climate-driven wildfires in Canada. Um, I'm from Dallas, Texas, originally, where we're seeing um, terrible heat waves every summer and droughts and likely to see wildfires of our own in the coming decades. Uh, climate change affects us all, no matter where we are, and EPA has a responsibility to uh, protect the American people from its harmful effects using these modern technologies that are available today to reduce emissions at very low cost. In conclusion, I would like to thank EPA for its work to address deadly and harmful pollution from power plants. These rules would create massive climate and public health benefits and are long overdue. I urge the agency to finalize the strongest rules possible. Thank you so much. And thank you for your testimony. Are there any questions, clarifying questions from the panel? No questions. Thank you. Thank you again today for taking the time to provide your testimony. Our next two speakers are Julie Kimmel and Lori Anderson. And we'll begin with Julie Kimmel. Hello. My name is Julie Kimmel, J U L I E K I M M E L. I am the manager of member cultivation for Mons Clean Air Force, and I live in Reston, Virginia with my husband and daughter. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I support EPA's proposal to limit carbon pollution from fossil fuel power plants and ask that EPA finalize the strongest possible standards as quickly as possible. EPA must strengthen community input and safeguards in the final version of this rule. Anyone who has talked to me in the last two to three weeks knows that my daughter is on summer swim team and I am reliving my own childhood summers through her. Not only is she swimming in the same community summer league I did, but her practices are in the same pool where I practiced when I was eight years old. The nostalgia is real. And I'm so excited to share this experience from my own childhood with her. But last Tuesday night, I was reminded how much times have changed in the 30 plus years since my first summer swim season. We arrived at the pool and immediately noticed the haze in the air. On the volleyball court next to the pool had kicked up a bunch of sand, but we quickly realized it was in fact smoke from the Canadian wildfires burning hundreds of miles away. I imagine you've heard and will hear a bunch of stories like this one over the course of this hearing. The wildfire smoke that traveled down the East Coast last week was alarming and eerie. I couldn't believe the AQI numbers I was seeing on my weather app. Thankfully, my daughter's school kept kids inside for recess and swim was more or less canceled Wednesday and Thursday. We hunkered down. If hundreds of wildfires burning out of control in Canada and sending back thick smoke hundreds of miles away isn't evidence of climate change, I don't know what is. At some point in the haze of last week, my daughter told me she wants to make and be in movies when she grows up. She wants to be an actor, director, producer. 
awesome. I'm here for it. But also, does that mean a life dodging wildfires in the state with much of the worst air pollution in the country? As a parent concerned about climate change, I often struggle talking to my daughter about her future. I want to tell her the sky's the limit, but that's simply not true. The earth is changing, climate disasters are much more frequent, and my daughter very well won't have all the options I had when I entered adulthood two decades ago. So that's why I'm here asking for the strongest possible standards to limit carbon pollution from fossil fuel power plants. These power plants are responsible for almost a quarter of the climate pollution generated by the US. If we can cut that percentage down, we should do it. And we should do it now because our children deserve as comfortable a life and as many opportunities for success as we can give them. Thank you. And thank you for your testimony. Are there any questions from the panel? No questions, thank you. Thank you for taking the time for your day to, to provide your testimony. Our next speaker is Lori Anderson. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. My name is Lori Anderson. It's L-A-U-R-I-E-A-N-D-E-R-S-O-N. And I am a call. Ms. Anderson, we're actually getting a lot of feedback. Maybe try to with mom's clean air force. Hopefully this is better. That is better. Um, okay, good. I strongly support EPA's proposal to limit carbon emissions from fossil fuel power plants and ask that EPA finalize these standards as quickly as possible to help protect our families. Fossil fuel power plants are responsible for about 25% of the climate pollution generated in the U.S., and along with this pollution, millions of tons of other air pollutants, including soot and ozone forming nitrogen oxides are also released into our air. I live in the Denver Metro North Front Range ozone non-attainment zone, which has been downgraded to severe non-attainment. We continue to face high ozone days, days where our air is unhealthy to breathe all summer long. Ozone causes health impacts such as throat irritation, difficulty breathing, and increased asthma attacks. Colorado must reduce ozone precursors, and therefore our state has set lofty goals to reduce pollution from all sources and is working on early closure of all coal-fired power plants. However, our state also must deal with background ozone, which comes from states including California, Utah, and Wyoming, as indicated by EPA's national air pattern modeling. Therefore, the EPA proposed limits on carbon emissions are crucial for the health of families in Colorado to reduce interstate transport of pollution, which the good neighbor rule also seeks to address. Greenhouse gas emissions are driving climate change, and we need to reduce climate pollution from all sources, including power plants, in order to have a stable climate and protect the health of our families. Here in Colorado, climate change is fueling wildfires, which have seriously impacted our community's health in recent years. 2020 was the second hottest season year on record, and the future will likely be even hotter. Across the nation, we are also seeing increasingly powerful hurricanes, more destructive droughts, and severe flooding. We know far too well that addressing the climate crisis can't wait. Climate change also worsens air quality. Heat waves and wildfires exacerbated by climate change worsen air pollution. The ground level ozone pollution, which is so concerning for Colorado, also forms more easily in hotter temperatures and stagnant air, and wildfire smoke also contributes to particle pollution. Smog and particle pollution can have serious health effects, including asthma attacks, heart attacks, and even early death. By addressing climate change, the rule will help address air pollution indirectly as well. As a mom of five, I am concerned that our future generations, including our own children, will be significantly more impacted by climate change-fueled extreme weather events in their lifetime than we are today. Once again, I support the carbon rule and I'm calling on the EPA to finalize the strongest possible standards to help protect our families from harmful air pollution that contributes to climate change and impacts health. EPA must strengthen community input and safeguards in the final version of this rule. Thank you for the incredible amount of work that has been done to date and this opportunity to testify. Thank you. And thank you for your testimony. Are there any clarifying questions from the panel? No questions, thank you. No questions, thanks. Well, thank you again for taking the time from your day, Ms. Anderson. Our next two speakers are Flora Cardoni and Irene Berga. We'll begin with Flora Cardoni. Hi, everyone. 
My name is Flora Cardoni, F-L-O-R-A-C-A-R-D-O-N-I, and I'm the field director with Penn Environment, the statewide citizen-based environmental advocacy nonprofit, and I'm based in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify today, both for myself and on behalf of thousands of Penn Environment citizen members who are clamoring for real action to tackle the climate crisis and protect our health. In order to do both of those things, it is essential that we rein in harmful carbon pollution from the power sector. Climate change is the most urgent environmental challenge of our time, and Pennsylvanians are regularly feeling the effects of our warming climate, which is causing scorching heat waves, destructive storms, flooding, and drought. And sadly, last week, we all saw the climate crisis at our doorstep with much of the state and most of the East Coast shrouded in smoke and experiencing dangerous air quality days due to the wildfires in Canada. Unfortunately, Pennsylvania is a big part of that problem. The Keystone State is the fourth largest global warming polluting state in the nation, and our power sector in Pennsylvania is the largest source of climate pollution. Coal and gas-fired power plants across the Commonwealth and country are fueling the climate crisis, polluting our air, making people sick, and threatening our communities. And that's why we're heartened to see EPA's new proposal to tackle carbon pollution from this heavily polluting sector. Placing new stricter limits on carbon pollution from power plants is one of the best ways that the Biden administration and EPA can help tackle climate change and protect our health. We believe EPA's proposal is a critical step forward, but to really meet the moment and tackle the climate crisis with the urgency and scale it requires, it is crucial for EPA to strengthen this proposal even further and close loopholes that will lead to more climate pollution and make it harder to tackle the climate crisis. Specifically, Penn Environment encourages EPA to achieve greater pollution reductions by requiring more power plants to be covered by this rule. It's critical that EPA require that all power plants that burn fossil fuels are covered in the final rule, and in particular, the smaller and intermittent gas plants that right now are exempted under the proposal. And second, Penn Environment recommends including a faster timeline for implementation in order to move more quickly to reduce the harmful pollution from these facilities and really tackle climate change. We need the strongest possible carbon rule to really tackle the climate crisis, protect our health, and build a safer and stronger commonwealth. And I'm confident that EPA will rise to the occasion to do so. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify today. And thank you for your testimony. Are there any questions from the panel? Thank you again for taking the time for your day to provide your testimony. Thank you. Our next speaker is Irene Berga. Hi, thank you and thanks for having me. Um, I go by my Spanish pronunciation, Irene Berga. Um, it's spelled I-R-E-N-E, -E, last name B-U-R-G-A. Um, I'm the Climate Justice and Cleaner Program Director at Green Latinos. Green Latinos is an active comunidad of Latino leaders emboldened by the power and wisdom of our culture and driven to secure our environmental liberation. I'm here today representing hundreds of Latinos across the country that believe that if these EPA rules to limit the devastating impact of power plant pollution um, were strengthened in some key ways, um, then we we would support them um, in a, a following iteration. P power plants are the second largest source of greenhouse gas emissions, and they put millions of Latines in harm's way. 15% of all Latines in the United States live within 10 miles of a coal-fired power plant. Latino communities living near power plants uh, bear an increased exposure to harmful pollutants, including particulate matter, sulfur dioxide, and nitrogen oxide. These pollutants put us at a higher risk of a variety of different diseases. Um, and Latinos are twice as likely to go to the emergency room for asthma than um, white U.S. residents. Um, also, as far as the climate side and the carbon pollution kind of accelerating climate crisis, um, Latinos are disproportionately exposed to about 63% uh, um, more particulate matter pollution um, and 43% more likely to live in places that will see more loss of life, health, and employment um, from the effects of climate change. 
So while the EPA's proposals um, are an important step forward, the administration must ensure community protections and prioritize community input. As you all assess nascent, potentially harmful technologies such as carbon capture and sequestration or CCS and hydrogen blending, um, we urge the EPA to include the following key protections to diminish the risk of unproven and potentially harmful technologies like CCS. First, for power plant um, for power plants using CCS, the EPA must require additional rigorous monitoring and verification for CO2 from the point of capture to point of permanent sequestration. The, P the EPA must account for any public health impacts during site assessments associated with the addition of CCS equipment and operations on site. The EPA must work collaboratively across the administration with FIMSA, DOE, and other agencies on improving safeguards to protect communities from harms associated with carbon removal technologies, including pipelines and underground storage facilities. For projects using CCS, the EPA must work with relevant agencies to ensure the safest path possible path forward to diminish the possibility of seismic activity caused by underground storage and transport of CO2 occurring in and around the project site. And then at all stages, the EPA must meaningfully engage with frontline communities, including on individual projects with proposed CCS or any other purported carbon reducing technology. Additionally, we urge the EPA to expand the number of power plants covered, including natural gas units as small as 100 megawatts and those operating 40% of the time. In cases of CCS projects, none of the carbon sequestered should be used for enhanced oil recovery, which would defeat the purpose of removing the carbon in the first place by bringing additional carbon pollution into the atmosphere. Additionally, the EPA should prioritize closure of power plant facilities as the first option while focusing on energy transition to non-polluting renewable energy. Although no one, no one set of standards from the EPA um, can undo the decades of systemic racism at the bottom of the troubling health disparities of our communities, the current EPA proposal needs significant amendments to be strengthened in a matter that centers justice first. So I encourage you all to also incorporate the IRA, clean energy incentives, and really focus on um, a clean energy transition. And I'll wrap it there. Um, I think there's a lot of potential with this role, but I do think there's a lot of um, amendments that need to happen. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bergen. And you mentioned um, several uh, pieces about uh, Latinos' ex exposure. It, would you be providing those to the record as well, for the documentation? I sure can. That would be great. Are there any other questions from the panel? All right. Thank you again for taking the time for, to provide your testimony. Our next two speakers are Brooke Petrie and Kathy Westman. We'll begin with Ms. Petrie. Hi, thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Brooke Petrie, B-R-O-O-K-E-P-E-T-R-Y. I'm a Pennsylvania State Coordinator for Moms Clean Air Force, living with my family in Philadelphia. I strongly support EPA's proposal to limit carbon emissions from fossil fuel power plants and ask that EPA finalize these standards as quickly as possible. Power plants are responsible for roughly a quarter of climate pollution in the U.S., and Pennsylvania is the third highest carbon polluter from power plants in the country. Across the state, the impacts of climate change have already arrived. In Philadelphia, this was dangerously apparent last week, as our city was choked with toxic smoke from Canadian wildfires, at one point Wednesday evening, registering the worst AQI of any major city on planet Earth. No strangers to climate impacts, we are also plagued each summer by the urban heat island effect, where dense concentrations of buildings and pavement absorb and retain heat and amplify heat-related health impacts like heat exhaustion. This effect is especially pronounced in neighborhoods that have faced generational harms and disinvestment from racist policies like redlining and already endure disproportionate exposure to pollution. During warmer months, we see more frequent air quality warnings as heat mixes with pollutants to create ground level ozone, which is unsafe to breathe. Hotter temperatures make it harder for children to learn in schools. The first week of June, over 90 schools, including the one that my child attends, had to dismiss early due to dangerous heat. 
Some populations are particularly vulnerable to the health impacts of pollution and the climate crisis. As a person with asthma and as the parent of a child with asthma, my family experiences heightened impacts of, the, of climate change on a daily basis, as do many of our neighbors and our community members. Children, the elderly, low wealth communities, people who are pregnant and folks with asthma are on the front lines of this crisis. The childhood asthma rate in my city is a staggering 21%. On extremely hot days and on days with poor air quality, folks with asthma may have to weigh the very real danger of an asthma attack against the need to walk to the store for groceries. Under the proposed rule, states must develop and submit a plan to meet the federal requirements. And REGI, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, can be that plan for Pennsylvania, as EPA has signaled its openness to allowing existing mechanisms like REGI to serve as a state's pathway for complying with the standards. Using REGI to meet Pennsylvania's federal obligations is a quicker path to reducing health harming pollution and could also support a just transition for workers and communities and save us very valuable time and resources that would be spent developing a new plan from scratch. While we urge EPA to move swiftly on this rule, we want to see mechanisms that strengthen community input and safeguard and safeguards in the final version of this rule, which is why I'm calling on EPA to finalize the strongest possible standards to help protect our families from harmful air pollution that contributes to climate change and impacts health. Thank you for the opportunity to testify and for your work to ensure a livable climate for future generations. Thanks so much. Thank you for your testimony. Are there any, are there any questions from the panel? No questions, thank you for your testimony. Thank you again for taking the time for your day to provide this testimony. Our next speaker is Kathy Westman. Uh, you're on mute. You're on mute still, Ms. Westman. I'll try again. <laughs> we can hear you now. Thank you. My name is Kathy Westman from Gibsonia, Pennsylvania. I appreciate the EPA giving me the opportunity to speak today. Um, my name is K-A-T-H-I-E, Westman, W-E-S-T-M-A-N. I'm a concerned citizen, grandmother of three children, person of faith, and a registered nurse who through my many years of living in Allegheny County here in Pennsylvania, has seen the negative health and environmental effects of the fossil fuel industry personally and professionally, and even had the loss of a 10 year old boy in my life from a fatal asthma attack. In retirement, I have worked to educate the public legislators and anyone who will listen. My favorite quote is, when we know better, we must do better. I appreciate the EPA responding to the ongoing and expanded evidence that power plants emissions of carbon pollution must be reduced. One third of our CO2 comes from power plants. Every ton of carbon pollution we reduce in the near future will help reduce the impacts that we have on the plants, the people living around them, and the planet. And we must do so as fast as possible. I ask you to adjust the time timelines and get reductions sooner and finalize by early next year. Specifically, I call attention to the timelines to be moved up and strengthened for all gas plants. For existing plants, please expand the number of plants under the new rules. And for continuing coal plants, that standard must be strengthened in all categories. We must crack down on this dirty industry to protect our health and climate. This really matters. All reductions must be reduced, but more emission reductions from the gas plants must be a priority 
They will make a huge difference. We all need these standards in place and must quickly accelerate the timelines. Again, they must be finalized by early 2024. Again, I ask as a concerned citizen, grandmother of three children, person of faith and an RN, enthusiastic about the goals of strict standards and quick passage. I, again, thank the EPA for listening to my concerns about health and the environment and the EPA's commitment for needed improvements. Thank you. Thank you for providing your testimony today. Are there any questions from the panel? No questions. Thanks for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Our next two speakers are Susan Edwards and Daniela Schulman. And we'll begin with Susan Edwards. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. I can't see my picture, but can you see it? Uh, your video is not on that I can see. I am kind of... And now we can see you. Okay, great. And hear you. Thank you. My name is Susan Edwards, S-U-S-A-N. E D W A R D S. I live in Swarthmore, Pennsylvania. I am a 76 year old grandmother of a beloved two year old girl. I have been a Sierra Club volunteer since viewing Al Gore's film, An Inconvenient Truth, in about 2010. I also volunteer with several other environmental and environmental justice groups. It so happens that I am the daughter of a career employee of Philadelphia Electric Company's gas division. And I had an uncle who was searching for, for oil reserves in Latin America in the 1940s and 1950s. So I am a product of what turned out to be a planet damaging industry. Fossil fuel companies we now know have been aware of the warming effects of their products for decades, but did not take serious or sufficient action to protect us all, flora and fauna alike, including humans. We are now seeing the results of their inaction. Most, result, most recently with the smoke from Canadian wildfires that have been exacerbated by global warming. These companies have instead polluted the earth for over a century without paying the price of the damage they've caused and hidden. In fact, they have received decades of subsidies despite making huge profits and have been stalling on cleaning up their act. We all now face a looming climate catastrophe. I applaud the EPA for taking steps to make them pay their fair share Undoubtedly, they will protest, but I hope you won't allow them to win the day. My husband and I are fortunate to be able to afford solar panels, an electric car, which we charge with those solar electrons, and an electric stove and water heater. But just a few miles away in the environmental, in the environmental justice city of Chester, Pennsylvania, children are exposed to many sources of pollution that lead them to have asthma rates eight times the national average. And on a global level, the nations that have contributed the, le contributed the least to a warming world are among the hardest hit. There is a genuine concern about what will happen to the employees who, like my father and uncle did, work in fossil fuel business. But it has been shown that there are actually far more jobs emerging in the renewable energy sector than in dirty fuels. We as a society need to be sure those workers are enabled to transition with our support to the new economy. I applaud EPA's proposed pollution limits and I support them as a needed step. However, the current proposal doesn't cover some gas fired power plants. I urge the EPA to strengthen the rule by closing these loopholes and ensuring that the rule covers all power plants that burn fossil fuels. My main concern is that I want to improve the chances of my little granddaughter, that my little granddaughter will have a livable future along with all the other children and grandchildren around the world. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you for providing your testimony today. Are there any questions from the panel? No questions, thank you. Thank you, thank you again for taking part, part time from your day to provide your testimony. Our next speaker is Daniela Schulman. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify and for proposing these standards to limit the harmful climate pollution from power plants. My first name is Daniela, D-A-N-I-E-L-A. -E My last name is Schulman, S-C-H-U-L-M-A-N. 
and I am a lab manager at the University of California, Santa Barbara, where I research and advocate for policies necessary to decarbonize the U.S. energy sector by 2035, ramp down fossil fuels, and adapt to climate change. The climate crisis poses a dire public health threat to America. To avoid the worst impacts of climate change, the science is clear. We must cut carbon pollution in half this decade. This includes cleaning up power plants, which emit 25% of US carbon pollution. EPA's proposed standards are a great step in the right direction, but there are three specific areas where the rules must be strengthened to fully protect Americans' health and welfare as EPA is required under the Clean Air Act. First, EPA should increase the number of gas plants covered by the rule. As proposed, less than 10% of existing gas plants would be required to limit emissions. EPA should lower the capacity limit from 300 megawatts to at least 100 megawatts to cover as many gas plants as possible. Second, EPA should accelerate compliance timelines so that power plants reduce emissions this decade. Specifically, EPA should accelerate all compliance timelines to at least 2030 so existing gas plants should be fully compliant by 2030. New gas plants should immediately be required to reduce emissions by 90%, and coal plants should not be allowed to operate through 2040 while co-firing methane gas. Third, and last, EPA should move quickly to finalize a rule before March of 2024. My dedication to advancing effective climate and energy policy stems from my roots. I grew up in Seattle, Washington, where I developed a deep love for coastal communities and the ecosystems that we depend on. I also grew up Jewish, which taught me to pursue justice, to love the stranger, and to heal the world. In Santa Barbara County, where I live now, residents like myself and others are at risk from sea level rise, drought, wildfire, and mudslides. Natural disasters exacerbated by the climate crisis. Climate action cannot wait. The power plant rules being considered today are long overdue and have the potential to create tremendous climate and health benefits for Americans. I'd like to thank EPA for its work to address carbon pollution and urge the agency to swiftly finalize the strongest rules possible. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions from the panel? No questions. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you again for taking the time for your day to provide your testimony. Our next two speakers are Hillary Shanker and Jessica Mormon. And we'll begin with Hillary Shanker. Hi. Good afternoon. <laughs> Um, thank you for hearing my testimony. Uh, my name is Hilary Shanker, H-I-L-A-R-Y-S-C-H-E-N-K-E-R. -E um, I'm a small business owner living in Pittsburgh. Um, I'm also the mother of twin nine-year-old daughters. Um, I'm testifying today in strong support of the new carbon pollution standards for fossil fuel power plants and I would like the limits to go even further. Um, as most people have mentioned, global warming is an existential threat, and we're already feeling climate impacts here in Pennsylvania. My daughters had no snow days this school year. Instead, they had multiple heat days um, where their school was closed because of the extreme heat. With more rainfall, we also have more landslides a neighbor around the corner from us nearly lost their home to a landslide that appeared in their last in their backyard. Um, ticks are another threat from climate change since they now survive the warmer winters and multiple friends and members of my family have experienced complications from Lyme disease from ticks. Finally, excessive amounts of rain now flood our basement and cause mold and living in a 110 year old house full of lead paint uh, these issues are compounding to our health. So climate change is here. It's already threatening our way of life and our health, and we need to limit our carbon emissions yesterday. 
My daughters are also twins and they were born prematurely. So they're at greater risk of respiratory infections. Um, unfortunately in Pittsburgh, we have some of the worst air quality in the country. Pittsburgh is the 14th worst city in the country for year round particle pollution and carbon emissions from uh, coal and gas fired power plants are the largest source of climate pollution in Pennsylvania. More than 1.7 million Pennsylvanians, including my daughters and I live in counties receiving an F grade from the American Lung Association. Often my daughters walk to the bus stop in air that smells bad. And this past week, as multiple people have mentioned, uh, smoke from wildfires in Canada on top of our already poor air pollution levels uh, pushed air into unhealthy ranges for days on end. Uh, we closed the windows, uh, canceled outdoor activities, but uh, we basically grew sicker and more exhausted until the winds finally changed. I think these problems are only a preview of worse impacts to come unless the EPA acts now to limit carbon emissions. So while I am grateful and in strong support of this proposal, I would like it to go even further. I hope the EPA will close loopholes and expand the rule to cover all power plants that burn fossil fuels. And as some others have also said, I hope the EPA will accelerate the timeline. Um, we're told that in 2030 alone, these proposed standards would prevent 1300 premature deaths. Um, so how many people will we let die before 2030? The IPCC also tells us that global emissions need to peak by 2025 if we're going to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, uh, and that's two years from now. So I do what I can. I try to reduce my own impact, um, but this problem is so much bigger than what any one of us can do, obviously. Um, I thank you for this opportunity to testify at this hearing. And I hope the EPA will pass these new carbon pollution standards and go even further to protect us and our children's health. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Are there any questions from the panel? Thanks. Thank you again. Our next speaker is Jessica Mormon. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is the Reverend Dr. Jessica Mormon, J-E-S-S-I-C-A-M-O-E-R-M-A-N. I serve as the Vice President for Science and Policy at the Evangelical Environmental Network. I am a climate scientist by training, a local church pastor, but most importantly, I'm the mother of two energetic boys. Before joining the Evangelical Environmental Network to advance the vision of a safe climate and pollution-free world for all God's children and creation, I spent over 15 years, including at the Smithsonian Natural History Museum and the Department of Energy, as a climate scientist studying Earth's past climate history to determine if today's climate change is unprecedented. The answer that I found, together with thousands of my research colleagues across the country and the world, is unequivocally yes. Climate change today is unlike anything we have experienced in Earth's history. And I'm here to tell you, though, that that is good news. It's good news because it means that instead of being at the mercy of a natural cycle, we have the power to stop it. As a mother who wants a bright and healthy future for my children, and as a person who's lost a family home, to an uncontrolled wildfire under climate-fueled extreme and exceptional drought conditions, I want to thank you today at the EPA for doing something about it. I became a climate scientist because of my faith, because I wanted to serve God by helping others. Climate change affects us all, but unfairly, it is the most vulnerable, the very people who Jesus calls us as Christians to give special care who are hit first and worst by climate change and fossil fuel pollution. That includes our children, both born and unborn, pregnant people, people without housing, our elders, outdoor workers, and people of color. Medical research shows that children are among the most at risk for climate harms like extreme heat and wildfire smoke, as well as life-threatening conditions from fossil fuel pollution. Indeed, fossil fuel pollution is a leading cause of an environmental threat to children's health. 
a multitude of studies link living near fossil fuel production and power generation to birth defects, lifelong asthma, lower birth weight, and stillbirth. As an evangelical pastor, I take seriously what the Bible says in Proverbs 13, 22, that it is our duty to leave a good inheritance to future generations. Birth defects, breathing problems, and an unsafe climate are no inheritance to leave to our children. This makes finalizing the strongest possible carbon pollution rule as quickly as possible more important than ever. Cutting carbon emissions from power plants is an incredible opportunity to advance health, a safe climate, family sustaining, clean jobs, and to deploy incredible new innovations. The proposed standard is a critically important step forward. But to truly defend the health and safety of all God's children, I urge the EPA to strengthen the rules specifically by requiring more plants to achieve greater cuts to carbon pollution on the fastest possible timeline, create a process for rigorous monitoring, verification, enforcement, and engagement with communities to further advance community protection and input, and for or facilities that install carbon capture and sequestration technologies, that they be rigorously monitored, held to the highest safety and health standards, and not harm nearby communities at the fence line or along pipelines. Thank you for taking carbon pollution seriously. I urge you to finalize the strongest possible safeguard no later than early 2024. The health and future of my children and every child depends on it. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Reverend Dr. Mormon. Are there any questions from the panel? No questions, thank you. Thank you again for taking the time today to provide this testimony. Our next two speakers are Amir Desfouli and Hazel Chandler. Good morning. Good morning, good afternoon. My name is Amir Desfouli. Uh, in the five years I've been at the Sierra Club, there's been constant change, much of which we have initiated. We have worked hard to secure leaks from traditional power plants in Arizona, which produce carbon dioxide, nitrogen oxide, NOx, sulfur dioxide, SO2, and methane that may not be properly deployed. Today in Arizona, coal-fired power plants have been nearly obsolete. Uh, meaningful engagement at the state and federal level has set out to offer effective rate fares, something they simply could not get any other way, and guide existing sources of pollution, such as carbon capture, utilization, and sequestration. However, CO2, NOx, SO2 and methane will continue to expose the ozone without major amendments to the Clean Air Act or clear reform in EPA's proposal to include a clear way to calculate different amounts of emission reductions, how to compare them, and what conclusions to draw from those differences. The average rate payer reveals that the impact of the cost of their energy bill affects the way that they interact with their local utility. So how can we boost their confidence? As this new rule will likely be met by litigation progress through the district court, costs from consumers can rise, reflecting negative sentiment around the possibility for the plan to reduce CO2, NOx, SO2, and methane from coal and gas fired power plants. It seems to be that the scale complexity and disruption of the journey moves from theory to reality. The impact of CO2, NOx, and SO2 and methane will continue to affect energy and climate change in each state. Building and maintaining sustainable plants throughout the trip transition to a lower emission feature is important in determining each market's ability to achieve consumer demand. That with continued collaboration with governmental agencies and governmental branches of government can promote sustainable legislation. Traditional power plants leak potent greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. The new EPA proposal has yet to strengthen annual capacity factors to prevent, identify, and repair emissions of carbon. 
According to Professor Jody Friedman of Harvard Law School, methane contributes to about half the emissions responsible for climate change. Methane has also been known to last longer in the atmosphere than previously known. And methane is the principal active pollutant in natural gas, which releases a lot of methane that is yet to be captured. CO2, NOx, SO2, and methane are a big deal, and the court has yet to adjudicate the matter. Moreover, the, C the Clean Air Act does not permit EPA to account for clear cost standards, and with the new proposed rule, EPA has yet to pass a comprehensive climate bill that limits rate payer costs for energy that does not meet the growing expectation in the near term. And they have yet to see how current regulation has created value for them. Um, climate proponents have tried to get a big plan to reduce carbon from the utility sector through direct communication. EPA has affected the Clean Air Act with this new rule, giving rate payers the ability to engage with their local utilities and EPA. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time to provide your testimony. Are there any questions from the panel? Uh, uh, Mr. Disfully, will you be able to provide a written uh, a written copy of your testimony to the record? Yes, I can. Uh, I would really appreciate that. Thank you. Our next uh, speaker is Hazel Chandler. Hi, I'm Hazel Chandler, um, H-A-Z-E-L, H-A-Z-E-L-C-H-A-N-D-L-E-R. And I welcome the opportunity to testify. Um, I represent uh, Moms Clean Air Force in Arizona as the Arizona coordinator. And we represent nationwide 1.5 million moms and 26,000 in Arizona alone. I ask you, what do we value? What do we want our personal collective legacy to be? Do we want to be remembered as the generation that destroyed life on earth? The last generation to be able to enjoy beauty, abundance that the nature has to offer? That is the magnitude of the decisions that you all are making today. The clock is ticking everywhere we look, we see the impacts of the previous decisions that have allowed atmospheric carbon dioxide to reach levels of 424 parts per million. These levels are higher than we've seen in millions of years. Humans are running a massive experiment on the earth climate systems via burning carbon and the results are not turning out great. This is a quote directly from Jason Furtado of uh, University of Arizona, Oklahoma um, a meteorologist professor. What will life look like for our children and our grandchildren? Will humanity survive? What about plants and animals, insects and amphibians? We're already experiencing a mass uh, extinction of our biodiversity. I'm a mom, a grandma, and a great grandma, and I'm joined with millions across the globe pleading with you to make the right decision. The regulations represent an opportunity to cut 25% of the total greenhouse gases going in the atmosphere every single year. While we must approach the existential threat by cutting greenhouse gas emissions from all sources and find ways to sequester carbon already in the atmosphere, enacting the strongest regulations possible to limit greenhouse gas emissions from power plants is a huge step forward. Enacting strong car, truck, petrochemical energy standards and agricultural changes are critical as well. But the this decision alone is a huge down payment on cutting the levels of carbon going into the atmosphere that is critical for preserving life on Earth. Nature has a way of restoring balance. The question is, what will the future for our grandchildren look like? Will we survive? How many more climate refugees will we see? 
how will the extreme weather uh, uh, affect our ability to uh, grow food? Today, I ask you, what do we value? Do we value life or money? Please make the only decision that you can make to, to value life and pass these regulations without delay. We are calling on the EPA to finalize the strongest possible standards to protect our families from harmful air pollution that contribute to climate change and health impacts. We ask the EPA to strengthen community input and safeguards in the final version of this rule. But remember, the clock is ticking and delay is not an option if we want our children and grandchildren to have a livable world. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify. Remember, all children deserve a livable future. Thank you. And thank you for your testimony. Are there any questions from the panel? Thank you again for taking the time from your day to provide your testimony. Our next two speakers are Elizabeth Hoffman and Tawny Bridgeford. And we'll begin with Elizabeth Hoffman. Thank you. I'm Elizabeth Hoffman. I live in Livingston County with my family and I'm the field manager with Moms Clean Air Force Michigan. We have over 34,000 members here in Michigan and over a million and a half nationally fighting for our clean air and climate action for the sake of our children's health and future. Thank you for taking my testimony today. Just a few weeks ago, we held a small press conference asking folks to contact the EPA and demand stronger protections from coal and gas power plants. Our group of speakers included climate activists, a college professor, the president of Monroe Community College, and me. This event took place at the Monroe Power Plant in Monroe, Michigan. This power plant is the third largest emitter of pollution in the United States and a huge source of carbon pollution. Many miles before my exit, I could see these two huge towers belching immense bellows of carbon and other toxins into the air. As I drove closer to the public fishing and dock and launch where a press conference was being held, I was filled with a sense of foreboding. You see, it was a poor air quality day and I was about to stand less than 200 yards from away from two intimidating dirty stacks. My heart sank when I pulled up to see families fishing so close to this power plant two smokestacks that are releasing chemical warming greenhouse gases, dangerous particle pollution, smog forming nitrous oxides, and other toxic air pollutants, which all harm children's health and disproportionately impact communities already overburdened by pollution. These frontline communities are often communities of color and low um, income communities are often the ones that will sustain the first and worst impacts of climate change. Although our presser only lasted for an hour, in a short amount of time, my lungs ached from the poor air quality due to our approximation to the two towers. I cannot imagine how difficult it is for children and families living under these dangerous emitters of harmful pollution daily. According to the American Lung Association, 12 counties in Michigan have failing air quality grades. Monroe, as well as the city of Detroit, have asthma hospitalization rates significantly higher than the state as a whole, according to the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Childhood asthma rates are significantly higher for children of color. Latino children are twice as likely to die from asthma, and Black children are 10 times more likely to die from asthma than white non-Hispanic kids. Children who live near these power plants find their illnesses are exasperated by pollution. Fossil fuels plants are also responsible for almost one quarter of the climate pollution generated in the US. Michiganders are experiencing more extreme and hotter weather each year, and our Great Lakes are warming faster than our oceans. We cannot wait to act on climate. Time is running out. I support the carbon rule, and I'm calling on the EPA to finalize the strongest possible standards to help protect our families from harmful pollution that contributes to climate change and impacts health. EPA must strengthen community input and safeguards in its final version of this rule. Thank you for taking my testimony today. Thank you for your testimony. Are there any questions from the panel? I have one, uh, Ms. Hoffman. You mentioned um, some st uh, statistics from uh, American Lung Association study. Would you be able to provide those to um, the record as when well. I submit my, my comment per, in the docket, I will have those sources from the Department of Health and Human Services as well as the American Lung Association. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Tawny Bridgeford. Thank you. Tawny Bridgeford, T-A-W-N-Y-B-R-I-D-G-E-F-O-R-D. 
and I am the general counsel at the National Mining Association. The NMA is the official voice of U.S. mining, representing all facets of the domestic mining industry and the hundreds of thousands of American workers that it employs. The NMA advocates for public policies that will help America fully and responsibly utilize its vast natural resources. The NMA's coal producing members supply power plants with the raw materials necessary to provide affordable and reliable electricity for millions of Americans. Coal plants continue to produce 20% of the, of the nation's power and considerably more in many Midwestern states. With increased electrification as our economy and population expand, our need for electricity will continue to grow. Contrary to EPA's claims, the NMA estimates that this proposal puts 155 gigawatts of existing coal units at serious risk of retirement. This monumental loss of baseload generation without having reliable alternatives or the infrastructure to, to replace it would undoubtedly have serious consequences to energy affordability and reliability. Four essential points today. First, the NMA has repeatedly called upon EPA to analyze and abate the cumulative economic risks and predicted generation capacity losses from the EPA's power plant sector strategy before moving forward with any regulatory decisions on the coal electricity fleet. And we are just simply baffled that EPA publicly recognizes the interplay between a suite of air, water, and waste rules, yet continues to refuse to analyze their cumulative impacts. Despite very clear warnings from the nation's grid operators and reliability regulators, forced coal plant closures are accelerating and now moving far faster than they can be reliably replaced. Just this month, PJM's president and CEO testified at a Senate hearing warning that the nation is developing environmental and reliability policy in separate silos with limited and not very transparent coordination. It is past time for EPA to break out of its silo and work constructively with the federal and regional grid experts to conduct an honest and thorough assessment of its regulatory actions on resource ad adequacy before it is too late. Second, the NMA believes U.S. innovation on coal technologies, including CCS, is essential to building a realistic, achievable path to globally replicable and effective emission reduction, while ensuring the world has the tools and the diverse fuels it needs to maintain affordable, and reliable energy. However, EPA wrongfully elevates regional congressional actions that help de-risk this technology for future investment and over promises on the scalable nature of existing projects to unlawfully claim that CCS is adequately demonstrated and cost-effective. Furthermore, man mandating nationwide CCS deployment at coal plants operating past 2040 by January 1st, 2030, just three and a half years after a state implementation plan is adopted, will only function as an unlawful generation shifting retirement mandate. Third, we have heard other stakeholders claim that compelling the use of CCS is analogous to EPA's mandate for scrubbers and therefore is similarly adequately demonstrated. We fundamentally disagree with this comparison. CCS is extraordinarily subsidized, limited in application, and unlike scrubbers, uniquely dependent on factors outside the control of power plant owners, including complicated challenges around geologic sequestration, pipeline construction and property rights. It is far less demonstrated than scrubbers were when EPA decided to require them. Fourth and finally, the NMA strongly opposes EPA's decision to mandate 40% co-firing starting in 2030 for coal plants that want to continue operation through 2039. As EPA is well aware, the US Supreme Court decided last year that section 111 does not authorize EPA to force a shift in the use of resources for generating electricity under the guise of a system emission reduction. And from a process standpoint, uh, we had a couple members that weren't allowed to join today because there weren't enough time slots, just so EPA is aware the link that was sent to them was a YouTube video link, not the Zoom link so they could connect and wait for the waiting line in case there was additional time. So if there's further instruction you can provide to the business community to engage, that would be really appreciated. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Are there any questions from the panel? Thank you again for taking the time today to provide your testimony. Thank you. Our next two speakers are Deidre Courtney Neves, Neves and Kendra Weed. Begin with Deidre Courtney Neves. Thank you. I am having some technical difficulty, so I will um, turn off my screen. Um, thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to uh, testify. My name is Deirdre Courtney Nieves. 
I am a professor with a focus on environmental studies, climate change, and culture in the state of Michigan, and current director of climate solutions and justice for West Michigan Climate Action Council, WEMIAC. WEMIAC has been uh, West Michigan's pre preeminent resource for environmental education and advocacy since 1968. As an organization, we have long been concerned with emerging issues and any new threats to West Michigan's natural and human ecologies with a strategic focus on building sustainable communities for the protection of some of Michigan's most vital resources. I am here today to express my strong support for the Biden administration and EPA's proposed standard to cut climate pollution for coal and, nat coal and natural gas fire power plants on bold, a bold step towards finishing the job on climate to protect our health, protect our communities, and accelerate our transition to clean energy and away from fossil fuel power plants. Fossil fuel power plants are one of the largest sources of carbon pollution driving climate change. Here in Michigan, these standards will be critical to tackling climate change and cleaning up power plants. EPA's proposal is a critical important step forward and I encourage the agency to achieve greater pollution redu reductions uh, from more sources on the fastest possible timelines and recognition of the threat of climate change. Kalamazoo, Michigan, the area where I reside and teach is already seeing the effects of climate change. Climate change has caused an increase in major rain, snow and extreme heat events in the area. Over the last several decades, we've experienced a 40% increase in heavy rainstorms and high heat days exceeding 90 degrees. And these numbers are predicted to increase across Michigan. Um, across Michigan. At this time, we, uh, there are not nearly enough scientific studies focused on scientific extreme climate changes issues in Kalamazoo and what we could face. And this is particularly scary for those in our community, especially the most vulnerable people that we know, according to reports um, who are impacted first and worst. Um, this is especially true for minority low income populations, our children, elderly, and people with chronic diseases. These are the people who will suffer the most from toxic deadly pollution coming from fossil fuels. The impacts experienced are not evenly distributed as members of these groups are more likely to get sick, um, experience other desperate health issues, and even see more loss of life due to climate pollution. On behalf of environmental leaders, educators, advocates, advocates, and environmental justice communities, we thank you in advance for putting forth strong legislation to cut carbon pollution and urge you to start the meaningful engagement process with members of these communities now and not wait until local municipalities and legislators decide to take action in their communities because this process has oftentimes been slow. Engaging environmental justice communities in these decisions will help uh, any effort to sensible to get to sensible steps to accelerate this transition to renewables and away from fossil fuels. Um, this is an imperative and policy that we need now. I urge the EPA to move swiftly to finalize the strongest possible climate pollution standards for power plants by early 2024. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Are there any questions from the panel? No questions, thank you. Thank you again for taking the time today to share, share your testimony. Okay. Our next speaker is Kendra Wee. Hi. I apologize if I mispronounced that. That's fine. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to testify. My name is Kendra Wide. It's K-I-N-D-R-A. Last name is W-E-I-D. Uh, I am advocating on behalf of Moms Clean Air Force, Michigan Clinicians for Climate Action and the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments. I am speaking with you today from Southeastern Michigan. Fossil fuel power plants are responsible, responsible for almost one quarter of the climate pollution generated by the US and I support the carbon rule. And I'm also calling on the EPA to finalize the strongest possible standards to protect our families from harmful air pollution that contributes to climate change and also impacts health. I encourage the EPA to strengthen community input and safeguards in the final version of this rule. I'm a critical care nurse practicing since 2000 and have been a public health advocate in Michigan for air quality and climate since 2015. 
The body of research linking public health outcomes to air pollution and climate change has grown exponentially during that time period. And I have watched as past iterations and attempts to slow climate pollution have been overturned and fallen victim to political party power shifts. I found the letter of opposition that I wrote in 2018 to then EPA Administrator Scott Pruitt regarding the repeal of the Clean Power Plan. First, I want to say that the EPA has come a long way through some very dark times, and I'm thankful to be here in this position today advocating for this rule. Second, it, almost pain, it also pains me to think that we lost those five years and speaks to the urgency of this moment. The impacts of climate change are glaringly evident in the forest fires spreading across Canada and the US impacting air quality and health. And as me many have already mentioned, as a result of these fires, air quality in Detroit last week reached levels comparable to Delhi, India. This speaks to the global impact of this issue and to the United States responsibility as a major contributor to climate pollution to limit power plant emissions. Climate change threatens our health and well-being in numerous ways. Impacts of climate change include more severe heat waves, drought, sea level rise, extreme climate and weather events, exacerbated air pollution, coastal flooding, and wildfires. As nurses, we see the health impacts of climate change at the bedside already in the form of exacerbations of chronic heart and lung conditions due to poor air quality, heat exhaustion and stroke, and increasing rates of vector-borne diseases such as Lyme disease and West Nile virus, just to name a few. Climate change is an issue of generational justice. Today's children will live through at least three times as many climate disasters as their grandparents. Communities of color who are hit first and worst by climate disasters are also hit harder by the psychological impacts of climate change. Cleaning up smokestack pollution from fossil fuel power plants can provide cleaner air and a safer, stable, more stable climate. It will also protect public health. In 2030 alone, the proposed standards would prevent approximately 1,300 premature deaths more than 800 hospital and emergency room visits, more than 300,000 cases of asthma attacks, 38,000 school absent days, and 66,000 lost work days. Once again, I support this rule and I'm calling on the EPA to finalize the strongest possible standards to help protect our families from harmful air pollution that contributes to climate change and harms public health. Time is wasting. Imagine where we would have been today if we'd acted five years ago. We know this administration cares deeply for the climate and public health. So thank you for limiting climate pollution and keep fighting for future generations with equity at the core of your actions. Thank you. And thank you for your testimony, Ms. Bide. Are there any questions from the panel? Thank you again for taking the time from your day to provide your testimony. Our next two speakers are Todd Jones and Josh Skipworth. We'll begin with uh, Todd Jones. Thank you, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Todd Jones, T-O-D-D-J-O-N-E-S. I'm a policy director at Center for Resource Solutions. Um, CRS is a US nonprofit organization that creates policy and market solutions to advance sustainable energy. Uh, my comments today pertain to requirements for demonstrating use of low GHG hydrogen for compliance, and we're going to submit um, additional comments in writing as well. Uh, first, for EGUs relying on electrolytic hydrogen, a REC or EAC retirement must be required to ensure that electricity inputs to hydrogen production are consistent with the low GHG hydrogen standard for EGUs in this rule. Uh, to avoid double counting, all renewable and other specified electricity procurement for production of electrolytic hydrogen used for compliance must be substantiated with retirement of associated RECs or EACs issued for non-renewable resource types or with contractual ownership of all associated environmental attributes by the hydrogen production facility where the sources of electricity used for hydrogen production are not registered in a regional energy attribute tracking system. Use of offsite grid connected renewable and low GHG electricity for hydrogen production should be permitted in addition to off grid and co located renewable electricity. 
We support requirements for geographic and temporal alignment of RECs and EACs with electrolytic hydrogen production, specifically hourly EAC alignment beginning at the onset of compliance period in 2032 for both existing and new EGUs using electrolytic low GHG hydrogen for compliance. According to a report we recently released, the energy attribute tracking systems will be able to provide the infrastructure for hourly attribute tracking for EGUs complying with this rule by 2032. We also support facility age requirements for REC and EAC generators used uh, for hydrogen production. In addition to vintage and geographic requirements, setting restrictions on facility age for EAC and RECs is important to drive more production of clean energy to meet new hydrogen production load. We recommend whole plant renewable energy matching where all electricity consumption and electrolyzer is matched with purchased zero emissions electricity generation in order for that hydrogen to be used for compliance. Uh, to maximize demand for renewable energy from hydrogen production and also because it lends itself to geographic and temporal alignment of uh, EACs with hydrogen production, uh, allowing partial plant uh, renewable energy use or matching, apart from complicating verification and administration, may undermine the incentive to produce hydrogen only in hours when purchased renewable energy is operating. Uh, hourly alignment of EACs with hydrogen production also lends itself to purchasing by hydrogen producers as opposed to by EGUs on behalf of hydrogen producers, since EGUs may not have the information needed to do hourly matching. Uh, EGUs can provide documentation or attestation of qualifying REC retirement for production of electrolytic hydrogen from hydrogen producers, but the RECs may not be retired in the name of or on behalf of the EGU. The individual RECs, the serial numbers retired for the production of hydrogen uh, used by the EGU may not be transparent or accessible by the EGU. Rather, RECs may be retired and matched on behalf of a volume of electric load for hydrogen production. And finally, uh, we recommend that EGUs be required to provide an independent third-party verification that hydrogen uh, the EGU uses to comply with this regulation meets the requirements for low GHG hydrogen. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony today. Are there any questions from the panel? No questions. Thank you. Thank you. Will you be providing a written a copy of your uh, testimony to the to the docket? We'll be uh, providing more detailed written comment and I can provide a copy of this statement as well. Uh, that would be fantastic, thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Josh Skipworth. Skipworth. All good. Uh, hello everybody, my name is Josh Skipworth and I am the Associate National Director of Campaigns for Action for the Climate Emergency. First, let me thank y'all for hosting these hearings and give me the opportunity to speak. The proposed new rules for regulating carbon emissions from existing power plants are just a necessary step towards building the future we all deserve. As we know, carbon dioxide emissions from existing power plants generate roughly 25% of the total greenhouse gas emissions in the United States. These emissions have overwhelmingly contributed to not only the ongoing climate crisis we're all racing to beat, but decades of heart and respiratory disease, untold other health complications, destructions of ecosystems and extinction of countless species, assaults on frontline communities, and costs passed on to consumers. According to the EPA's own analysis, these new rules would prevent up to 617 million metric tons of carbon dioxide from new coal and gas plants, and up to 407 million metric tons from existing gas power plants. This impact cannot be overstated. Removing and preventing this level of carbon from entering the atmosphere would be a massive step towards securing a clean and renewable future and ending decades of unmitigated fossil fuel pollution. I urge the EPA to enact the strongest rules possible and fulfill its mandate to reduce harmful pollution that threatens people's health and well-being. Thank you again for your time, and I hope you all have a great day. Thank you, and thank you for your testimony. Are there any questions from the panel? Thank you again, and thank you for taking the time out of your day. Before we get to our next two speakers, I'd like to please uh, remember to send a direct chat to attendee support. Uh, that's in your chat box and if you, and you pull down menu. And if you need to have any questions or need any assistance. 
Our next two speakers are Carolyn Heckman and Emily Petrucci. Hello, my name is Carolyn Heckman, C-A-R-O-L-Y-N, H-E-C-K-M-A-N. I am the Pennsylvania Policy and Outreach Coordinator at the Evangelical Environmental Network. I live in Lewistown, Pennsylvania with my husband and our four-year-old son. As an evangelical Christian committed to defending life and commanded by Jesus to love my neighbor as myself, I thank the Environmental Protection Agency for proposing this critically important safeguard that will defend the health of all God's children and God's creation by cutting carbon pollution from power plants. Finalizing the strongest possible safeguard as quickly as possible is important to me because of the impacts of carbon pollution on children like my own. Just recently, my son was diagnosed with Lyme disease. Thankfully, with antibiotics, my son is making a full recovery, but this is days after a high fever and discomfort that my autistic son couldn't verbalize. High humidity related to changing moisture levels and increased temperatures relative to climate change have increased tick-borne diseases here in Mifflin County. Ticks and tick-borne illnesses have been increasingly problematic across Pennsylvania as well. The Commonwealth has the highest concentration of Lyme disease cases within the nation. Approximately 38% of all Lyme disease cases within the United States are occurring here in Pennsylvania. Between animals and to humans, tick can, ticks can transmit pathogens such as various parasitic worms, viruses, and bacteria. And to make matters worse, there are several emergency tick burn diseases, which uh, little is known. By cutting carbon pollution, we can decrease the effects of climate change as increase instances of ticks and tick-borne illnesses like Lyme disease, defending not just the, my own health, but also the health of my children and my neighbors. We can go further by fully implementing the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, also known as REGI here in Pennsylvania, limiting not only carbon emissions, but also other air pollutants like PM2.5. With links to severe allergies, asthma, ADHD, and autism, PM2.5, like carbon pollution, is wrecking havoc on our children, including my son. Watching my son grow and be diagnosed with autism, ADHD, and now Lyme, the time to act and restrict all air pollutants is now, so future children do not have to struggle with these disabilities and illnesses. The proposed standard is critically important step further, but to truly defend the health and safety of all God's children, I urge the EPA to strengthen the rules specifically by requiring more plants to achieve greater cuts to carbon pollution on the fastest possible timeline in order to protect public health, creating a process of, for rigorous monitoring, verification, enforcement, and engagement within communities, both on safeguards and on individual projects to further advance community protection and input and for facilities choosing to install carbon capture and sequestration technologies, rigorous monitoring and enforcement of any emissions or leaks must be required. The Biden administration must move swiftly to update requirements outside of EPA air authorities to ensure any such projects are held to the highest health and safety standards, lead to permanent sequestration without leaks or damaging earthquakes, and do not present additional harms to nearby communities at the fence line or along pop lines. Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. All God's children deserve to grow with the hope and expectation of a healthy, vibrant future. I urge the EPA to act quickly and finalize the strongest possible standards to cut carbon pollution from power plants no later than early 2024 to help make this a reality. Thank you for your work on this important matter. Thank you for your testimony. Are there any questions from the panel? No questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good time for your day and provide your testimony. Our next speaker is Emily Petrucci. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay. My name is Emily Petrucci. That's spelled E M I L Y P E T R U C C I. And I'm a volunteer with Moms Clean Air Force and resident of Media, Pennsylvania, just outside of Philadelphia. I'm speaking today to urgently support EPA's proposal to limit carbon emissions from fossil fuel power plants. Please finalize these standards as quickly as possible. We need these standards urgently to protect our families from sickening air pollution and worsening climate change impacts. Climate change is threatening our health and well being today, and power plants are responsible for roughly a quarter of climate pollution in the US. Here in our community, we see heat waves with oppressive conditions extreme weather events like flooding and tornadoes on the rise, and an increase in Lyme disease, as you just heard. And for the first time in our lifetimes, we recently experienced the thick wildfire smoke wafting over our entire Northeast region from far away Canadian wildfires. Our 12-year-old daughter had an all-day field trip outside during this time. My husband and I asked ourselves, is this how it's going to be now? Will we need to make choices about which events are worth risking cancer for? My husband and I had a talk with our daughters then. We explained that sadly, they will always live with the effects of climate change and they will need to keep it in the forefront of their minds as they make plans for their futures. 
This is not a discussion that my parents had to have with me, but today's children will live through at least three times as many climate disasters as their grandparents. They will suffer learning losses due to extreme heat and children of color and lower income children will suffer the worst impacts. Hotter temperatures also make it more difficult for kids to remain active and play outdoors. Our family generally rules out any summer sports camps that will be outside without shade because the heat can be unbearable in our region. Climate change is also affecting the mental health of the young people in my family. The stress and worry about the future is always there. And our children need to know that we're doing everything in our power to turn this climate change ship around. We have a moral responsibility to act now to protect the health of our children from dangerous and costly climate change. The recent IPCC report made crystal clear that the window to prevent the worst impacts of climate change is rapidly closing. The EPA must enact strong limits on new and existing fossil fuel power plants. The EPA has signaled an openness to allowing existing mechanisms like the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, or REGI, to serve as a pathway for compliance with these new standards. REGI would cut pollution, improve public health, and provide funds to invest in pollution reductions and clean energy technologies here in Pennsylvania. It would also provide assistance to help the workers and communities affected by the energy transition. REGI pos positions the state to be able to meet the EPA rules ambitious timeframe since it's already been developed and is ready for implementation. It has been successful in the 11 other states where it has operated. Since Pennsylvania is the third highest carbon polluter from power plants in this country, we need to act with great urgency. Once again, my family strongly supports the carbon rule and we call on the EPA to finalize the strongest standards to protect our families. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your testimony. Are there any questions from the panel? Thank you again for taking the time from your day to provide that testimony. Our next two speakers are Madeline Page and Joe Schreiber. And we'll begin with Madeline Page. Thanks so much for the opportunity to testify. I'm Madeline Page, um, and I work with the Climate Action Campaign. And I'm here today to express my strong support for the Biden administration's proposed standards to cut climate pollution from coal and natural gas-fired power plants. I became an environmental advocate because of formative childhood experiences watching my mother and my sister struggle with sometimes life-threatening asthma flares. If you have a family member with asthma, you understand the daily fear that we lived in. Always making sure to have an inhaler on hand or if worse came to worst, um, which it did several times in my family when my sister was in near cardiac arrest being within racing distance um, of an emergency room. And while we were just trying to stay on top of any given flare, I now know that there are larger systems at play. We know climate change is driven by carbon pollution from the fossil fuel industry. And we know climate change leads to pure air quality and increasingly negative health outcomes, including respiratory disease and heart disease. And climate change also creates more unhealthy smog, which is associated with um, diminished lung function, increased hospital emissions, and emergency visits for asthma, um, like those that my family experienced. And as we know, um, power plants, but fossil fuel power plants, are some of the largest sources of carbon pollution driving climate change in this country. So across the country, these standards that you've proposed um, will be critical to tackling climate change and cleaning up this pollution. EPA's proposal is a critically important step forward and I'm also wanting to encourage the agency um, to achieve greater pollution reductions from more sources on the fastest timelines possible in recognition of the urgent threat that climate change poses. So, um, you know, and, and urging you to do this by next year, early next year, April, 2024. You know, the EPA standards um, you're projecting will lead to up to 85 billion in net climate and public health benefits, as well as really important um, uh, benefits um, like fewer missed work days, less asthma attacks, less hospital visits, and for that I am so grateful. There have been two times in my adult life where I was brought back to that deep, you know, stomach ache fear um, of my childhood watching my loved ones suffer from asthma. And the first was during the early days of the pandemic when we didn't know what was happening and how vulnerable populations might fare. 
And the second time was just last week. My mom and sister live in New York. And as we watched the pollution cover the city, um, I was brought right back there um, to that feeling. And we know that these kind of events will become more frequent thanks to climate change. And I wanna be able to say that I did everything I could um, to, to prevent passing on that future um, to my niece. And so I'm proud to support this administration's standards um, and, and thank you and encourage you to, to strengthen them as, um, as much as possible. Thank you for your testimony today. Are there any questions from the panel? No questions, thank you very much. Thank you again for taking the time today. Our next speaker is Joe Schreiber. Hello, uh, thank you for the opportunity to comment today. I am speaking as a concerned citizen and on behalf of my three beautiful daughters and all the other beautiful sons and daughters in the world. I am desperately worried for their futures and I'm embarrassed and ashamed that my generation has done so little to address the climate emergency. Instead of following the science and listening to the experts, we have been making choices and implementing policies that are primarily driven by the narrow self-interest and financial needs of the fossil fuel industries. This climate crisis continues to worsen. And unless we rapidly change course, we will be passing on to our children a planet that is even more polluted, hotter, and unstable than it is today. While we cynically enjoy the benefits of our short-term and short-sighted greed, our children will have to pay for and clean up our mess. Our children are already suffering in places near my home here in Pittsburgh, like Clareton, Pennsylvania and other communities near fossil fuel emitting industries, rates of childhood asthma are extraordinarily high. We have to be better than this. One small step in a positive direction is for the EPA to strengthen and vigorously enforce stronger regulations limiting fossil fuel emissions. These regulations should close all loopholes and should be implemented as quickly as possible. To do otherwise is truly not a viable option at this point and would be a kick in the gut to all of our futures and especially our children's futures. We desperately need to continue to do all that we can to reduce the amount of carbon we are sending into the atmosphere to minimize the pollution in the air that we all have to breathe and to move us all away from fossil fuels and toward a cleaner, healthier and happier future for my daughters and for all the younger generations to come. To do otherwise is to continue to fail our children. Thank you again for the opportunity to participate today. And thank you for taking the time today to provide your testimony. Are there any questions from the panel? No questions. Thank you again for joining us today. Our next two speakers are Anne Reagan and Sophia Ahmed. And we'll begin with Anne Reagan. Great. Ann Regan? Uh, Ms. Regan, if you're speaking, we uh, you must be on mute. I'm so sorry. Um... I had to restart my computer right before that. <laughs> I know that issue occasionally. Yeah. Okay. So I, I'll begin right now. Yeah, you may be ready. Yes. Awesome. Hello. My name is Annie Regan, the campaign's director for Penn Future. Penn Future is a Pennsylvania statewide 5013C nonprofit that has combined legislative advocacy and legal enforcement at the local, state, and federal levels educational outreach and civic engagement support for a just and equitable environmental outcome that improve the quality of life. I'm here today on behalf of Penn Future to comment on the EPA's proposed carbon pollution standards for fossil fuel power plants. The EPA's plan is a strong start. The proposed standard will slash carbon pollution by 600 and 617 million metrics by 2042, provide up to $85 billion in net climate and public health benefits through 2042, Avoid 1,300 premature deaths, 800 hospital and ER visits, more than 300,000 asthma attacks, 38,000 school absences, and 66,000 lost workdays each year. 
current fossil fuel power plant pollution is contributing to a rising cost of climate disasters that are burdening our economy and our health. According to a recent study, one third of all extreme weather related losses since 1980 occurred in the last five years. From 2017 to 2021, America experienced its four most expensive wildfires, two of its three most expensive hurricanes, and its most expensive winter storm with economic losses from all disasters totaling $765 billion. Communities of color and vulnerable communities are also more likely to get sick because of this dirty type of power plant pollution, not only from direct impact on environmental justice fence line communities, but also from its contribution to climate change. In 2021, the EPA released a peer-reviewed study that showed communities of color are expected to see a decrease in life expectancy, impaired health, and experience unstable employment than the U.S. population as a whole. The report finds that African Americans are 40% more likely to die from exposure to climate change impacts. Black children are 34% more likely to experience asthma exasperated by climate change. Hispanic and Latin American and Native Americans are 43 and 73% more likely to live in places where climate change threatens labor opportunities, potentially endangering livelihoods. While the Supreme Court's previous ruling stated that the EPA cannot force power plants to transition to clean energy sources, it did reaffirm the agency's authority to regulate harmful climate changing emissions. Therefore, we need a rule that will allow Pennsylvania to use all tools in our toolbox to implement standards and ensure pollution from coal and fracked gas plant operations is reduced to a minimum, whether that requires the installation of technology to carbon capture emissions where feasible and efficient or policies to encourage a transition to renewable energy sources. While we support the EPA's determinations establishing the performance standards, we also encourage EPA to give states and companies the maximum amount of flexibility to decide how to best meet the requirements. We believe programs like the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, otherwise known as REGI, along with investments in renewable energy and energy efficiency, will provide the most cost-effective means to reduce emissions. Pennsylvania is the third largest carbon polluter from power plants in the country. REGI is the quickest and most effective approach to curbing these harmful emissions while post positioning the state to comply more easily with this new EPA rule as the state submits its plan in the years ahead. Wind and solar already outcompete fossil fuels in many markets, and now that gas fire power plants will finally have to reduce the pollution emitted from their smokestacks, this competition will be a more level playing field. In fact, wind and solar can cost a third to a quarter of the cost of coal or gas power. With the Inflation Reduction Act's clean energy investment plus ambitious but achievable EPA carbon pollution standards, the power sector could reach at least a 77% reduction in carbon dioxide emissions by 2030, relative to the peak in 2005. Climate change continues to be a pressing issue worldwide. Here in Pennsylvania, we've most recently seen what the wildfires have done to our air quality. So while the EPA's timeframe allows for gradual compliance with the new limits, Penn Future is pleased that the power industry's carbon emissions are finally being targeted for change. Thank you so much. Thank you for your testimony today. Are there any questions from the panel? Thank you again for taking the time today to provide your testimony. Our next speaker is Sophia Ahmed. Hi, good afternoon. My yeah. name is Sophia Ahmed, uh, S-O-P-H-I-A-A-H-M-E-D, and I'm a policy analyst at the Natural Resources Defense Council. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony on the proposed carbon pollution standards for fossil fuel fired power plants. NRDC welcomes the EPA's proposal to cut carbon pollution from coal and gas fired power plants, which emit nearly a third of US CO2, yet have until now been allowed to freely pollute. I'm here on behalf of NRDC's more than 3 million members and online activists to urge the EPA to strengthen the proposed standards. My testimony will address how doing so will allow the standards to build on the trends set by the Inflation Reduction Act, IRA, protect public health, and drive more effective climate action. This rule comes at a time of immense progress in decarbonizing the power sector. Technological changes and market forces are driving large emissions reductions, and the IRA will only accelerate power sector decarbonization even further, with the EPA projecting that the IRA can help reduce CO2 emissions by 10.8 billion tons over the next 20 years, compared to their pre-IRA modeling. The proposed standards will yield an, an additional 617 million metric tons of reductions beyond the IRA baseline through 2042. 
However, the EPA can achieve additional reductions that will better capture the momentum set by the, by the IRA without impacting reliability. In particular, the proposed rules fall short in their coverage of existing gas plants. According to NRDC analysis, the proposed rule will only cover 7% of existing natural gas units, accounting for less than 30% of CO2 emissions from gas-fired units in the power sector. This coverage is far too narrow. EPA has requested comment on the coverage proposed in the rule. So currently, the proposal only covers units larger than 300 megawatts with a capacity factor of over 50%. NRDC recommends that the EPA expand coverage to 100 or 150 megawatt units with a capacity factor of 40% or more. Our recommendations will deliver two key benefits. So first, the added coverage will achieve larger, urgently needed emissions reductions. According to NRDC analysis, our proposed change would cover units responsible for more than 80% of emissions from gas-fired units, again, compared to less than 30% of emissions covered by the proposed standard. And our second recommendation and, and, and second, our recommendation will help prevent a harmful shift in generation from covered to exempt units. By only covering 7% of gas units, the proposed standards enable power operators to shift generation to smaller and less frequently run gas plants that are not covered by the standard. This is unacceptable. We must reduce emissions, not just shift them. And many of these smaller units are less efficient and pollute at higher rates, which we're particularly concerned about because many of these units are located in or near environmental justice communities. And beyond increased coverage, additional regulatory action to address these other pollutants from these units will help ensure that all communities will benefit from these rules. And so to wrap up, the agency should strengthen the proposed standards to cover more existing gas-fired units. Our analysis indicates that changing the size and capacity factor thresholds could lead to more positive outcomes for climate and health and is more aligned with the trends set by the IRA. Mm -hmm. And importantly, our recommendation maintains the flexibility that the proposed standards offer to power operators, helping ensure that grid reliability is achieved. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak on this matter. Thank you for your testimony today. Are there any questions? Do you plan on submitting the analysis you mentioned to the docket? Yes, I can. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you again for your testimony today. Our next two speakers are Jay Drake Hamilton and Kyle Meyer Shop. And we'll begin with Jay Drake Hamilton. Hello, I'm Jay Drake Hamilton, capital J period, D R A K E H A M I L T O N. I'm testifying on behalf of Minnesota nonprofit Fresh Energy and the Senior Director of Science Policy. Thank you for proposing the Cut Climate Pollution Plan rule to protect Americans from the harmful effects of fossil fueled power plants. The recent United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change scientific report made it clear that the window to prevent the worst impacts of the climate crisis is rapidly closing. These major sources of pollution must be produced. The proposed standards are a good starting point for addressing climate change, but there are several important areas where the rule must be strengthened to fully protect Americans' health and welfare as the EPA is required to do under the law. The law. Three areas require special attention. First, you must expand the scope of the rule of existing power gas plants to fully address this major source of air pollution. As proposed, fewer than 10% of existing gas power plants would be required to limit their air emissions. That fact is unacceptable and is a dereliction of the EPA's duty under the Clean Air Act to protect Americans from deadly climate pollution. The EPA should expand the rule to cover as many gas powered plants as possible down to at least plants 100 megawatts in size. Second, the agency must accelerate all compliance deadlines from 2035 to 2030 so that the owners of power plants begin reducing their pollution this decade, the decisive decade of 2020 to 2030. Technologies to reduce greenhouse gas emissions 
are available now. Climate science and President Biden's commitments to the countries of the world demand that we cut in half U.S. carbon pollution by 2030, waiting until 2035 for requirements to begin would violate the urgent calls of climate science. Waiting until 2035 also violates the agency's mandate under federal law. The capability for some coal plants to continue emitting greenhouse gas emissions until 2039, largely without reducing those emissions, is quite unacceptable. This retirement loophole should be eliminated or at the very least move up in time to require emission reductions in 2030. Third, Minnesotans have been waiting far too long for polluting electricity generating plants to clean up their emissions. The EPA should act with urgency to finalize a rule before March 2024. Climate action can no longer wait. Dramatically mitigating air pollution is important to millions of people who live in Minnesota. These include the very young and the very old Minnesotans who suffer from respiratory distress from air pollution emitted where they live or emitted where they work or all three emitted also near where they go to school. As a person who as a two-year-old taught nearly died from asthma, I am personally moved by the public health improvements that can be made for people in communities that live in the shadow of fossil fuel plants. In conclusion, thank you to the US Environmental Protection Agency for its work to address deadly pollution from fossil fuel powered electricity plants. These proposed rules would create very welcome massive climate and public health benefits. These rules are long overdue. Ms. Hamilton, I'm gonna have to ask you Thank to you. wrap up. Are there any questions from the panel? No questions, thank you. Thank you again for your testimony today. Our next speaker is Kyle Myers Shop. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Reverend Kyle Myard Scott, K Y L E M E Y A A R D hyphen S C H A A P. I serve as the vice president of the Evangelical Environmental Network. I'm a pastor and I'm a father of two boys, five years old and 16 months old. And tomorrow's my birthday. I'll turn 34, and it has me thinking about what kind of world my boys are going to be living in when they turn 34. And frankly, I'm scared by the world that I see. I see a world of poorer air quality, of more dangerous weather disasters, of massive migrations of people, of greater political and economic uncertainty, of biodiversity loss, of greater health risks. The world our kids are inheriting and indeed are already inhabiting is a world where God's grandeur and human well-being are both decidedly diminished because of a climate altered by greenhouse gases emitted from the burning of fossil fuels. As a dad who loves his boys more than anything in the world and is doing everything I can to provide for them and their future, this breaks my heart. And as an evangelical pastor who is called to love my neighbor and believes in defending the sacredness of all life, this breaks my heart. But I'm not without hope because that world is not the only one that we can create together. And finalizing the strongest possible cut climate pollution standard as quickly as possible will do much to get us to a healthier and a safer world. That's because power plants are the second largest source of carbon pollution in the US and they're responsible for roughly a quarter of our country's climate pollution. By putting strong safeguards in place to curb carbon and other greenhouse gas pollution from power plants, EPA will pick some of the lowest hanging fruit that we have left in the fight against climate change. But safeguards can only do this though if they're as strong as possible. The current proposed standard is a critically important step forward, but to truly defend the health and safety of everyone, I urge the EPA to strengthen this rule specifically in the following three ways. First, 
by requiring more plants to achieve greater cuts to carbon pollution on the fastest possible timeline. Second, by creating a process for rigorous monitoring, verification, and enforcement, and engagement with communities to further advance community protection and input. And third, for those facilities that do choose to install carbon capture and sequestration technologies, rigorous monitoring and enforcement for any emissions or leaks must be required. The Biden administration has to move swiftly to update requirements outside of EPA air authorities to ensure any such projects are held to the highest health and safety standards, that they lead to permanent sequestration without leaks or damaging earthquakes, and that they do not present additional harms to nearby communities at the fence line or along pipelines. All of God's children, including my two precious boys, deserve to grow up with the hope and expectation of a healthy, vibrant future. I urge the EPA to act quickly and to finalize the strongest possible standards to cut climate pollution from power plants no later than early 2024 to make this hope a reality. Thank you for your time and for your work. Thank you for providing your testimony today. Are there any questions from the panel? No questions, thank you. Thank you again, Reverend Meyer, Meyer Shop, Scott. Our next two speakers are Heath Nakmus and Brady Watson. Um, Good afternoon. Also, before you start, I just ask people that if you are in the audience um, or observing and involved with the via the Zoom call, please leave your chat box open in case the attendee support needs to reach out to you. And I'll turn it over to Mr. Nakmus. Nakmus. Good job. Thank you. Uh, my name is Heath Nakmus, and I am Vice President and Policy Counsel for the Global Energy Institute, an affiliate of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. The Chamber's membership includes electric utilities, their customers, and the associated supply chain. The Chamber appreciates the opportunity to testify today on the EPA's latest proposal to regulate greenhouse gas emissions from existing and new electric generating facilities. While the Chamber supports development of durable and achievable emissions reduced electricity regulations, the overall direction of the EPA's proposed rules can be summed up simply as too much, too fast. The Chamber strongly supports a low carbon transition, and the electricity sector has led the way in helping to drive an 18% economy-wide reduction in carbon dioxide emissions as compared to levels seen in 2005. Much of the reduction in emissions during this period is due to a 57% reduction in coal-fired generation, accounting for just 21% of total generation in 2021. Meanwhile, natural gas has grown to play a more meaningful role in our nation's electricity generation, increasing from 20% in 2005 to just under 40% of our electricity supply in 2021. As America continues to rely upon these two types of generation resources for approximately 60% of our electricity, the significance of new EPA regulations that aim to impose promising but still undemonstrated emissions reduction technologies and associated infrastructure upon many of these facilities cannot be understated. As recently noted by the North American Electric Reliability Corporation before the U.S. Energy Committee, unless reliability and resilience are appropriately prioritized, current trends indicate the potential for more frequent and more serious long-duration reliability disruptions, including the possibility of national consequence events. The potential for increasing these events raises concerns over the associated direct and indirect costs and related economy-wide impacts as they reverberate through virtually all individual, household, commercial, industrial, and government activities. These reliability concerns are part of the unaccounted for costs of EPA's latest proposal to impose requirements for promising but not yet demonstrated technology and infrastructure upon such a large portion of our nation's electric generation capacity. The Chamber has been among the strongest advocates for the research, development, and deployment of a host of technologies, including renewables, hydrogen, and carbon capture and sequestration. And to more quickly deploy these technologies, the Chamber is leading an effort to encourage the adoption of permitting reforms necessary to address the extensive delays currently impacting the build out of transmission lines, renewable energy projects, and many other types of critical infrastructure. While it may be appropriate for government policies to help drive ambition, rulemakings and associated regulations must be based on realistic assumptions, which are both transparent and credible. Unfortunately, the EPA's new power plant rule falls short on both counts. The EPA power plant rule relies upon unrealistic assumptions related to electricity demand, technology adoption, and baseline emissions reductions to promote a narrative that the proposed rule would support significant environmental gains at minimal economic cost. For example, EPA's regulatory analysis projects that 97.8% of emission reductions between 2022 and 2040 occur even in the absence of the rule, a highly implausible assertion built on a series of unrealistic assumptions. 
In addition, EPA's cornerstone for compliance includes various combinations of hydrogen co-firing and carbon capture and sequestration technologies that are simply not mature enough for widespread mandatory adoption and which have not, as is required by the Clean Air Act, been adequately demonstrated. Moreover, the fact that EPA would require the deployment of significant new infrastructure, which would be located predominantly beyond the fence line of the regulated generating units, such as hydrogen and or carbon dioxide pipelines and electric transmission lines to connect the renewables necessary to offset anticipated generation retirements, seriously calls into question the durability and viability of EPA's proposal. EPA's modeling of its proposal appears to simply assume the instantaneous appearance of this infrastructure as needed, which is simply not plausible at the pace and scale needed. The EPA should reevaluate its rule and work collaborative, collaboratively with stakeholders to more accurately model the real world cost and reliability impacts of its power plant rule. The climate challenge requires that government and industry work together with all parties to support the reliability and affordability of the electricity resource to which we are increasingly turning to further reduce the emissions from other economic sectors. Any other approach threatens to undermine public support for the transition to cleaner energy resources. The Chamber appreciates the opportunity to provide comment on the EPA's latest efforts to further reduce the emissions of carbon dioxide from the power sector. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Are there any questions from the panel? Uh, just one question. Uh, will you be providing additional information on those analyses and critiques in your in your uh, in the docket? Um, that, that that will most likely happen. Uh, we will be posting. Uh, a shorter analysis regarding uh, some of the things I mentioned uh, within the next probably week or so. We'll be uh, revealing something along those lines, uh, but we will also be filing detailed comments in the docket as well. We we'll appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Our next speaker is Brady Watson. Hi there. Uh, my name is Brady Watson and I work at the Union of Concerned Scientists. Uh, I'm commenting today to express my support for EPA proposing these standards to cut carbon pollution from power plants. EPA's proposal is a critically important step forward. Still, I encourage the agency to require greater cuts to pollution from more sources, including peaker plants, which operate less frequently than baseload plants, but when fired often have significant negative public health impacts in nearby communities. This is an environmental justice concern because these frontline communities are more likely to be Black, Latinx, or low income. I also encourage the EPA to accelerate the timelines by which power plants must meet these requirements in recognition of the technical feasibility of doing more faster, the pressing threat of climate change, and the ongoing public health impacts from continued fossil fuel pollution. The administration must also take action to improve and strengthen community protections and ensure meaningful public input. This includes requiring rigorous, rigorous pollution monitoring, verification, and enforcement, as well as stipulating that engagement with communities, both on safeguards and individual projects, is a required component of state implementation plans. Doing so will help bring justice to communities across the country, including my own here in Tennessee, that have for many decades been unfairly and disproportionately exposed to pollution, but only if the proposed rule is sufficiently strengthened. I live near the Kingston Fossil Plant that currently burns coal, but its operator TVA has recently signaled it intends to convert it to a natural gas plant. But that planning was conducted in the absence of a federal carbon pollution standards, and with the strengthened final version of these standards in place, TVA could, would have to truly confront the carbon emissions associated with the plant's conversion to gas, and thus force a full consideration of whether and how the Kingston plant fits into a deeply decarbonized future, or whether investments in renewable energy are preferable instead investments that will benefit the residents of Kingston and the entire Tennessee Valley. According to the American Lung Association State of the Air Report, people of color are 3.7 times more likely than white people to live in a county with three failing grades. In the counties with the worst air quality that get failing grades for all three pollution measures, 72% of residents are people of color compared to only 28% who are white. Thankfully, the proposed EPA standards will, develop, will deliver large public health benefits. Just one subset of the rule is projected to result in up to $85 billion in net public health benefits through 2042. And in 2030 alone, provisions limiting, limiting emissions from existing coal plants and new gas plants are expected to avert 1,300 premature deaths, prevent 300,000 asthma attacks, and head off at least 800 hospitalizations. And of course, strength, strengthening them will only increase those numbers. These public health benefits are particularly critical for communities already bearing a disproportionate burden of pollution costs. According to EPA analysis, this proposal will slash carbon pollution by 617 million metric tons between 2028 and 2042, the equivalent of reducing the annual emissions of 137 million gas burning cars. 
This is important for the fight against climate change, but it's also important for addressing the direct material harm that comes to marginalized and frontline communities as a result of power plant pollution. As I've stated before, strengthening these standards and accelerating the retirement requirement timelines will result in even larger emissions reductions. Uh, we cannot stop climate change without addressing the carbon pollution coming from coal and gas fired power, power plants. That's why this rulemaking is so important. If it's enacted in its strongest form, the standards will measurably reduce carbon pollution from power plants. Although no one set of standards from the EPA can undo the decades of systemic racism at the bottom of these troubling health disparities and resulting climate impacts, the current EPA proposal is a step in the right direction, but it must be strengthened. On behalf of communities like my own and the Union of Concerned Scientists, I urge the EPA to expand the scope of this proposal to include all gas plants, including smaller units and those that operate at a lower capacity factor, strengthen the emissions reduction requirements for new and existing gas plants, accelerate the timeline by which coal and gas plants must meet emissions requirements, and finalize the proposal no later than spring of 2024. Our communities have waited for these protections long enough, and justice delayed is justice denied. Please don't make us wait any longer. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Are there any questions from the panel? No questions, thank you. Thank you again, for taking the time today to provide this testimony. Our next two speakers are Jed Downs and Fred Crabill, and we'll begin with Jed Downs. Uh, all right. Um, yeah, my name is John Downs, J-O-H-N, uh, but I only I wouldn't answer to it if you called me that in a, in a room with three people. Um, I'm a, a former occupational medicine physician and currently function as an osteopath in uh, um, near the Mad Madison, Wisconsin. I'm in support of the greenhouse gas standards and guidelines for fossil fuel power plants. Um, and I agree with the focus on, oh, sorry, my video didn't start. Um, and I agree with, I, uh, agree with the focus on co uh, health co-benefits of decreasing greenhouse gas emissions um, in terms of healthcare costs and suffering. I'm a parent who um, is, and grandparent, but I'm st still, um, still have the memories of, uh, um, the terror of spending nights on my child's floor while he breathed at 60 times plus per minute, despite being on a home nebulizer and having steroids on board, not knowing in spite of my training, if I was being negligent for not bringing him into the hospital again, uh, when uh, he was at near maximal uh, care or, um, or not. Reduction in asthma attacks or complications of other lung diseases are more than dollars and cents arguments to those who cannot get air. We know that not all populations are impacted equally by heat and pollution exposure. Environmental justice issues have been discussed by many prior speakers, and um, but also the pregnant, the uh, children and infants, and the elderly and the obese are all at much higher risk for um, health effects for reasons which I need not go into, but could in written comments. CO2, could, CO2 control needs to happen at the smokestack or during, during the production of CO2. Cleaning CO2 out of the atmosphere when it's only point 4% makes no sense when despite high airflow rates um, during or in combustion processes for generation, uh, the concentration of CO2 in flue gases is uh, 5 to 15%. Um, and as an aside, I'd put in a plug that CO2 production and cement production, ethanol production, and uh, steel production should also be covered by pollution control standards. Uh, fighting entropy is, a, is uh, energy and resource intensive. The legislation, uh, or the, I should say the regulations uh, provide carrots for closing coal plants before they're useful, but not harmful production life is over um, in the form of avoidance cost of retrofitting a plant near the end of its useful life. I reluctantly agree uh, that a timeline for the, for the regulations are needed, but I agree with earlier speakers who feel the timeline uh, as proposed for ongoing whole coal fire plants is excessive. The infrastructure for CO2 transport and disposal are currently underdeveloped and finding the skilled labor and materials as well as uh, uh, technology for carbon capture uh, will take more time. Given the pressures creating uh, weather disruption, climate disasters, in my opinion, these initiatives are late in the game on uh, the threats to the public health discussed um, in terms of combustion products. Oh, sorry, I screwed up somewhere. Um, okay. I don't have the knowledge and expertise to understand what would have to go into models that could uh, also account to for healthcare um, 
outcomes from an infrastructure cost that will be avoided by the additional dumping of CO2 into the atmosphere from decreased attributable, attributable risks of flooding, wildfires, hurricanes, tornadoes, derechos, spread of vector-borne disease, impacts on agricultural production and livestock, heat-induced decreased outdoor work, worker production, and impacts of heat illness on those in urban regions without green space and cooling facilities. I also have some confusion about how NOx is going to be reduced um, by the use of um, low greenhouse gas hydrogen. As long as combustion of a fuel is happening in the presence of oxygen and nitrogen, NOxs are going to be produced. Um, I'm concerned that cogeneration using biomass as a fuel is not, a, is not addressed that I have seen so far in my readings. And I suspect that the electrical generating units using biomass are no, uh, not much cleaner than, than coal in terms of uh, burning a fuel and maybe even worse. Uh, um, Mr. Jones, I, I want to ask you to wrap up. Your, your, your four minutes has expired. Okay, I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions from the panel? No questions. Thank you for your testimony. Yep. Thank you for taking testimony, providing your testimony today. Our next speaker is Fred Craybill. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to speak to you today. My name is Fred Craybill, F R E D K R A Y B I L L. I live in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and I'm a retired nurse. Climate change is a very big issue for me, and I believe our society suffers suffers because we have too much short-term thinking and not enough consideration for the big picture and the long-term effects of our actions. We have plenty of warning about the long-term disaster that uh, the future holds if we don't address the climate emergency today. Recently, the air quality in New York City was three times as bad as one of the worst cities in India for air pollution. That haze of bad air was caused by forest fires in Canada in early June, and this is just another sign of our ever worsening climate crisis. As we look around the world in the last 15 years, we are seeing ever worsening, uh, as we look around the world in the last 15 years, we are see, or seeing record-breaking drought, heat waves, forest fires, rain with flash flooding events. We are seeing record-breaking melting of glaciers, and warming of oceans, leading to more severe hurricanes. We're seeing sea level rise and dying of coral reefs. There is plenty of reason to be concerned about climate change. While it is important to balance our needs for affordable energy, we must also take into consideration the long-term costly effects of climate change. In light of that, I want to thank the people of the Environmental Protection Agency for this very important rule proposal, this very important rule proposal to limit carbon pollution from power plants. This is the long-term thinking that we need to have, and I applaud the work of the EPA in cutting greenhouse gas pollution from power plants. When there are no restraints on consumption of coal and gas, we will see the price of these fuels rise. When we limit pollution from coal and gas plants, we reduce the pressure of rising demand and rising prices. The EPA rule, along with the benefits of Inflation Reduction Act, will increasingly steer utilities to cleaner energy such as wind and solar, and also ensure that existing coal and gas generation plants keep their emissions low. I fully support this new EPA rule limiting carbon emissions from power plants. If changes are made, I would ask for stricter regulations to cover more gas power plants and plants burning waste coal if they are not already covered. And the most important thing I wanna say is our future is renewable energy. The solution to pollution is renewable, it's doable. Thanks for the opportunity to speak. Uh, thank you, Mr. Craven. Are there any questions from the panel? I didn't hear no questions. Thank you again for taking the time today to provide your testimony. Our next two speakers are Barbara Brandom and Wesley Watson, and we'll begin with Barbara Brandom. I'm here, sorry, I had to turn off the fan. Uh, so is this for Barbara Brandon? Okay. Um, my name is Barbara W. Brandon. That's B-A-R-B-A-R-A-W-B-R-A-N-D-O-M. I'm a retired physician, a student of public health and a grandmother. 
I volunteer for Physicians for Social Responsibility, Climate Reality, and other groups that focus on the causes and effects of the climate crisis. I'm going to cut short my prepared comments because a lot of the previous speakers have said very clearly what I believe also that we don't have any time to lose at all. The climate crisis is getting worse all the time and we need to reduce greenhouse gases. Um, okay. However, I can also um, hear some of the statements from the industry and the scientists that we're not paying enough attention to the costs of carbon storage, carbon capture and storage. Some scientists have said that this is not uh, really an effective thing to do. It, by the history of the industry, carbon capture has not worked. And it's not just what's coming out of the flu stack. It's the whole backstory of what's needed to be able to produce that technology and to feed the excess amounts of energy that carbon capture requires. And in Pennsylvania, it's methane that will be doing that. So that's going to just drive fracking further and produce a lot more greenhouse gas emissions. And probably in the end, in that sector in Pennsylvania, the carbon, instituting carbon capture will actually produce more greenhouse gas emissions. I think that we should be listening to scientists who studied this for their entire life. I think this is backwards on the screen, but this person, uh, Mark Z. Jacobson, took the Stanford campus off gas in 2016. They don't even depend on the grid anymore. The renewable energy that prog progress that he developed, and he had a road plan for every single state to do the same thing, to use wind, water, and um, geothermal and solar to provide energy and to store it in geothermal or other things like that so that you don't only have to have batteries to store energy. He's done it, Mark Jacobson has done it, and we should be listening to him because um, burning fossil fuels is not a way for us to survive. Is there anything else for me to add to the previous comments people have made? Well, as a physician, I studied all the effects of PM 2.5 and it's your entire body that is affected negatively by this. Your lungs are affected ne negatively by ozone. And once the injury is there, there's nothing you can do to reverse it. People will just be getting sicker the rest of their lives. Of course, we don't want that to happen. And so I think that everything that we can do to move away from fossil fuels, especially this ruling by the EPA, that should be instituted faster and to cover more gas burning, uh, fossil fuel burning energy generators should definitely go forward. So thank you very much for this opportunity and I will submit some comments in written form later. That's enough well, from me. Thank, thank you for your testimony there. Are there any questions for the panel? No questions, thank you. No questions, thank you. Thank you again for taking the time today to uh, provide your testimony. Our next speaker is Wesley Watson. Hello, I'm Wesley Watson. Wesley, W-E-S-L-E-Y, Watson, W-A-T-S-O-N. I'm the West Michigan Regional Coordinator for the Michigan League of Conservation Voters. I'm here today to say that with the new proposed standards, um, while the rule will help reduce greenhouse emissions, the rule doesn't go far enough to achieve President Biden's own goal of reaching 100% clean electrification generation by 2035. We need to we need a rule that goes further and beyond that. We need to make sure that we're holding polluters accountable and we're holding the polluters accountable for polluting our community and for polluting our air. Speaking from the public health standpoint, we have to center the social determinants of health in every single policy and every single rule. It is extremely outrageous that we put profit before people. We have to understand communities of color see the brunt of this pollution. Last week and over the last few weeks, we have seen communities that have been impacted by the wildfires in Canada. And the reality, some communities of color see that impact on a daily basis. Here in Michigan, in the 49507 zip code in Southeast Grand Rapids, in the 48217 zip code in Southwest Detroit, and in the 49007 zip code on the north side of Kalamazoo, has some of the highest air pollution areas in the whole state. Also in the 49 zip code, it has the highest number of children be it, being diagnosed with asthma. The 
49407 zip code in West Michigan has the second highest number of children being diagnosed with asthma. Predominantly, these communities are BIPOC communities and primarily low-income communities. We have to center public health and center the health and the impact that we see within these rulings and in these standards. We must go bold and big when it comes to having climate standards and when it comes to the different policies we set forward. We also have to understand that energy and clean energy is the future. And we also have to understand renewable energy and solar is the future uh, for our country and for our communities. We also have to make sure that we're going beyond putting businesses in front of the people. And we also have to center the impact of legacy pollution that is in, a, in effect in our communities. Legacy pollution, it has crippled generations of people. With this ruling, with this standard, it was a good first step to address the legacy pollutions that we have in our community to provide a better future for our all for all of our communities. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Are there any questions from the panel? All right, hearing none. Thank you again for taking the time for your day to provide that testimony. Our next speaker is Margaret Mahoney. Hello, can you hear me okay? <clears throat> yes, we can. Great. My name is Margaret Mahoney, M-A-R-G-A-R-E-T, Mahoney, M-A-H-O-N-E-Y. I live in the South Hills of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in Allegheny County, and I'm a mom of four. We live about 11 miles from U.S. Steel Clarendon Coke Works or Clarendon Mills Works. It's a gas-fired power plant. <clears throat> we have many days with unfavorable, unfavorable air quality index. In 2021, U.S. Steel Clarendon Coke Works was the highest polluter in Allegheny County. I support the EPA's proposed regulations on carbon pollution, pollutions, <coughs> excuse me, standards on fossil fuel-fired power plants. Last September, I started suffering from tension and migraine headaches, including visual disturbances. I've tried to find patterns in my diet, my exercise, sleep, caffeine, hormonal fluctuations, and many other factors, and I'm not finding a clear cause for these headaches. In this spring, I began to wonder about the air quality index. At times, I can smell something bad in the air near my home. I can't describe it very well to you all, but it smells like chemicals. <clears throat> And it tingles in my nose sometimes and sometimes into my throat. And when I drive over towards closer to Clarendon, it actually starts to burn my eyes and um, it, the, the smell increases. And that actually sometimes then leads to a headache. So I can't say with certainty, my doctor can't say with certainty uh, whether or not there's a connection, but it really makes me frustrated that I have to wonder about it. And I have to wonder about whether or not this is a cause, whether or not the house that I chose to buy for my family and my kids um, was a bad choice. And it makes me worried about their future as well. And <clears throat> I think that it also makes me even more angry that we have data to prove that air quality and particulate matter certainly affects those living with asthma and those with other health complications. We know that in Clarendon, where US Steel is located, there is a three times higher asthma rate than in the rest of the country. It is completely unfair that citizens have to factor in the location of carbon and particulate emitting power plants when choosing where to live. And it's even more unfair that citizens most affected often don't have the choice or opportunity to move. I would also question where, where they can actually move to if we continue down this road. I welcome and applaud this proposal to reduce the emissions of carbon dioxide, particulate matter, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxide, and other harmful pollutants from coal and natural gas fired power plants. All of us have the right to, to breathe clean air and to live without having to factor in air quality as a cause for our health problems. I would like the EPA to consider expanding this rule to cover all power plants and to accelerate the timeline. My migraines have been life-changing, and I cannot imagine the hardship that those with asthma, cancer, and other debilitating conditions face any day when we in this county and across the country shift into an orange or red air alert, which is becoming more and more frequent. It's definitely more frequent than this fair. Those struggling to breathe do not have to wait, and I thank you for this opportunity to speak, to comment on the proposal, and for considering this adoption. Have a good day. Thank you for your testimony. Are there any questions from the panel? No questions. Thank you for your testimony. 
No questions. Thank you. Thank you again for taking time out of your day to provide your testimony. Uh, our next two speakers are from our wait list, uh, Daniel Chu and Sasha Tenenbaum. And we'll begin with Daniel. Hi, can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can. Good afternoon. My name is Daniel Chu, D-A-N-I-E-L-C-H-U. I am the energy planner with the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance, or NIJA, founded in 1991. NIJA is a nonprofit citywide membership network linking grassroots organizations from low-income neighborhoods and communities of color in their struggle for environmental justice. NIJA is a member of the Climate Justice Alliance based in D.C. and also a member of the Peak Coalition, which includes UPROS, the Point CDC, New York Lawyers for the Public Interest, and Clean Energy Group. The coalition is the first comprehensive effort in the United States to reduce the negative and racially disproportionate health impacts excuse me, of a city's peaker plants by replacing them with renewable energy and storage solutions. While it is encouraging for us to see EPA issuing new proposed power plant pollution rules, NIJA, Peak Coalition, and the Climate Justice Alliance are all gravely concerned about the environmental justice implications of these new rules. EPA's approach to establishing pollution standards based on technology such as carbon capture and sequestration or storage, low greenhouse gas hygiene and co-firing, and natural gas co-firing is counterproductive to reducing emissions and protecting the environment. Achieving an emissions-free power sector must not be done in a matter that continues to disproportionately burden fossil fuel generation facilities um, have on environmental justice communities. Unproven solutions like hydrogen combustion or carbon capture are detrimental to the environmental justice goals set out by the Biden administration and divert necessary funding away from renewable energy and battery storage development that would truly lower emissions. These false solutions have limited efficacy and dangerous consequences, especially as these technologies cannot prevent and could increase co-pollutant emissions and fine particulates. In New York, for example, a pilot project conducted by the New York Power Authority for greenhouse gas co-firing has already found a significant increase in NOx emissions despite limited operating hours and low levels of hydrogen blending. Additionally, EPA's failure to propose more stringent standards for inefficient power plants that run on times of peak demand will be disastrous for environmental justice communities. Peaker power plants are costlier and emit higher rates of emissions than most baseload and intermediate power generating facilities. The public health ramifications of these giving peaker plants more leeway to pollute are unacceptable for low-income and people of color communities where these plants are typically cited. Instead, EPA should rely on proven solutions such as battery co siting or other non-combustion alternatives to reduce power plant emissions before a full and just transition of renewable energy and energy storage is achieved. Finally, allowing power plants to pollute by promising emissions reductions beyond 2030 is dangerous and environmentally unsound. The IPCC has stated that global emissions have to peak by 2025 in order to avert critical climate disasters at home and abroad. States like New York and New Jersey have climate mandates to achieve zero emissions. That means no carbon dioxide and no co-pollutant emissions within the next two decades. These EPA rules may undermine the strong momentum in states like New York and New Jersey that is already investing in renewable energy generation and energy storage. Moving up the compliance deadline to 2030, for uh, existing power plants and implementing an immediate emissions reduction mandate for new fossil fuel fire power plants is essential to protect the environment and public health for communities near power plants. We urge the EPA to revise the proposed power plant rules so that it aligns with the administration's commitment to environmental justice. The opportunity is now to conduct a just transition by properly regulating emissions from the power sector while investing in renewables and storage solutions that align with the needs and prioritize the health of our climate and communities. Uh, we plan to submit on comments to further clarify our concerns and suggestions regarding these proposed rules. And thank you for the opportunity to testify. And thank you for taking the time this afternoon to provide your testimony. Are there any questions from the panel? Thank you again. Have, have, have a rest, great rest of your day. Our next speaker is Sasha Tenenbaum. This to work. Can't get this to work. Okay. Hi there. Can you hear me? We Sorry. Can hear you. Yes, we yes we can. Yes we can. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thank you for inviting me to speak today at your hearing on the new carbon pollution standards. I'm so delighted to have this opportunity to testify. My name is Sasha Tenenbaum, and I am the senior manager for media and public engagement at Mom's Clean Air Force. I live in Washington D.C. with my family. Moms Clean Air Force is a national organization of over a million and a half mothers like me, fathers, and caregivers, all united to protect our children's health and well-being by making sure that our rules, 
and laws governing clean air, toxic chemicals, and the climate are as strong as they can be. So I strongly support EPA's proposal to limit carbon emissions from fossil fuel power plants, which are responsible for almost one quarter of the climate pollution generated in this country. And I'm calling on the EPA to finalize the strongest possible standards as quickly as possible to help protect families like mine from harmful air pollution that contributes to climate change and impacts health. At the same time, EPA must strengthen community inputs and safeguards in the final version of this rule. This is not my first time asking the agency to cut carbon pollution. It was almost nine years ago in uh, July 29th of 2014 that I first testified before the agency in favor of cutting carbon pollution from the power sector. A lot has changed in nine years. There's so much more carbon in our atmosphere. The relentless release of carbon from smokestacks has had real life consequences, all of which remind us what is at stake if we don't limit our pollution. On a personal level, my family has since added a second child to our brood. We lost a beloved grandmother who overcame being displaced by Superstorm Sandy at the age of 98, an example of resilience and recovery in the face of climate calamity. With two, two children now, I am doubly invested in the future, mine, theirs, and ours. But I must say it's getting hard out there for a mom. Where I live, the people and places I love are all impacted. No one is safe because climate impacts everyone and everything. One week ago, I got a lung full of climate change. I could feel, breathe, and taste the bad air caused by the raging Canadian wildfires, all 400 of them, with 100 burning out of control at the time of writing this testimony. Family life changed pretty abruptly. School recess, canceled. Bike to school day, canceled. Swim lesson, canceled. Trash collection, canceled. Parking enforcement, Canceled, but okay, we'll take that. But in all seriousness, our family strapped on masks for three days in a row as we stepped outside, praying that this would be the last air quality emergency, but fearing that it would surely happen again. We know better. We have parents in Oregon who regularly pack bags in the event that forest fires chase them out of their home. They can spend days on high alert. This is our collective new normal, but we need not be resigned to it. We can summon the courage to act as if our home is on fire because it is. Just this past week, top scientists ran a health check on the earth. To be exact, it was 40 international scientists who assessed the planet's capacity to provide a safe future. They published their results in the well-known journal Nature. It wasn't pretty, the planet's health on which our civilization depends is in peril. So it's precisely why I ask you, let's not let another nine years go by. Every decision counts, every fraction of a degree counts, and every deadline, surely it, it, it counts. So in summary, I support EPA's proposal to limit carbon emissions from fossil fuel power plants. And I ask that the EPA finalize these standards as quickly as possible. I wanna thank you all for um, listening to my testimony. Thanks so much for your time today. Mm -hmm. And thank you for taking the time to provide this testimony. Are there any questions from the panel? Good questions. Thank you. Thank you again. Um, again, um, my name is David Cuzzy. I'm the Deputy Director of the Sector Policy Programs Division in EPA's Office of Air Quality Plans, Air Quality Plan and Standards in the Office of Air and Radiation. And I've been chairing this hearing session. I want to thank my fellow panelists, Sarah Benish and Brian Fisher, everyone who offered testimony today, and everyone who took time out of their schedules to listen to today's hearing on EPA's proposed greenhouse gas standards and guidelines for fossil fuel fired power plants. As a reminder, you can submit written comments on this proposal through August 8th. We will now take a recess, and the next session will begin at 5 p.m. Eastern Time.
Good evening, and welcome to the public hearing for EPA's proposed greenhouse gas GHG standards and guidelines for fossil fuel fired power plants. My name is Kevin Culligan, and I am the Senior Policy Director in EPA's Office of Air Quality Planning and Standards. I will be chairing the session of the virtual public hearing tonight. During today's hearing, we will be hearing we will we will be taking comment on EPA's proposed GHG standards and guidelines for fossil fuel fired power plants. EPA is proposing clean air act emission limits and guidelines for carbon dioxide from fossil fuel fired power plants based on cost effective and available control technologies. The proposals would set limits for new gas fired combustion turbines, existing coal and oil, existing coal, oil and gas fired steam generating units and certain existing gas fired combustion turbines. I'd now like to invite my other two uh, co-panelists to introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Lisa Thompson. I'm a rule writer in EPA's Office of Air Quality Planning and Standards. Hi, my name is Justine Hudeman. I'm a policy analyst in EPA's Office of Atmospheric Protection. Thank you both. We are also joined today by a court reporter who will produce a written transcript of today's hearing. We will add the transcript to the public docket for this proposed rulemaking and will carefully consider your comments as we develop a final rule. Before we begin hearing from you this evening, we have a few ground rules and housekeeping items to keep uh, to review to help make today's uh, hearing run smoothly. First, EPA is committed to an environment of mutual respect and safety. We want to hear your views on the proposed rule today. However, the agency will not tolerate harassment, discrimination, intimidation, inappropriate language and images, or sustained disruption of the public hearing. EPA expects everyone participating in this hearing, including registered speakers, attendees, and those of us on this panel to conduct themselves in a respectful and civil manner. We will monitor and moderate this virtual event to ensure that common standards of decency are upheld. Please note that by registering for this event, you are agreeing to abide by these ground rules of the, of the virtual hearing. Please remain muted with your camera off until it is your turn to speak. We ask that everyone's displayed Zoom name include their first and last names. This will help our logistics team quickly identify when registered speakers have arrived so that we can quickly add them to the lineup of speakers. I wanna move on to how today's hearing will work. If you have joined us through Zoom, please keep the chat box open. It is at the bottom of your screen. We will put the names of the next speakers in the chat box. We also may use the chat box to communicate directly with you during the hearing. I will call on each speaker when it is their turn, and let me apologize in advance for any mispr mispronunciations. When I call on you to speak, please unmute your line. If you're joining us via Zoom, that button is on the lower left of your screen. If you're joining us by a phone, you can mute and unmute yourself by pressing star six. When it is your turn to speak, please state your first and last name and spell it for the record. Please speak slowly so that our court reporter can capture your entire testimony. When you are providing testimony, you are welcome to activate your video camera by clicking on the start video icon at the bottom left of your screen. If you're not testifying, please keep your camera off. Each speaker will have four minutes to give comments. A four minute timer will be displayed on the screen to help you keep track of your time. The timer will stop, start when you state, state your name. When your four minutes are up, it is time to stop. And, and please remember that if you don't get to say everything you wanted to say in that four minutes, um, you can also submit written comments and they will receive just as much weight. If you're testifying by phone, the timekeeper will alert when you when you have one minute remaining. To be fair to everyone, we are going to strictly enforce the four minute limit. If you have additional items you would like to add, you would like to share such as slide presentations or videos, you may submit them to the docket for the proposal through uh, August 8th, which Lisa, correct me if I'm wrong, is now later than August 8th. No, August 8th is correct. We okay. just announced yesterday. Okay. In August 8th. Okay. Yes. Okay. I, I apologize. Thank you, Lisa. All right. We encourage you to also submit a written comment of the testimony you provide today. We'll post information on how to submit written comments in the chat box throughout the hearing. We are here to listen to you today. However, panel members may ask questions to clarify your comments. When you're finished speaking, Please remain on the line until I can confirm that there are no further clar clarifying questions from our panel. Once we are done, please remute your line and turn off your camera. I will then call the next speaker and so on. Finally, 
If there are no additional speakers, we may close a, close a session 15 minutes after the last registered speaker has testified. We may also take short breaks as needed. Thank you again for taking the time to share your comments on EPA's proposed proposal. And with that, let me switch out of the testimony and... Uh, Okay, so our first two speakers are Tracy Siketa and Emily Pickett. So Tracy, you can go first, thank you. Good evening, thank you. My name is Tracy Sabetta, T-R-A-C-Y-S-A-B-E-T-T-A, -T 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 and I'm the Ohio State Coordinator for Moms Clean Air Force. On behalf of our 90,000 members in Ohio, we strongly support the EPA's proposal to limit carbon emissions from fossil fuel power plants and ask that EPA finalize these standards quickly as possible. Fossil fuel power plants are responsible for almost one quarter of the climate pollution generated by the US. The proposed rules would hold these power plants accountable for the climate warming pollution being emitted, reducing total carbon emissions by 617 million metric tons through 2042. That's the equivalent to the annual emissions from 137 million passenger vehicles, roughly half the cars in the U.S. The rules will also cut tens of thousands of tons of particulate matter or soot, sulfur dioxide, and ozone-forming nitrogen oxide. The 2023 American Lung Association State of the Air Report finds that eight of Ohio's 10 most populated counties received grades of either D or F for ozone pollution. There are currently 152,000 children in Ohio who fight asthma every day. We need to be doing everything within our power to improve air quality and protect the health of our families. Yet in Ohio, we are simply not doing it. While about 20% of electricity in the U.S. comes from renewable sources, Ohio, by contrast, gets only 3% of our energy from renewables. According to the U.S. Energy Information Administration, this puts us in 40th place out of 50 states for clean energy generation and gives us a ranking of fifth in the nation for total carbon emissions. We are passing state policies that create obstacles to carbon reduction, and we're not seeing air quality improvements at the same rate as others in our region. In fact, we're already feeling the impact of this inaction. According to the Bird Polar and Climate Research Center at The Ohio State University, one severe climate impact currently being seen in Ohio is a rise in overnight temperatures. Records for overnight temperatures were recently broken in four major Ohio cities, with Toledo, Akron, Mansfield, and Findlay setting records for average minimum summer temperatures. In 2022, Columbus had nearly 20 days of summer where the temperature hit or exceeded 90 degrees, reflecting many nights when morning readings didn't drop below the low 70s. These blazing temperatures bring with them a stark impact on cooling systems, electric bills, and people's health, specifically in front cut line communities across the state. Now add the power outages experienced by many in central Ohio into the mix and you have a climate change recipe for disaster. Our state has failed us in enacting clean energy and climate legislation. States like Ohio will benefit greatly from the protections in the proposed power plant rules. We do believe that EPA must strengthen community input and safeguards in the final version of this rule, but the significant emissions reductions proposed will go a long way toward protecting our families from harmful air pollution that contributes to climate change and impacts health. Once again, on behalf of the members of Moms Clean Air Force in Ohio, we support the proposed carbon rule and are counting on the EPA to finalize the strongest possible standards. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for your testimony. And Lisa or Justine, do you have any follow-up questions? All right. I think Emily, it's, it's your turn. Hi, my name is Emily Pickett, E-M-I-L-Y-P-I-C-K-E-T-T. -T. And thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I'm the Florida State Coordinator for Moms Clean Air Force. I live in Tampa, Florida, and I'm calling on the EPA to finalize the strongest possible standards to help protect our families from harmful air pollution that contributes to climate change and impacts health. EPA must strengthen community input and safeguards in the final version of this rule. Power plants are responsible for roughly a quarter of climate pollution in the US and my home state of Florida is a significant contributor as the second largest producer of electricity in the country after Texas. Rather than using clean energy, Florida still relies predominantly on natural gas, which fuels about 74% of our state's total electricity. Because climate change is driven by dream greenhouse gas emissions from the fossil fuel industry, my state's heavy reliance on natural gas for electricity is extremely troublesome to me. It's troublesome because I fear 
clear we're on a path, a destructive path due to the magnitude of our climate impacts. Florida is the fastest growing state with more people moving here than any other state. As more and more people move to Florida, I fear an ever increasing reliance on fossil fuels to power our homes. I fear the natural beauty of our state is being destroyed to make room for sprawling neighborhoods that are taking over our once rural ecosystems. I fear that new roads to accommodate these new neighborhoods will result in increased car and truck emissions. I worry that we aren't taking advantage of clean energy like solar enough. Given that we're the sunshine state, renewable energy like solar should comprise more than just 8% of our electricity generation. Placing my future concerns aside, there is much to worry about in the present. Journalists and environmentalists agree that Florida is at ground zero for climate change and sea level rise. We are already experiencing the negative effects. High tides, hurricanes, and increased rainfall result in flooding across our state, both in coastal and inland areas. Temperatures are increasing as we experience record hot temperatures, making it nearly impossible to be outside for long and requiring us to run our air conditioners more, another example of our growing reliance on fossil fuels. Our current situation is dire and the impacts of the state's growth will only make things worse. Further exacerbating the situation is the fact that the state has ignored projects that encourage renewable energy, building efficiency, and any other method for cutting emissions. Instead, Florida is focused on sea level rise resilience, which, though critically important, fails to address the enormity of our climate troubles. We are in a pivotal moment in which we must get on the right path toward reducing carbon pollution to protect public health and the beauty of our state. As a Floridian, I know that a just transition to renewable energy is achievable. We can create a cleaner, healthier environment by adding renewable energy sources and improving energy efficiency in our homes and businesses. And by looking at the totality of our state's climate crisis, instead of focusing only on the moment's most pressing issue, and by putting the proposed carbon rule in place. Therefore, I'm calling on the EPA to finalize the strongest possible standards to help protect the state of Florida and families across the country from harmful air pollution that contributes to climate change and impacts health. EPA must strengthen community input and safeguards in the final version of this rule. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you very much. And do uh, we have any follow-up questions from Lisa or Justine? Justine? Okay. So moving on to our next two speakers, and our next two speakers are uh, Ali Simpson and Brian Harris. So Ali, it looks like you are ready to go. Great, thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity to give testimony today. My name is Ali Simpson, A-L-I-S-I-M-P-S-O-N. I'm a national field manager with Moms Clean Air Force, an organization of over 1.5 million parents and caregivers advocating for clean air and a healthy climate on behalf of children nationwide. I live in Bedford, New York with my wife and young son. I'm here to speak today in support of the carbon rule, and I'm calling on EPA to finalize the strongest possible standards to help protect our families from harmful air pollution that contributes to climate change and impacts health. EPA must strengthen community input and safeguards in the final version of the rule. The most recent IPCC report has found that we are likely to pass a dangerous temperature threshold within the next 10 years, pushing the planet past the point of catastrophic warning, warming unless nations drastically transform their economies and immediately transition away from fossil fuels. In 10 years, my son will be 12 years old. I know that I'll be able to look him in the eye and say that I did everything I could to keep our planet safe. What I don't know is whether it will have been enough. Do we continue to put corporate profits and politics ahead of safeguarding the place billions of people call home? Or did we do everything in our power to right the ship? The choices we make now will have impacts for not just the next 10 years, but the next thousand years and beyond. What could be more important than this? Fossil fuel power plants are responsible for almost one quarter of the climate pollution generated by the US. We know climate change is here now, what we must do to stem the tide of the, cri of the crisis. So let's do it. This rule can make an incredible impact, avoiding up to 617 million metric tons of total carbon dioxide through 2042, the same number as reducing the annual emissions of 137 million passenger vehicles, which is roughly half the cars in the US. Last week, I woke up to an alert on my phone about the poor air quality caused by the Canadian fires to our north. The 
sun was hazy, the sky was hazy, the air was thick, it was eerie, and it was anxiety inducing. I texted my wife to make sure our son wasn't playing outside. For the next two days, trying to explain to a two-year-old why he can't play outside is close to impossible. The look in his eyes, the confusion, the fear, it was horrible. I, I fear that I'm going to need to have this conversation with him over and over again. I don't want that for our future. Climate change has increased the risk of wildfires through warmer temperatures and drier conditions that lengthen wildfire season, increase the chances of a fire starting, and help burn help a burning fire spread. Warmer and drier conditions also contribute to the spread of the mountain pine beetle and other insects that weaken and kill trees, building up the fuel that fuels in the forest. Climate change is here, it's happening now, we must act. In order to protect the health of our communities and reduce greenhouse gas pollution causing dangerous and costly climate change, EPA must enact strong limits on new and existing fossil fuel power plants. Thank you for your work and thank you for your time. Thank you very much for taking the time to comment. And do we have any follow-up questions from Lisa or Justine? Okay, so I think we are gonna move on to Brian now. Hi, hello. Um, my name is Brian Harris, B-R-I-A-N-H-A-R-R-I-S, uh, and I am an organizer with the Institute for Progressive Nevada. And um, I'm thankful that you are all allowing me to testify to and express my strong support for the Biden administration's proposed standards to cut climate pollution from coal and natural gas um, and fi uh, fired power plants. The EPA's proposal is critically important step forward and I encourage the agency to achieve greater cuts to pollution from more sources on the fastest possible timelines in recognition of threats of climate change. Um, the, uh, the administration must also take action for the community's protections and input, including rigorous monitoring, verification and enforcement and engagement with communities, both on safeguards and individual projects. Um, I've been in Nevada for about four and a half, going on five years now. And I also, um, I live here with my wife and my three-year-old son. And I really just feel like um, climate change has really impacted the state um, as a whole. I feel like the wildfires in the north and um, the things that uh, were happening in the south, like the drying up of Lake Mead, have really impacted um, life here for Nevadans and for future generations to come. Um, as we know, fossil fuel power plants are one of the largest sources of carbon pollution driving climate change, and climate change leads to poor air quality, further exacerbating negative health outcomes like respiratory disease, heart disease, and other illnesses caused by toxic air pollution from power plants and other sources. Climate change is also driving more frequent and intense extreme weather events, from hurricanes to heat waves to wildfires and flooding. Communities across the country are experiencing the impacts of climate crisis firsthand, and our climate can't wait. Um, I'd like to thank you all for hearing my testimony and I yield the rest of my time. Enjoy the rest of your day, y'all. Well, thank you very much for taking the time to testify. And do we have any questions? Okay, then we will be moving on to our next two speakers and they are Sandy Barr and Joel Charles. And I think Sandy will be going first. Thank you. I um, appreciate the opportunity to speak this afternoon. My name is Sandy Barr, that's S-A-N-D-Y, B as in boy, A-H-R. And I'm the director for Sierra Club's Grand Canyon chapter, which is the Arizona chapter. And I use she, her pronouns. I've lived in Arizona most of my life and have seen the effects of climate change firsthand. And as is frequently the case, these climate impacts, more extreme heat, intensive drought and poor air quality disproportionately affect indigenous communities and people of color in our state. And that's among the many reasons for us to move as rapidly as possible away from burning fossil fuels, including to generate electricity. And why this proposed rule is so important. This carbon rule provides another tool, along with the provisions in the Inflation Reduction Act and rules on transportation, as well as methane, to put us on a path for a safe and habitable planet. According to the Energy Information Administration, last year, 54% of Arizona's total electricity 
net generation came from coal and gas. Here in the sunniest state in the United States, we are still getting most of our electricity from fossil fuels. One thing that is hindering a more rapid adoption of renewable energy, including solar, is the lack of federal carbon emissions standards for existing coal and gas plants. Having no limits is like a giant subsidy for these plants and it results in their prolonged operation. Current limits for new plants have been weak, achieving little in the way of greenhouse gas reductions, which is, which is uh, in part why we see utilities continue to double down on gas. The proposed rule, especially if it is strengthened to better limit climate pollution from the peaker gas plants and those that do not run as baseload, will help reduce greenhouse gas emissions, improve public health, and accelerate our transition to clean energy. According to the information that you provided on, on these proposed rules, they'll help to avoid more than 600 million metric tons of carbon pollution and will result in significant improvements in air quality, plus prevent 1,300 mature, premature deaths. Imagine what they could do if you strengthen them. Imagine how many more lives could be saved, asthma attacks avoided, and how many kids could breathe a little easier, literally, and also knowing that the country is on a path to better address the climate crisis. Please move forward with the strongest possible rule to limit climate harm, harm at pollution, pollution from power plants. Thank you. Thank you very much for taking the time to testify today. And do you have any follow-up questions? Go ahead, when you're, when you're ready, Joel. Hi, thanks uh, all of you for your hard work to protect Americans. Uh, my name is Joel Charles, that's J-O-E-L-C-H-A-R-L-E-S. I speak today to protect my patients as a rural family doc from Wisconsin. I speak as a father on behalf of my children. I speak as a leader on behalf of Healthy Climate Wisconsin and our over 600 health professionals committed to building a healthier Wisconsin for all. I urge the EPA to pass the strongest possible pollution safeguards on power plants. I grew up in a low income neighborhood breathing pollution from Green Bay's Pulliam coal plant. I and my siblings have asthma. Now, as a rural family doc, every day I see my patients suffer from fossil fuel air pollution. As you know, fossil fuel combustion from power plants is deeply harmful to health. As you also know, that harm is unjustly borne by the poor and people of color. As a doctor, what I know is what that harm does to people's lives. What I know is that we need to do better. Students of the Clean Air Act know it is among the most successful public health policies in U.S. history. That history shows that when better technology is available, mandating its use is nearly always more beneficial than anticipated. Precedent also shows industry routinely overestimates the logistical challenges, negative impact, and cost of transition. It's almost always easier, quicker, cheaper, and more beneficial than expected to transition. Frankly, given that well-established precedent, the EPA should discount what is said by those who urge delay. I recommend the EPA require power plants to reduce their emissions more quickly than what was proposed. I recommend the EPA apply the pollution safeguards to a wider number of gas plants than what was proposed. Finally, I recommend the EPA implement a method to ensure communities have input on how the pollution safeguards are implemented at specific power plants. Today, you've heard the number of lives these rules would save, the number of asthma and heart attacks they would prevent. But when you do the work I do, you know those numbers really mean something because you see the individual people in front of you every day. The recurring question with the Clean Air Act is this, is the air clean enough? If you're a parent or a health professional who has ever watched a child have an asthma attack, and if you know that the utilities now have the technology to clean our grid up while saving consumers money, the answer is no, the air is not clean enough. The answer is that we have to do more and the faster, the better. I don't fault utilities for looking out for their bottom line, but from where I sit, as a former kid with asthma in a poor neighborhood polluted by power plants, as a father concerned about the world I leave my children, as a doctor who takes care of kids suffering from asthma, 
I find the argument for delay not only lacking in evidence, but frankly, morally insufficient. I urge the EPA to adopt stronger safeguards than what was proposed and implement them sooner than was proposed. Thank you again for doing this work. Thank you very much for taking the time to testify. And if you or your organization are going to submit any additional written comments um, and you want to elaborate on the point you made about um, the uh, community participation and, and you know kind of what you think that means, um, that would certainly be be helpful. Um, Absolutely. Do you have any other questions? No. All right. Um, I think then we will be moving on to our next two speakers who are Daniel Shoemaker or Schumacher and Carolina 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 uh, Pina Alacron Alacron probably managed to butcher two names at once and neither of them are even that challenging so I apologize. Go ahead, Daniel. Thank you. My name is Daniel Schoonmaker. D A N I E L S C H. O O N M A K E R. And I have been the executive director of Michigan Salem Business Forum for the past 10 years. Our organization works with businesses and institutions in Michigan to advance climate leadership, social justice, and the creation of a circular economy. We are based in Grand Rapids and have approximately 500 members around the state representing a cross section of the business community. We work alongside businesses and utilities and support a responsible and just transition with the understanding of the practical limits of industry, technology, and the economy. I want to emphasize that we are not adversaries to the utilities in our state. We consider them important collaborators in the promotion of sustainable business and key partners in our state's My Healthy Climate Plan, which seeks to decarbonize our state's economy by 2050. In fact, the utilities were close partners in the creation of that, of that plan, and our state's electric, electricity providers have announced their own decarbonization plans that align with those goals, including an intention to shutter virtually all coal, coal fired power plants in the near future. Further, we believe the business, community, the business community is supportive of decarbonization and celebrate how enthusiastically industry in our state has embraced the need, announcing their own reduction goals. The state's energy portfolio is the largest factor and whether businesses and municipalities are able to meet their emissions reduction goals. It is with this in mind that I am here today to express my strong support for the Biden administration's proposed standards to cut climate pollution from coal and natural gas fired power plants. These new standards are critical to ensure that the investments being made in Michigan do not put our state at a competitive disadvantage and ensure accountability for greenhouse gas reduction commitments. We celebrate the flexibility and patience the administrator has demonstrated with these new standards, which will reward best practices and companies that are already working to meet the sustainability expectations of their investors and stakeholders. This is the right move at the right time for our state's economy. Thank you for the opportunity to testify this evening. Thank you very much for taking the time to testify. And Lisa or Justine, do you have any follow-up questions? Okay, then we will move on to uh, Carolina. Wonderful, thank you for all you do. Thanks. Hi, good afternoon. Um, thank you for the opportunity to allow me to speak today. I'm Carolina Peña, C-A-R-O-L-I-N-A, P-E-N-A, hyphenated my last name is A-L-R-C-O-N. I'm the manager of Ecomadres, the Latino engagement program of Moms Clean Air Force. We're a community of over 1.5 million moms, dads, and caregivers nationwide united to protect the children from air pollution and climate change. I'm Bolivian and I live in Arlington, Virginia. We're first seeing a global systematic health emergency associated with the generation and use of energy from the fossil fuel industry, which is causing natural disaster to triple in the last 50 years, causing more frequent and intense extreme weather events that we have ever been able to see as well is jeopardizing our basic common bond that everybody shared, which is the need for clean, for clean air breathe. So as a Latina and as an outdoor enthusiast, I'm very concerned about the temperatures and the heat waves that are expected to increase in intensity and also the frequency, not just in the United States, but around the world. Because of climate change, 
doesn't respect borders. And we have seen that. Living in Arlington, we've seen the wildfires that happen in Canada is impacting us here uh, down in the United States. So as another early season heat wave hammers the US in the Northwest with experts predicting more and more for the summer to come, it is increasingly vital to understand how high temperatures affect our bodies and brains, and more importantly, how we can protect ourselves and others. Heat has a limit to which the human body can adapt, and even the hottest weather will affect livelihoods that involve significant outdoor physical activity, such as the agriculture and construction work. Farm workers are up to 35 times more likely than other workers to die from the extreme heat that has crippled much of the US. And air quality decline as climate change accelerates, but both share a common solution. It is the time to require fossil fuel power plants to drive down the air emissions with the most stringent requirements. The good news is that we have abundant sources of clean and sustainable energy like wind and solar. So today, more than ever, we must unite and address the root of the climate crisis so that we not only solve the climate disaster, but the damage caused to our health, including honoring the health of high-risk workers as we are also protecting the food supply chain. Once again, and support the carbon roll and call for EPA to strengthen the community input and say words the final version of this role. It is time to stop allowing the fossil fuel industry to dictate our destiny. Let's come together to build a better world for everybody because everybody has the right to breathe clean air. So thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you very much. And this is probably an unnecessary clarification because I'm sure our court reporter is better than me and got it. But um, you mentioned the part of Clean Air Task uh, Clean Air Clean Moms for Clean Air Task Force. Moms it's, Clean Air Force. Uh -huh. And but the, the, you mentioned the part you were the you were leading a uh, leader of. There, was there another name after that? Eco Madres. Yeah. Do you mind yeah. spelling that? Do you mind just spelling that just to make sure that our court reporter gets it right? She probably or, she already, probably already has, but just in case. Do, do you mind spelling it? Just so we get it right on the record, just in case. Uh, yes. Ecomadres. Uh, mm -hmm. just, okay. It's E-C-O-M-A-D-R-E-S. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. Um, and our next two... Oh, pardon me. I'm sorry. Lisa or Justine, did you have any follow-up questions? No. Okay, um, so our next two speakers are Lisa Patel and Sanford Leuba. Hi, uh, my name is Dr. Lisa Patel. I am a pediatrician and executive director for the Medical Society Consortium on Climate and Health, which represents 700,000 physicians around the country. I'd like to thank the EPA for proposing standards to limit carbon pollution from power plants. I'd also urge you to strengthen the rule to ensure we are best protecting health and promoting equity. We need no more stark reminder of the stakes than the Canadian wildfires that have made the air hazardous to breathe for millions of Americans across the eastern U.S. Living in California reminded me of our ter terrible wildfire season in 2020. I'm a pediatric hospitalist and I walked into our NICU where I practice and the black plumes of smoke outside were so overwhelming our NICU reeked of it. We had several tiny premature infants there breathing in that foul pollution. During those weeks, I had to counsel many more pregnant women who came in preterm birth, an outcome we know is linked to exposure to wildfire smoke, and what to expect during their delivery. The possibility that I might have to put a breathing tube down their infant's throat or do CPR if they're born without a heartbeat. Power plants emit 25% of carbon pollution that is responsible for climate change that is driving events like worsening wildfires. As a pediatrician, I worry particularly about infants, children, pregnant individuals, in addition to the elderly, those with chronic medical conditions and outdoor workers who are more susceptible to the harms of extreme events like heat and wildfires. We know that the pollution, both from fossil fuel burned by power plants and from worsening pollution from wildfires, will burden communities of color and communities experiencing poverty worse. The EPA's rule is a vital step in curbing carbon pollution, but I encourage the EPA to do more. 
First, I urge the EPA to expand the number of plants that are covered under this proposal to achieve further reductions in pollution. The rule as written only includes larger plants operating more than 50% of the time. This is only about 14% of the fleet. I urge the EPA to expand the rule to include smaller plants that operate 40% of the, the time that could help us cover 80% of fleets and lead to greater emissions reductions. The EPA should also include standards of performance for peaker plants to achieve further reductions. Peaker plants are disproportionately cited in and near communities of color and low-income communities, making this an issue of environmental justice. Second, the EPA needs guardrails on the use of carbon capture, storage, and sequestration, and the burning of hydrogen, both of which carry risks to worsen health outcomes and further burden EJ communities with worsening pollution. Only green hydrogen should be allowed under this rule to ensure methane is not used in the production of hydrogen. For CCS, the EPA should require continuous emissions monitoring, verification, and enforcement at all power plants, and consider additional rules to ensure safe and permanent carbon sequestration and transportation of carbon dioxide. Third, there must be ample opportunity for communities to have full information and be able to inform compliance. We support the EPA's requirement of consultation with affected communities as states develop compliance plans for their existing rules. Finally, I ask that the EPA explicitly require state plans to set legally enforceable milestones for plants that hold operators accountable to show meaningful steps towards either installing the required pollution controls or to retire. The EPA should also push forward the timeline for compliance to maximize emissions reductions. Thank you for the opportunity to provide comment on this important rule to protect public health and promote equity. Thank you very much for your very detailed comments. Very, very, very appreciated. Um, and do Lisa or Justine have any follow-up questions? No. Okay. Um, and then we will move on to our next speaker. Uh, all right. Next, next speaker will be Sanford Luba. Luba. Thanks. Do we have Sanford? Uh, one, one more time, is uh, Sanford Luba here? Okay, um, I think we'll move on to our next two speakers. Um, but Sanford, if you do show up later, um, uh, we, we will try to fit you in um, if you're having computer difficulties. Um, so our next two speakers are Mercedes uh, McKinley and Evan Hansen. Hi, I'm so sorry. Small technical difficulties. Can you hear me? Uh, we, you know, we we jumped ahead, so you were probably not not expecting. Yeah, <laughs> we, we can hear you, so I appreciate you uh, you jumping in. Okay, awesome, no problem. Thank you so much. Sorry, let me. I'm glad I was tuned in. I've been I've been uh, listening and uh, enjoying everyone's testimony. So thank you. Um, my name is Mercedes McKinley, and I'm the state coordinator for Moms Clean Air Force, um, and I'm also a member of Echo Madres. I can't see my shirt, um, but that's our Latino engagement program. And I live in Las Vegas, Nevada. I'm mother of a two-year-old baby girl who hopefully will not wake up from her nap. Um, and I'm also the caregiver for my 78-year-old mother. Um, I support the carbon rule and I'm calling on the EPA to finalize the strongest possible standards to help protect our families from harmful air pollution that contributes to climate change and impacts health. My family and I immigrated from El Salvador, Central America to Las Vegas, Nevada in 1987. We now have three generations that have lived and grown in the city. During these years, we've felt our summers getting hotter and the seasons like spring and fall getting shorter. Extreme heat has become the new normal in Las Vegas and it has in many parts of the Western United States. I find it deeply troubling and concerning. I also worry often about how much hotter it will be in 2033 when my daughter is 12 years old. Will she have fewer days to be outside because of the dangerous air quality or extreme heat alert? Yes, I understand that the climate of this region is naturally hot and dry, 
But when I arrived back home from grad school in 2017, the city had experienced approximately two consecutive weeks with high temperature reached 110 or higher. And I, I have to pause at that because that was very real and I, and I cannot it's just express how, how intense that was. Um, but there was no relief even at night. These temperatures are unbearable and predicted to get worse. Strengthening the carbon rule can help because fossil fuel power plants are responsible for about 25% of the climate pollution generated here in the US. They also emit air pollutants that harm the lungs of our children, our elderly, and everyone else, including animals and plants. It's time to do better. Our health and our ability to breathe fresh air is simply not negotiable. We have a moral responsibility to do all we can that ensure families across the US, regardless of their backgrounds, their politics, or their socioeconomic status, have clean air and a stable climate. Once again, I support the carbon rule and I'm calling on the EPA to finalize the strongest possible standards to help protect our families today and future generations. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for taking the time to comment and do we have any follow-up questions? Okay, then we'll move, move on to our next speaker, uh, Evan Hansen. Hello, my name is Evan Hansen. It's E-V-A-N. H-A-N-S-E-N. -E and for the last five years, I've been a member of the West Virginia House of Delegates in the legislature representing Montegalia County. It's a county in which two coal-fired power plants still operate. I'm the minority chair of the House Committee on Energy and Manufacturing, and I've been actively engaged in debates and committee and on the House floor regarding the need to diversify West Virginia's fuel mix, because uh, West Virginia is, is really the outlier in the country, still generating more than 90% of its electricity from coal. But at the same time, West Virginians, like people across the country, are suffering the consequences of climate change. And we see these impacts here in more intense rain events that cause more frequent flooding, and that sometimes are pretty devastating to communities and in some cases killing people. So I wanna thank EPA for proposing these regulations that'll help reduce greenhouse gas emissions while at the same time allowing coal to continue to be used as a fuel. And particularly important for West Virginia are the portion of these regulations that apply to existing coal-fired power plants. And I've noted that you divide these plants into four categories based on when they'll cease operations, and I think that's good. That makes sense. I see that you're requiring more stringent emissions reductions for plants that will operate for longer periods of time, and I think that makes sense too. And I also see that uh, for those plants that will continue operating for decades into the future, it looks to me like you require the use of CCS, and that makes sense, and that's a good thing. Um, the West Virginia legislature passed two bills in the 2022 session to facilitate the use of CCS. Uh, the first bill was a rules bill for our class six program that hopefully will allow West Virginia to gain privacy in regulating the class six injection wells. And the second bill is a broader bill that wraps around the class six permitting process to address other issues like who owns the pore space who owns the carbon dioxide after it's injected and liability concerns. So after passing those bills, West Virginia is well positioned, in my opinion, to continue as a net energy exporter with the promulgation of these federal regulations as they're written. In fact, I think that the clarity that these regulations finally provide are going to help West Virginia's utilities and our public service commission and our legislature make rational decisions about how to transition to a low carbon future while retaining jobs and in some cases increasing jobs in our state. So thank you for the opportunity to provide comments. We appreciate you taking the, uh, the time to the comments. And do we have any questions? No, all right. So we will move on to, okay, our next speaker is Andrew Hauptman. Yep, that's correct. Um, hi, my name is Andrew Hauptman. Uh, I'm an architect uh, and constructor in Ann Arbor, Michigan. 
Um, uh, I wanted to thank you for the opportunity to testify. Uh, I'm one of the parents with Moms Clean Air Force in Michigan. I want to say that I support the carbon rule and our GPA to adopt the strongest possible standards to reduce emissions from fossil fuel power plants. As a father with a son who has asthma, I support the carbon rule because we know that cutting climate pollution and other forms of air pollution will have a profound benefit for the health of our children and everyone in our community. I do have concerns about this proposal concerning the massive deployment of unproven, untested, unregulated, and potentially dangerous industrial scale tech that may even make climate pollution worse and may harm the communities in which these techs, technologies are cited. Families in Michigan have concerns about rules that result in even greater harm and suffering in communities that have already borne the brunt of our industrial scale pollution from the fossil fuel industry. We have concerns about rules that rely for their effectiveness on unproven at scale tech. As a parent, I support the cleanest and most reliable pathways to ramping down climate emissions. The good news is that we have abundant sources of clean, renewable and sustainable energy like wind and solar. We support the acceleration of these healthy energy sources. It is not the job of EPA to dictate power sources. It is the job of EPA to regulate pollution levels from any source. It is our job as parents to demand clean, renewable energy as the simplest way to cut carbon and methane emissions. Thank you, guys. Appreciate the opportunity. Thank you very much for taking the time to comment. And I am I apparently screwed up my list of who is next. So I am not seeing who is next. Uh, here we go. Apologies. Yeah, it's Jeff Hammerland and Nancy Boxer. Right, thank you very much. <laughs> Hello. Trying to get on the screen here. Okay. My name is Jeff Hammerland, J E F H A M M A R L U N D. And I'm a retired professor of energy and climate policy based in Portland, Oregon. For the past 25 years, I taught graduate courses for two Pacific Northwest based universities and led professional development courses for emerging leaders at the Federal Bonneville Power Administration, many Northwest based electric utilities, and several major regional law firms. Well, I entered academia mid career after I decided I had enough real world experience under my belt to have practical understanding of what I would be teaching. Prior to that, I served on the staff of the US Senate Energy Committee worked in the policy office of the U.S. Department of Energy, and was detailed to the Carter White House for six months to help the president develop his renewable energy policy. Later, I served in senior management positions at Southern California Edison as a senior policy analyst with an electric utility trade association and in executive positions with two major energy policy consulting firms. I may be an old man now, but my experience allows me to recognize just how amazing EPA's public servants have been in updating and refining these standards. I am even more impressed knowing that the Supreme Court has limited EPA's options through its West Virginia decision. I believe the proposed rules offer an excellent starting point in addressing climate emissions, carbon emissions in new and existing plants and existing coal plants. I also do have some suggestions for improvements. First, EPA should expand the scope of the power plants to be covered by the rules. Your own analysis estimates that only 14% of the current fleet of gas plants, reducing just 23% of gas generation, would be covered by the rule when requirements begin in 2035. NRDC's analysis suggests that the current proposal would cover only 7% of all natural gas plants, accounting for under 30% of carbon emissions from gas-fired plants. In either case, this is an awful lot of carbon of carbon emissions left on the table. If EPA chooses to exempt smaller gas-fired plants, it will provide an unintended incentive for power plant owners to shift operations by ramping up their smaller plants to replace the electricity that has been generated by the larger plants. This simply shifts the source of carbon emissions rather than reduces it. What's more, many of these smaller, less frequently run plants are likely to be dirtier, less efficient, and produce greater rates of, air, of other air pollutants like NOx emissions. I expect that many of these smaller plants are located in or near marginalized environmental justice community, communities. 
If the scope of the new rules is, to, is expanded to cover these smaller plants, they will provide co-benefits to these environmental justice communities by allowing them to contend with lower levels of several forms of air pollution in addition to carbon emissions. I'm pleased that EPA is requesting comment on revised thresholds. I've read that the NRDC estimates that lowering the capacity limit to 100 megawatts and reducing the capacity factor from 50% to 40% would cover 84% of 2022 emissions from plants compared to 29% under the concurrent proposal. So for these reasons, I recommend that EPA adopt these more aggressive threshold and capacity factors. Second, I recommend that EPA accelerate the compliance timelines. The proposed rule offers more flexibility and longer lead times than I believe are appropriate. New gas plants would not be required to reduce carbon pollution significantly until 2035, allowing these plants to come online in the meantime without abatement technology. Plants that are still planned can and should take advantage of available modern technology right now. EPA should also move the start date for existing plants from 2035 to 2030, and this will allow climate benefits of technological advances to be implemented sooner. Moreover, the pros rules would allow coal plants to operate without meaningful reductions in their carbon pollution for years, as long as they retire by before 2040. And this timeline I think is inappropriate. Can I ask, can I ask you to wrap up? I apologize. We're trying to make sure that everybody has the same amount of time to talk. Um, okay. but Did I get my time? Okay, finally, I'll just say, I appreciate that the Biden administration places a high priority on environmental justice. And I think it does a really good job in this area. I have some specific suggestions I will include in written comments. I want to close by thanking EPA for its impressive first draft power plants without accountability for their carbon emissions of, 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 for far too long. And at the same time, I recommend the EPA seize this opportunity to strengthen the standards in terms of scope, speed, stringency, right. and safeguards. Right. Thank you. Thank and, you very much. For anyone who, who runs out of time, I just want to assure you all that we, we listen to the written comments just as much as the um, as, as the verbal ones. So, and I apologize. You can tell I'm an old professor, and <laughs> no, no problem. I'm really doing my best. <laughs> okay, no problem. So let's let's move on to Nancy. And like I said, uh, anyone who does not get out in all of their comments, we will definitely uh, consider everything you say in writing too. So, Nancy. Good evening. <clears throat> I'm Nancy Boxer with the Association for Climate Health. Thanks for letting me speak. We applaud this new EPA proposal to reduce emissions from the electric utilities, which give off a quarter of the climate harming gases in our country. We encourage EPA to go even further and cover all fossil fuel power plants. Some may protest there will be job losses and price increases from this proposal. This may be true, yet the result is American capitalism at its finest. Costs will rise most for the worst offenders against the environment. Coal plants will pay to mitigate their continuing assault on the atmosphere. Other fossil fuel plants will too. Their owners will pass these costs on as utility commissions approve rate increases to cover them. Customers will be the ones to bear this and the poor will be sheltered by whatever income sparing protections their local governments offer. Wholesale users will resist higher costs and migrate to cleaner power sources. Gradually, the dirtiest plants will be retired, obsolete, no longer wanted, as they should, with better, more environmentally efficient technologies taking their place. Who is the loser? Not the electric companies who get to pass on their costs, not their shareholders who continue to enjoy a steady return on their investment. Customers may feel a pinch, but will continue to enjoy some of the most affordable energy in the world. Only the providers of the dirtiest fossil fuels, who can and should go the way of buggy whip manufacturers and purveyors of snake oil. Should we care? No, because these entities belong in the cemetery for dead technologies. We will not mourn the shutdowns of the last coal mines in this country nor will we regret tapering off oil and gas, which continue to send huge amounts of methane into the air. They must all go into the junk heaps of history and be replaced by cleaner ways of doing the business of mankind. My state of Pennsylvania is a major emitter of greenhouse gas, and yet Pennsylvanians also want to turn this around. 
We want our grandchildren to live in a world that still harbors glaciers and polar bears, not a desiccated desert where oceans eat away at all our major cities and threaten to drown every island paradise. We are at risk of losing our crazy, amazing lives here on planet Earth. Please, EPA, I urge you to stay the course. Steer us away from the doom that is unfolding. Keep tightening those standards and move the electricity sector towards a cleaner, more responsible future for all. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. And Lisa or Justine, do you have any follow-up questions? Okay, so we're going to move on to our next two speakers who are Keely Moy and Jace Beling Belinga. And uh, go ahead, Keely, when you're ready. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Keely Moy, and I'm a volunteer with Moms Clean Air Force. I'm from San Diego, California, and I support the carbon rule and I'm calling on the EPA to finalize the strongest possible standards to help protect our families from harmful climate warming pollution. As the EPA finalizes this rule, it is imperative that they also strengthen mechanisms for community to input to create equitable protections for communities that have borne the brunt of climate injustice for far too long. We know that power plants are responsible for roughly a quarter of climate pollution in the US. Climate change threatens uh, our health and well being in numerous ways, but what stands out to me is the way that climate warming, warming pollution from a power plant is responsible for increased heat waves and extreme weather. As a lifelong hockey player, Olympic athlete, current hockey coach, and new employee of the Detroit Red Wings and Detroit Tigers, I've seen firsthand how heat waves and extreme weather have impacted the accessibility of hockey and other sports. Hockey has taught me integrity, compassion, discipline, resilience, and so much more, which is why I'm committed to sharing it with younger generations and opening up opportunities for traditionally excluded communities. Unfortunately though, increased heat waves and extreme weather are making hockey rinks substantially more costly and less, less sustainable. Today in California, just an hour of ice time costs roughly between $500 and $600 due to the cost of keeping the rink sufficiently cold in order to play on. And even within the hockey community, this climate impact is felt unequally as our girls programs and I existed in hockey as the sport is becoming more expensive and driving lower income kids and kids of color out of the sport. Additionally, as, co as a coach, I've seen the rise in asthma cases among kids due to climate change. Worse in air quality and changes in seasonal pollen mean more cases of pediatric asthma, more childhood allergies, and more emergency room visits. This affects children's ability to play hockey and other sports and can have a profound impact on a family's quality of life. And yet again, the effects of asthma aren't felt equally as children of color, especially black children, are more likely to live in areas with expected increases of childhood asthma. Uh, and in a 2021 EPA report found that black children are 34% more likely to live in areas with the higher, highest projected uh, increases in childhood asthma due to climate change. Well, I'm currently fashion and livelihood. It also threatens many people's health and lives. With that in mind, I must also express my concerns about industrial scale, scale carbon capture technologies. Without the data, proof, and community support, these technologies we must instead promote entirely clean energy. Please finalize the strongest possible standards and further community input in the final version of this rule to protect us all. Thank you very much, Kili. Um, and I will let you know that you cut out a couple of times. I'm pretty sure that our our able court reporter probably got 95% of what you wanted to say. Um, okay. Certainly the gist of it came across, um, but Fantastic. you may want to consider like submitting your testimony in, you know, just in written form, just to make sure everything gets in. All right. Will do. Thank you. Um, any other questions from the, yeah. okay, great. And we'll move on to Jace. Hello everyone. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to speak. My name is Jace Bylinga. I live in West Michigan in Kalamazoo. 
Um, I'm a professional community organizer for the Michigan League of Conservation Voters. I also serve as the board president of the Kalamazoo Climate Crisis Coalition, which is a coalition with over 40 member organizations dedicating to addressing the climate crisis. <clears throat> um, I'm here to show support for this standard because these regulations will help reduce carbon pollution. This will help clean up our air and importantly, it will help BIPOC and disadvantaged communities who have been experiencing some of the worst impacts of this pollution. Um, I work every day talking to community members in Southwest Michigan about why, what they care about and what is impacting their families. Recently, we've been experiencing lots of wildfire smoke that has traveled in from massive fires out west. We've heard about that today. Um, this has been felt even more by people on the north side of Kalamazoo, which is a community predominantly of Black, Indigenous, and people of color. This neighborhood, uh, in this neighborhood, other industrial facilities continue to pollute and the impacts of, of systemic racism really are rampant. Um, this community suffers from high asthma rates, their eyes burn, it smells like garbage. It's really bad. Um, the hell, I've been to some community presentations um, about the, this pollution and you know, combined with the, the, the wildfire pollution, it's, it's really unbearable. And, and the health department tells these people to stay inside if the air is bothering them and that they should not be experiencing the chronic health impacts that they're obviously suffering from and complaining about. Um, when they complain, they're not listened to. So I'm here to ask you, please listen to community members that are more impacted and disempowered. Please prioritize their concerns because it is so hard for, for them to be heard, especially in processes like these. Um, and so yeah, this is about justice and that is what needs to be at the core of our decision-making process. Otherwise, we're gonna to continue to make the same mistakes again and again. Um, so I'm here to support the rule. And while this rule will help reduce greenhouse gas emissions, it does not go far enough to achieve President Biden's own goals of reaching 100% clean electricity generation by 2035. We need the rule to go further and to regulate all fossil fuel plants Hi there, um, what can you, you still hear me? I'm here. Uh, oh, we've got someone already uh, finishing their, spe their speak. So let's let Jace finish up and we'll go on to our next speaker after that. Okay, so I think I'm unmuted now. So, yeah. so we need the, the rule to go further and regulate all fossil fuel plants the same and eliminate exceptions for dirty part-time peaker plants, which are predominantly located in disadvantaged areas. Um, also, we must move the timeline for implementation up to 2030. Gas plants won't be regulated until 2035, which is unacceptable. Um, thank you so much for your time um, and uh, your continued dedication uh, to protect our communities and the environment. Thank you very much for taking the time to comment today. Um, do we have any follow-up questions? No, okay. So we are going to move on to our next two speakers who are Gina, Pisano and Rob yes. Kugler. So Gina will be going first. Okay, I'm here. All right. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. When okay. you're ready. Right. Thank you for the opportunity to testify to here today. My name is Gina Marie Paisano. I am a member of the Service Employee International Union, that's SEIU, Local 1107. I've been a home care worker for 15 years. Home care workers provide care for the most vulnerable and actually in our country. And our clients' health is even more impacted by the health consequences of the climate change, such as heat, poor air quality control, and the increase in insect-borne diseases. I strongly support the Biden administration proposed standards to cut the climate pollution from uh, cool and natural gas fixed power plants. We need to be switching to more renewable and clean energy. There's no time to waste in adopting this proposal, along with others that are coming down the, the line in, to address the pollution from fossil fuels to address the threat of climate change. Please finalize the strongest possible climate pollution standards for power plants by early next year. I live here in Las Vegas, Nevada, 
It's one of the hottest cities in the country and it's getting hotter. I'm fortunate to have air conditioning in my home, but it's harder and more dangerous to spend time outside much, much of the year. Our energy bills just keep rising. I'm going as far as even installing the solar panels, finally. I know it's the right thing to do in the long run, so it's time for the energy companies to do their part. As I mentioned earlier, home care workers take care of the most vulnerable in heat waves. Our clients depend on us to make sure that they are staying healthy. The power goes out, we have to keep them cool. I know workers that have had to help their clients evacuate from fires or deal with bad, bad smoke. These power plants are causing 25% of the climate pollution. Cleaning them up is a, long, a big step in the right direction. I have learned that cutting climate pollution as proposed in these rules will annually avoid 1,300 premature deaths, 800 hospital and ER visits, more than 300,000 asthma attacks, 38,000 school absences, and 66,000 lost work wages, lost work days, excuse me. That means that these plants are killing us and making us sick. It's time to stop. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on behalf of home care workers today. We must cut climate pollution in half by 2030. The new limits proposed are a vital step towards stopping the worst impacts of climate change before it's too late for all of us. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much for taking the time to comment tonight. Um, and Lisa or Justine, do you have any follow-up questions? No? Okay. With that, we're going to turn up things over to Rob Kugler. Yeah. Thanks for the opportunity to testify and for proposing these rules to protect Americans from power plant climate pollution. By the way, my name is Rob Kugler, K-U-G-L-E-R, Rob. I live in Westland, Oregon. I'm a member of the Metro Climate Action Team here in Portland. Uh, more to the point, I'm a college professor. I teach a first year seminar on climate change through the, through the lens of the liberal arts and an upper division course on religion and climate change. In recent years, I've watched my students' anxiety about the prospects for a livable future deepen and more than a few at least start the semester resigned to a catastrophic fate. While I teach against anxiety and despair, my students and my own for my grandchildren and grandchildren, without real progress in the fight to reduce GHG emissions, my efforts can often ring hollow. So you can imagine how enthused I am by the EPA's proposed standards. They give me hope for my students and for my family's future. But there are several important areas where I think the rules need to be strengthened to fully protect Americans' health and welfare as the law requires the EPA to do. First, I beg the EPA to expand the scope of the rule for existing gas plants to fully address this major source of pollution. As Jeff Hammerland already pointed out, according to one analysis, less than 10% of existing gas plants would be required to limit their emissions under the rule as it's presently phrased. The EPA, I hope, would expand the rule to cover as many gas plants as possible, um, down at least to 100 megawatts. Second, the EPA needs to accelerate compliance timelines from 2035 to at least 2030 so that power plants begin to reduce their emissions this, de this decade. The technologies to do so are available now and climate science demands that we have, have, that is cut in half, U.S. carbon pollution by 2030. We can't wait until 2035 for requirements to kick in. And under the present timeline, some coal plants remain online until 2039 without significantly reducing their emissions. This retirement loophole should be eliminated or moved up to at least 2030. Finally, I think there's really no reason that the rule has to wait beyond 2024 to be finalized. Let's get it done before March 2024. Climate action really cannot wait. So again, let me close by though expressing my gratitude to the EPA for its work to address deadly and harm harmful pollution from power plants. These rules would create long overdue climate and public health benefits and give me and my family and my students and so many other young people new hope. I urge the agency to finalize the strongest rules possible. Thank you. Thank you very much for taking the time to comment tonight. And to Lisa or Christine, have any follow-up questions? Okay. Before we move on to our next two speakers, I do want to remind folks that um, you've got questions uh, about how to speak or having any issues or questions about the proposed rule. Um, you can uh, message directly to um, attendee support uh, through the chat. 
So uh, just to send your message to attendee support um, and they can help you. And with that, I'm going to introduce the next two speakers. The first will be Susan Hendershot, and she will be followed by Anna Rios. And Good evening. Thank you so much for the opportunity to give this testimony this evening. My name is Reverend Susan Hendershot. I spell my name S-U-S-A-N, last name H-E-N-D-E-R-S-H-O-T. And I'm here today as the president of Interfaith Power and Light and as an ordained clergy person in the Christian Church, Disciples of Christ. IPL's mission is to inspire and mobilize people of faith and conscience to take bold and just action on climate change. I speak on behalf of our 40 state affiliates, thousands of faith leaders, and more than 22,000 congregations that are part of our national network, urging the Biden administration and the EPA to issue a stronger climate pollution standard and do so without delay. For more than a decade, people of faith and conscience have advocated for strong EPA safeguards against climate pollution from power plants. Since then, the climate crisis has only accelerated, taking an enormous toll on human life, our communities, and our sacred earth. Many of our communities have experienced the severe impacts of climate change, wildfires, drought, excessive heat, superstorms, hurricanes, and floods that cause damage, injury, and loss of life. In addition, communities of color and vulnerable communities are the hardest hit by the climate crisis and are more likely to experience health impacts because of climate pollution. While this rule is significant, and I applaud the EPA's work on it, we must go even further to tackle the climate crisis, protect our health, and slash pollution that harms our communities, especially those that have been disproportionately harmed and live near fuel, fossil fuel facilities. EPA must go even further and make this rule stronger. You must expand the number of power plants covered by this rule and speed up the compliance timeline. EPA should also increase safeguards for communities to provide public input to ensure that mitigation technologies do not exacerbate environmental injustices or local air pollution. It is the moral responsibility of our nation and our sacred task as people of faith to address the climate crisis. I implore you to make this rule as strong as we need it to be to address the climate crisis and protect the most vulnerable among us. I wanna thank you for holding this hearing and for the opportunity to speak today. May God grant you wisdom and guidance as you seek the common good. Thank you. Thank you very much for taking the time to talk to uh, comment tonight and do we have any follow-up questions? Okay, so we will be moving on to our next speaker, Anna Rios. Hi, good day. Uh, my name is Anna Rios, A-N-A-R-I-O-S. I am the New Mexico field organizer with Moms Clean Air Force and its Latino engagement program, Ecomadres. I am here today on behalf of more than 20,000 moms, dads, and caregivers in my state, united against air pollution and climate change, to express my support for EPA's proposal to limit carbon emissions from fossil fuels, uh, power plants, plants, and ask the EPA to finalize these standards as quickly as possible. We must protect our families from the harmful, our harmful air pollution generated by these emissions that is responsible for nearly one quarter of the climate pollution in the US and it is impacting our health. I live in Albuquerque with my three children. Uh, where we have been exposed to different climate threats like extreme heat and drought. Some years ago, I suffered from acute, acute bronchitis. Last year, as early as April, we had wildfires in a significant area of the state, which greatly affected my ability to breathe. I could feel my lungs needing to work hard to breathe. Soon after, during the summer, we had flows. I felt like we couldn't catch a break. As a Latina, I worry about my community and my family as we are part of the outdoor for workforce here in the US. Latino individuals are disproportionately represented in the outdoor workforce with nearly 80% of farmer, farm workers self-identify as Hispanic. 
our community faces a disproportionate risk of health impacts from heat. My husband and I believe that we have a moral responsibility to act now to protect the well-being of our children and the future generations. Six years ago, we installed a photovoltaic system at our house to generate clean energy to reduce climate pollution. If we, as a family, made that, that commitment, the EPA must enact strong limits on new and existing fossil fuels fuels, power plants in order to protect the health of our communities and reduce the greenhouse gas pollution that causes dangerous and costly climate change. Once again, I support EPA's proposal to limit carbon emissions from fossil fuel power plants, and I am asking EPA to finalize these standards as quickly as possible. Thank you for your time today and the opportunity to testify. Thank you very much for taking the time to testify. Do we have any follow-up questions? No. Okay. So our next two speakers are Jennifer uh, Cantley Ralph and uh, Marie Dovich. We've got Jennifer. I'm trying to turn on my video but it says I can't start it. Oh, there we go. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yep. Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Jennifer Cantley, a, field, a Nevada field organizer with Malmsteen Air Force and Echo Magres. I am here today not only as Jennifer, a resident of Carson City, Nevada, but also a mother of three wonderful boys, all of whom struggle with asthma. I myself am familiar with this battle as I suffer with allergenic asthma and COPD, which long hauler post COVID syndrome further complicates. But why am I sharing our story today? It's because our experience is common. Numerous families like ours are affected every day by the quality of air we breathe. Asthma, COPD, allergenic reactions are not just breathing and health problems. They, they are a wake up call that is urging us to fix environmental protections now. Almost a quarter of the United States climate pollution comes from power plant fueled by fossil fuels. This pollution doesn't just contribute to global warming, it is direct impact of our health, my family's health and well-being and, co and communities nationwide. We are witnessing this firsthand and that's why I strongly support the proposed carbon rule. These power plants are also known as generation stations and industrial facilities designed to produce electricity. Most of them use fossil fuels like coal, oil, natural gas that are emitting significant amounts of carbon dioxide and other harmful pollutants. The proposed carbon rule currently being considered by the EPA aims to limit carbon pollution from the power plants, which is primarily the reason why I'm asking you to support this today. The proposed carbon rule will also reduce other harmful air pollutants that are being emitted. Today, we are gathering here to ensure that the EPA hears our voices. The public hearing is aiming to make sure that we regulate our emissions from coal and gas fires, I mean, excuse me, gas fired power plants. It is also an opportunity to protect our planet, our homes, and our families. The new protection proposed will make this path forward. These standards can safeguard public health by reducing tens of thousands of participant matters sulfur dioxide, and nitroxide. These are also expected to bring significant economic benefits, which are estimated to be a net worth of $85 billion by 2042. I urge the EPA to finalize the strongest proposed standards and enhance community inputs and safeguards in the final version of this rule. Let's work together to ensure healthier, safer, cleaner world for all of us and for our children's future. After all, it's the only room, the only home that we have. Thank you. Thank you very much for taking the time to comment tonight. And do you have any follow-up questions? Thank you. All right. We've got our next speaker now. Hello. Hi, everybody. My name is Marie Japik. And first, thank you so much for this opportunity to testify. I am testifying as part of a private citizen I live in Pinckney, Michigan, 
and I've been advocating for environmental policies literally since the 1970s. Even I remember the first Earth Day. So I am so happy and I want to thank the administration for this proposal to help curb carbon emissions to enact stronger restrictions on coal and natural gas biopowered plants. It's an urgent step forward that's going to do a lot of work to help protect people from the most devastating impacts of climate change. I'm here tonight because I in Michigan can already see the impact of climate change. I live in a farming community. We grow hay. I physically don't grow hay, but I buy hay. And just this year, the hay farmers have already told us that their hay production is already down 50% because we basically went through an early drought. We've had the previous year unable to grow much hay because it was flooding. So the farming community has been directly impacted by climate change. Even maple syrup production has been cut down by almost one third. So this ends up having a huge impact on the food chain. Beef needs hay, a lot of the agriculture, we have to feed our animals. So as the hay prices double, so will this cost be unfortunately passed on to the citizens. Michigan has the top 10 power plants are by fossil fuel, even though like Detroit Edison is trying to move to solar power and wind power, we still need to do more. So as a Michigander, I'm committed to continue working to ensure climate pollution is addressed and that our air is healthy to breathe. We know that clean energy is the most immediate viable solution to protect our communities. And really we're right now at such a turning point where the clean energy is becoming more affordable. Just as an earlier person said, they're looking at solar energy. You can see people really working for to have a more reliable, reusable energy. So I'm hoping that at this time, the EPA will set the strongest plan possible to help protect and reduce the, help reduce the climate pollution and protect our air and public health. So thank you so much for this time and thank you for everything you do. We appreciate you taking the time to comment tonight. And uh, are there any follow-up questions? No? Okay, so we're going to move on to our next two speakers. So we've got Lux Ho and Asanega Itahor. Itahar. I'm, I'm going to apologize again because I'm probably butchered both of those two. So, um, but go ahead. Hey, everyone. Good evening, and thank you for the opportunity to test. My name is Lux Ho, L-U-X-H-O, and I am the Georgia Field Coordinator at Moms Clean Air Force. I support the carbon rule and urge the EPA to adopt the strongest possible standards to re reduce smokestack emissions from fossil fuel power plants. Doing so would help protect our communities from harmful air pollution that can contributes to climate change and adverse health outcomes. A staggering 25% of the air pollution generated in the U.S. alone is caused by fossil fuel power plants. I live in Atlanta, Georgia, and have been in Georgia my entire life. Being in the South, I see firsthand the devastating effects of climate change and air pollution. Georgians, especially Black and brown folks, experience some of the worst health outcomes in the country. In 2022, a Wallet Hub study conducted by public health experts across the country showed that Georgia ranked 47th in the nation for health outcomes. Georgia still has three coal power plants all within 100 miles of Metro Atlanta. According to the Environment Georgia Research and Policy Center, these three plants are amongst the 100 dirtiest plants in the U.S. Georgia also has eight natural gas power plants, and all of these plants together account for 91.5% of the air pollution in the power sector, even though the state only generates 56.5% of total electricity. There is a clear correlation in my eyes of the intersection of public health crises and environmental and racial injustice. Children, the elderly, pregnant people, and Black and brown communities are the most impacted by this crisis. In Atlanta, where our largest urban forest has been slated to be destroyed to build an unwanted police training facility, I truly think we are approaching a mass crisis as temperatures continue to rise. No doubt these elevated temperatures will affect the livelihoods of laborers and affect our electrical grid and state infrastructure. We will see more frequent air quality warnings as heat from higher temperatures mixes with pollutants to create ground level ozone, which is unsafe to breathe. 
Air and ground pollution from these plants have a travel radius of hundreds of miles and our communities will continue to experience adverse health effects like cancer and asthma. Our, our children will be affected and their ability to develop cognitively and to learn in schools will continue to see a, a rise in childhood asthma rates. The proposed standards to limit greenhouse gas emissions and other forms of air pollution from new and existing coal and gas fire power plants will hold them accountable for their pollution by offering numerous pathways to reduce emissions. The proposed rules will also protect public health by cutting harmful air pollutants, especially in communities that experience the burden of higher adverse health outcomes due to pollution. I urge the EPA to move swiftly on this ruling and to finalize the strongest possible standards to help protect our families and our children from harmful air pollution that contribute to climate change, climate change and impact health. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Great, thank you very much. Do we have any follow-up questions? All right, so before we move on to our next speaker, I do wanna say that we've got an opportunity potentially uh, to have others speak. So if you're interested in being, being added to the waitlist for today, um, email your registration, email, please email our registration support team. Our logistics team will drop that email address in the Zoom, Zoom chat. If you're watching via YouTube, the email should be displayed on your screen. Please note the new waitlist will be started at the beginning of each hearing day. We cannot guarantee everyone on the waitlist will have a chance to speak today, but we, do a, we will do our best to accommodate as many additional speakers as possible. Your interest in this proposal is important to us, and EPA considers all comments equally, whether they are submitted in writing or uh, in writing the document or given orally at a public hearing. As a reminder, you can submit written, written comments on this proposal through August 8th. So with that, we will move on to our next speaker. And um, rather than me butchering your name again, why don't you introduce yourself and, and spell, it, spell your name for the, uh, for the court reporter and then get started. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity to testify. Uh, my name is Osa Senegai Daha. So Senegai Daha spelled O-S-A-S-E-N-A-G-A-I-D-A-H-O-R. I'm a student at Harvard and currently interning at Malmsteen Air Force. I'm from Boston, Massachusetts, and I, I support the EPA's proposal to limit greenhouse gas emissions from fossil fuel power plants, but I ask that the EPA reevaluate its investments, carbon capture, and storage implementation. And without further ado, here's why. It would be barely past the crack of dawn, and there I would be late to catch my train ride to school again. Every day in my rush to catch my train to school, I would run by this decades-old Eversource electric power substation. And I didn't mind the aging electric power substation because I was more concerned with more important things in my life, like getting to school on time. Part of it was that I understood living in my neighborhood could be worse because I understood then that the environmental impact of an old electric substation is not the same as that of a waste incinerator or an actual power plant. But substations have their own environmental impact that ought not to be ignored. That should not be ignored. You know, I was fortunate to be far away from the substation when I ran by, but today people in my community still wait at the bus stop right next to this chain linked fence that surrounds the substation. And while they wait, they are potentially exposed to a chemical called sulfur hexafluoride, which can leak from aging substation infrastructure. And this can make people sick when inhaled. Um, this is a general concern with our country's aging electrical infrastructure, but with electricity generating power plants, the concern is harmful toxins and greenhouse gas emissions. And you know those emissions are contributing to climate change, which makes our community sicker. By choosing to overlook the substation, I settled for the historical perception that environmental health was not a priority in my neighborhood. I settled for second class environmental health because, hey, I mean, at least it wasn't third class, but in doing so, I was also settling for the centuries old precedent, the status quo, that environmental justice in my neighborhood, a historically industrial area was a second class matter and not a priority. And in my ignorance, I let the status quo slide in my community. But for environmental justice populations, the status quo is not enough. Now by God's grace, I know better and the EPA knows better. So we must do better now and fight against environmental injustice. Unfortunately, this proposed policy is not adequately fighting against environmental injustice and may actually contribute to further environmental injustice. Yes, the proposed EPA standards are a great step in limiting carbon emissions from power plants, but I want you to know it is still not enough for the most vulnerable communities. This proposal from the EPA has several considerations for removing greenhouse gases from our atmosphere through carbon capture, utilization, and storage technologies. And I want to warn you all about this technology. Don't make the same mistake. Don't make the same type of environmental injustice 
with carbon capture and storage technology that goes back over a century in this country. We ought to have learned from our historical errors in testing potentially dangerous, poorly regulated technology, and then placing this technology in communities of color. Look, I know we all want to solve this climate change crisis, and you've heard the testimonies of many other people on this call who do, but our rush should not come at the further expense of already burdened communities. Use somewhere else as your test site, and let's be clear. Currently, these proposed standards are inadequate to meet the urgency of our current climate crisis, but they are an essential step, and therefore I support the EPA's proposal to limit greenhouse gas emissions from fossil fuel power plants. But again, I just want to emphasize, I ask that the EPA reevaluate its heavy investment to carbon capture and storage implementation. Thank you. Thank you very much for taking the uh, time to comment tonight. And do we have any follow-up questions? All right. So with that, we're going to move on to our next speaker. And I am trying to figure out for some reason my... All right, here we go. Uh, so our next speaker is Courtney Foley. Great. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify. My name is Courtney Foley. I'm a senior director at the Climate Action Campaign based in Washington, D.C., but I'm originally from Starkville, Mississippi, where many members of my family still reside. My home state has both a coal-fired power plant and natural gas plants. In 2006, around the time I graduated from college, Mississippi's coal-fired power plants produced 22.2 million tons of carbon dioxide, 75,000 tons of sulfur dioxide, and 34,000 tons of nitrogen oxide. Coal-fired power plants are responsible for 35.7% of the state's total carbon dioxide emissions. In more recent years, like 2018, carbon pollution from Mississippi was 69.4 million metric tons of carbon, which included emissions from the Red Hills generating facility. Mississippi communities are the ones paying the price. The Biden administration's proposal to cut climate pollution from dirty power plants is a strong start. Implementing the strongest possible version of these climate pollution standards will benefit our health, climate, and communities nationwide. I'm here to express my strong support for the Biden administration's proposed standards to cut climate pollution from coal and natural gas fired power plants. As we know, fossil fuel power plants are one of the largest sources of carbon pollution driving climate change. In Mississippi, these standards will be critical in tackling climate change and cleaning up power plants. The EPA's proposal is a critically important step forward, and I encourage the agency to achieve greater pollution reductions from more resources on the fastest possible timelines in recognition of the threat of climate change. I urge you to move swiftly to finalize the strongest possible climate pollution standards for power plants by early 2024. The EPA's proposed standard will slash carbon pollution by 617 million metric tons from 2028 to 2042, provide up to 85 billion in net climate and public health benefits through 2020, 2042, and avoid 1,300 premature deaths, 800 hospital um, and ER visits, more than 300,000 asthma attacks, 38,000 school absences, and 66,000 lost workdays each year. Thank you again for this opportunity to testify. Sure. Thank you very much for testifying. And do we have any follow-up questions? Okay. So my name is Kevin Culligan, and I've been sharing the hearing this, this evening. Um, and I want to thank everyone who has shared their comments uh, so far on today's proposed action. I can say as someone who has listened to a lot of these hearings, I and I'm sure my, my co-panelists also appreciate that I think every single one of you has brought something new in your comments and has brought yourself into those. And, uh, I, you know, we really appreciate you taking the time to do that. Um, we do not have any other speakers at this time. So at this time, we're going to take a short recess. I believe we're taking a 15 minute recess. We'll resume the uh, hearing at the time that will be shown on the slide uh, as soon as uh, as soon as I probably stop, stop talking. Um, but this is an opportunity, as I noted earlier, for anyone who has uh, it, it wants to get an opportunity to speak and was not registered to do so. So I would encourage you to email uh, to, to get on that speaker list. So with that, we will be taking a short break and we'll be back in 15 minutes.
Okay, so it is 6.50. Okay, so it is 6.50 now, and we do have one more speaker. So uh, Valeria Hurston, um, if you'd like to speak, now, now is your opportunity. You there, Valeria? Okay, I see you. So um, I'm not hello. sure. Hello, hello. Um, we're ready to hear you speak, and I'm not sure if you heard the ground rules. But um, when you get started, uh, if you could say and spell your name for the hearing reporter, and then you've got four minutes to speak. Okay. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Valerie D. Hairston. That's H A I R S T O N. Thank you very much for this opportunity. I am a physician. I reside in Germantown, Wisconsin, which is a suburb of Milwaukee. I am a physician specializing in podiatry. I am also a member of the Cream City Medical Society and the National Medical Association. Additionally, I am a climate health fellow as part of the Medical Society Consortium on Climate and Health. I am here before you to give my wholehearted support of the EPA's proposed standards to cut carbon pollution from the coal and natural gas. As someone work on the front lines of healthcare, I see firsthand how the climate pollution harms our health. Fossil fuel power plants are some of the largest sources of carbon pollution driving climate change. The air pollution created by burning fossils is a strong major is a major contributor to suffering and early death from cardiovascular, respiratory, and other diseases. As a physician serving the economically disenfranchised, res, disenfranchised and underserved populations, I see the health impacts of climate change changes are magnified amongst these groups of people. Due to redlining and other discriminatory practices, many of my patients live near the proximity to fossil fuel burning plants, rendering them that much more vulnerable. Additionally, I have witnessed the aggravation of respiratory and cardiovascular diseases, as well as toxic air pollution from power plants. Moreover, it is expected that air pollution will worsen as well, further intensifying the health crises caused by poor air quality. As proposed, these standards would start carbon would, I'm sorry, these, as proposed, these standards would slash carbon pollution by 17 million metric tons, providing up to 18 billion in net climate and public health benefits. On an annual basis, the standards would avoid 1,300 premature deaths, 800 hospital and ER visits, and more than 200,000 asthma attacks, 38,000 school absences, and 66,000 lost work days. I support the EPA lowering of the unit size and capacity factor thresholds to include more gas plants. However, you could do more by expanding the number of plants that are covered under proposed to I'm sorry. However, you could do more by expanding the number of plants that are covered under this proposal to achieve further reductions in pollution. Please consider including smaller plants that generate 40% or more of the time, which would cover 80% of the fleet and lead to greater emissions reductions. The proposal as written will leave out the vast majority of existing gas plants, and it is includes larger plants that operate more than 30% of the time, which only contributes to 14% of the fleet. To save the most lives and prevent the worst effects of climate change, we must act together as a society with the fierce urgency of now. The EPA must do its part and move forward now with the strongest possible standards to cut power plant pollution and implement the standards 
as quickly as possible. The climate, people's lives, and the quality of their lives are hanging in the balance. Thank you again for this opportunity to go before the EPA. Thank you very much for taking the time to comment this evening. And do we have any follow-up questions? Okay, so uh, I am going to uh, formally wrap up this afternoon's session. Um, I believe that was the, the last speaker that we had for the day. So once again, my name is Kevin Culligan, and, I, uh, and I'm the senior, a, the senior policy director for the Office of Air Quality Planning and Standards within EPA's Office of Air and Radiation, and I've been here, chairing the hearing session this evening. I want to thank my fellow panelists, everyone who offered testimony today, and everyone who took time out of their schedule to listen to today's hearing on EPA's proposed GHG standards and guidelines for fossil fuel-fired power plants. Um, I'd also actually like to make sure we thank all of the other folks behind the scenes at EPA who actually made this hearing happen. Um, and as a reminder, I want to say you can submit any written comments that you have on this proposal through August 8th. So whether or not you chose or were able to testify today, um, we, can, we will accept written comments through August 8th, and they get just as much consideration as uh, the oral comments during these public hearings. Thank you for joining us for the hearing today, today and we are now adjourning. Uh, the next session will begin tomorrow at 11 a.m. Eastern time. Have a nice night.